Story One of The Room in the Tower and Other Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrew Gantz. The Room in the Tower and Other Stories by E. F. Benson. The Room in the Tower. It is probable that everybody who is at all a constant dreamer has had at least one experience of an event or a sequence of circumstances which have come to his mind in sleep, being subsequently realized in the material world. But, in my opinion, so far from this being a strange thing, it would be far odder if this fulfillment did not occasionally happen, since our dreams are, as a rule, concerned with people whom we know and places with which we are familiar, such as might very naturally occur in the awake and daylit world. True, these dreams are often broken into by some absurd and fantastic incident, which puts them out of court in regard to their subsequent fulfillment, but on the mere calculation of chances, it does not appear in the least unlikely that a dream imagined by anyone who dreams constantly should occasionally come true. Not long ago, for instance, I experienced such a fulfillment of a dream which seems to me in no way remarkable, and to have no kind of psychical significance. The manner of it was as follows. A certain friend of mine living abroad is amiable enough to write me about once in a fortnight. Thus, when fourteen days or thereabouts have elapsed since I last heard from him, my mind, probably either consciously or subconsciously, is expectant of a letter from him. One night last week I dreamed that as I was going upstairs to dress for dinner I heard, as I often heard, the sound of the postman's knock on my front door, and diverted my direction downstairs instead. There, among other correspondence, was a letter from him. Thereafter the fantastic entered, for on opening it I found inside the ace of diamonds, and scribbled across it in his well-known handwriting, I am sending you this for safe custody, as you know it is running an unreasonable risk to keep aces in Italy. The next evening I was just preparing to go upstairs to dress when I heard the postman's knock, and did precisely as I had done in my dream. There, among other letters, was one from my friend, only it did not contain the ace of diamonds. Had it done so, I should have attached more weight to the matter, which, as it stands, seems to me a perfectly ordinary coincidence. No doubt I consciously or subconsciously expected a letter from him, and this suggested to me my dream. Similarly, the fact that my friend had not written to me for a fortnight suggested to him that he should do so. But occasionally, it is not so easy to find such an explanation, and for the following story I can find no explanation at all. It came out of the dark, and into the dark it has gone again. All my life I have been a habitual dreamer. The nights are few, that is to say, when I do not find on awaking in the morning that some mental experience has been mine, and sometimes all night long, apparently, a series of the most dazzling adventures befall me. Almost without exception these adventures are pleasant, though often merely trivial. It is of an exception that I am going to speak. It was when I was about sixteen that a certain dream first came to me, and this is how it befell. It opened with my being set down at the door of a big red-brick house, where I understood I was going to stay. The servant who opened the door told me that tea was going on in the garden, and led me through a low, dark-paneled hall, with a large open fireplace, on to a cheerful green lawn set round with flower beds. There were grouped about the tea-table a small party of people, but they were all strangers to me except one, who was a schoolfellow called Jack Stone clearly the son of the house, and he introduced me to his mother and father and a couple of sisters. I was, I remember, somewhat astonished to find myself here, for the boy in question was scarcely known to me, and I rather disliked what I knew of him. Moreover, he had left school nearly a year before. The afternoon was very hot, and an intolerable oppression reigned. On the far side of the lawn ran a red brick wall, with an iron gate in its center outside which stood a walnut tree. We sat in the shadow of the house opposite a row of long windows, inside which I could see a table with cloth laid, glimmering with glass and silver. This garden front of the house was very long, and at the end of it stood a tower of three stories, which looked to me much older than the rest of the building. 
Before long, Mrs. Stone, who, like the rest of the party, had sat in absolute silence, said to me, Jack will show you your room. I have given you the room in the tower. Quite inexplicably, my heart sank at her words. It felt as if I had known that I should have the room in the tower, and that it contained something dreadful and significant. Jack instantly got up, and I understood that I had to follow him. In silence we passed through the hall, and mounted a great oak staircase with many corners, and arrived at a small landing with two doors set in it. He pushed one of these open for me to enter, and without coming in himself, closed it behind me. Then I knew that my conjecture had been right. There was something awful in the room, and with the terror of nightmare growing swiftly and enveloping me, I awoke in a spasm of terror. Now that dream, or variations on it, occurred to me intermittently for fifteen years. Most often it came in exactly this form. The arrival, the tea laid out on the lawn, the deadly silence succeeded by that one deadly sentence, the mounting with Jack Stone up to the room in the tower where horror dwelt, and it always came to a close in the nightmare of terror at that which was in the room, though I never saw what it was. At other times I experienced variations on this same theme. Occasionally, for instance, we would be sitting at dinner in the dining room, into the windows of which I had looked on the first night when the dream of this house visited me, but wherever we were there was the same silence, the same sense of dreadful oppression and foreboding. And the silence I knew would always be broken by Mrs. Stone saying to me, Jack will show you your room. I have given you the room in the tower. Upon which, this was invariable, I had to follow him up the oak staircase with many corners, and enter the place that I dreaded more and more each time that I visited it in sleep. Or, again, I would find myself playing cards still in silence in a drawing-room lit with immense chandeliers that gave a blinding illumination. What the game was I have no idea. What I remember with a sense of miserable anticipation was that soon Mrs. Stone would get up and say to me, Jack will show you your room. I have given you the room in the tower. This drawing room where we played cards was next to the dining room, and, as I have said, was always brilliantly illuminated, whereas the rest of the house was full of dusk and shadows. And yet how often, in spite of those bouquet of lights, have I not pored over the cards that were dealed me, scarcely able for some reason to see them. Their designs, too, were strange. There were no red suits, but all were black, and among them were certain cards which were black all over. I hated and dreaded those. As this dream continued to recur, I got to know the greater part of the house. There was a smoking room beyond the drawing room, at the end of a passage with a green baize door. It was always very dark there, and as often as I went there I passed somebody whom I could not see in the doorway coming out. Curious developments, too, took place in the characters that peopled the dream as might happen to living persons. Mrs. Stone, for instance, who, when I first saw her, had been black-haired, became grey, and instead of rising briskly as she had done at first when she said, Jack will show you your room, I have given you the room in the tower. She got up very feebly, as if the strength was leaving her limbs. Jack also grew up, and became a rather ill-looking young man, with a brown mustache, while one of the sisters ceased to appear, and I understood she was married. Then it so happened that I was not visited by this dream for six months or more, and I began to hope, in such inexplicable dread did I hold it, that it had passed away for good. But one night after this interval I again found myself being shown out onto the lawn for tea, and Mrs. Stone was not there, while the others were all dressed in black. At once I guessed the reason, and my heart leaped at the thought that perhaps this time I should not have to sleep in the room in the tower, and though we usually all sat in silence, on this occasion the sense of relief made me talk and laugh as I had never yet done. But even then the matters were not altogether comfortable, for no one else spoke, but they all looked secretly at each other. And soon the foolish stream of my talk ran dry, 
and gradually an apprehension worse than anything I had previously known gained on me as the light slowly faded. Suddenly a voice which I knew well broke the stillness, the voice of Mrs. Stone, saying, Jack will show you your room. I have given you the room in the tower. It seemed to come from near the gate in the red brick wall that bounded the lawn, and looking up I saw that the grass outside was sown thick with gravestones. A curious grayish light shone from them, and I could read the lettering on the grave nearest me, and it was in evil memory of Julia Stone. And, as usual, Jack got up, and again I followed him through the hall and up the staircase with many corners. On this occasion it was darker than usual, and when I passed into the room in the tower I could only just see the furniture, the position of which was already familiar to me. Also there was a dreadful odor of decay in the room, and I woke, screaming. The dream, with such variations and developments as I have mentioned, went on at intervals for fifteen years. Sometimes I would dream it two or three nights in succession. Once, as I have said, there was an intermission of six months, but taking a reasonable average, I should say that I dreamed it quite as often as once in a month. It had, as is plain, something of nightmare about it, since it always ended in the same appalling terror, which so far from getting less seemed to me to gather fresh fear every time that I experienced it. There was, too, a strange and dreadful consistency about it. The characters in it, as I have mentioned, got regularly older. Death and marriage visited this silent family, and I never in the dream, after Mrs. Stone had died, set eyes on her again. But it was always her voice that told me that the room in the tower was prepared for me, and whether we had tea out on the lawn or the scene was laid in one of the rooms overlooking it, I could always see her gravestone standing just outside the iron gate. It was the same, too, with the married daughter. Usually she was not present, but once or twice she returned again, in company with a man, whom I took to be her husband. He, too, like the rest of them, was always silent. But, owing to the constant repetition of the dream, I had ceased to attach in my waking hours any significance to it. I never met Jack Stone again during all those years, nor did I ever see a house that resembled this dark house of my dream. And then something happened. I had been in London this year, up till the end of July, and during the first week in August went down to stay with a friend in a house he had taken for the summer months, in the Ashdown Forest district of Sussex. I left London early, for John Clinton was to meet me at Forest Row Station, and we were going to spend the day golfing and go to his house in the evening. He had his motor with him, and we set off about five of the afternoon after a thoroughly delightful day, for the drive the distance being some ten miles. As it was still so early, we did not have tea at the clubhouse, but waited till we should get home. As we drove, the weather, which up till then had been, though hot, deliciously fresh, seemed to me to alter in quality and became very stagnant and oppressive, and I felt that indefinable sense of ominous apprehension that I am accustomed to before thunder. John, however, did not share my views, attributing my loss of lightness to the fact that I had lost both my matches. Events proved, however, that I was right, though I do not think that the thunderstorm that broke that night was the sole cause of my depression. Our way lay through deep, high-banked lanes, and before we had gone very far I fell asleep, and was only awakened by the stopping of the motor. And with a sudden thrill, partly of fear but chiefly of curiosity, I found myself standing in the doorway of my house of dream. We went, I half wondering whether or not I was dreaming still, through a low, oak-paneled hall, and out onto the lawn, where tea was laid in the shadow of the house. It was set in flower beds, a red brick wall with a gate in it bounded on one side, and out beyond that was a space of rough grass with a walnut tree. The façade of the house was very long, and at one end stood a three-storied tower, markedly older than the rest. Here, for the moment, all resemblance to the repeated dream ceased. There was no silent and somehow terrible family, but a large assembly of exceedingly cheerful persons, all of whom were known to me. And in spite of the horror with which the dream itself had always filled me, I felt nothing of it now that the scene was thus reproduced before me. 
but I felt the intensest curiosity as to what was going to happen. Tea pursued its cheerful course, and before long Mrs. Clinton got up, and at that moment I think I knew what she was going to say. She spoke to me, and what she said was, Jack will show you your room. I have given you the room in the tower. At that, for half a second, the horror of the dream took hold of me again. But it quickly passed, and again I felt nothing more than the most intense curiosity. It was not long before it was amply satisfied. John turned to me. Right up at the top of the house, he said. But I think you'll be comfortable. We're absolutely full up. Would you like to go and see it now? By Jove, I believe that you are right, and that we are going to have a thunderstorm. How dark it has become. I got up and followed him. We passed through the hall and up the perfectly familiar staircase. Then he opened the door, and I went in. And at that moment, sheer unreasoning terror again possessed me. I did not know for certain what I feared. I simply feared. Then, like a sudden recollection when one remembers a name which has long escaped the memory, I knew what I feared. I feared Mrs. Stone, whose grave with the sinister inscription in evil memory I had so often seen in my dream, just beyond the lawn which lay below my window. And then once more the fear passed so completely that I wondered what there was to fear, and I found myself, sober and quiet and sane, in the room in the tower, the name of which I had so often heard in my dream, and the scene of which was so familiar. I looked round it with a certain sense of proprietorship, and found that nothing had been changed from the dreaming nights in which I knew it so well. Just to the left of the door was the bed, lengthways along the wall, with the head of it in the angle. In a line with it was the fireplace and a small bookcase. Opposite the door, the outer wall was pierced by two lattice-paned windows, between which stood the dressing table, while arranged along the fourth wall was the washing stand and a big cupboard. My luggage had already been unpacked, for the furniture of dressing and undressing lay orderly on the washstand and toilet table, while my dinner clothes were spread out on the coverlet of the bed. And then, with a sudden start of unexplained dismay, I saw that there were two rather conspicuous objects which I had not seen before in my dreams. One a life-sized oil painting of Mrs. Stone, the other a black-and-white sketch of Jack Stone, representing him as he had appeared to me only a week before in the last of the series of these repeated dreams, a rather secret and evil-looking man of about thirty. His picture hung between the windows, looking straight across the room to the other portrait, which hung at the side of the bed. At that I looked next, and as I looked I felt once more the horror of the nightmare seize me. It represented Mrs. Stone as I had seen her last in my dreams, old and withered and white-haired, but in spite of the evident feebleness of body, a dreadful exuberance and vitality shone through the envelope of flesh an exuberance wholly malign, a vitality that foamed and frothed with unimaginable evil. Evil beamed from the narrow, leering eyes. It laughed in the demon-like mouth. The whole face was instinct with some secret and appalling mirth. The hands, clasped together on the knee, seemed shaking with suppressed and nameless glee. Then I also saw that it was signed in the left-hand bottom corner, and wondering who the artist could be, I looked more closely and read the inscription. Julia Stone by Julia Stone. There came a tap at the door, and John Clinton entered. Got everything you want? he asked. Rather more than I want, said I, pointing to the picture. He laughed. Hard-featured old lady, he said. By herself, too, I remember. Anyhow, she can't have flattered herself much. But don't you see, said I? It's scarcely a human face at all. It's the face of some witch, some devil. He looked at it more closely. Yes, it isn't very pleasant, he said. Scarcely a bedside manner, eh? Yes, I can imagine getting the nightmare if I went to sleep with that close by my bed. I'll have it taken down, if you like. I really wish you would, I said. He rang the bell, and with the help of a servant we detached the pitcher and carried it out onto the landing and put it with its face to the wall. 
By Jove, the old lady is a weight, said John, mopping his forehead. I wonder if she had something on her mind. The extraordinary weight of the picture had struck me, too. I was about to reply when I caught sight of my own hand. There was blood on it, in considerable quantities, covering the whole palm. I've cut myself somehow, said I. John gave a little startled exclamation. Why, I have too, he said. Simultaneously, the footman took out his handkerchief and wiped his hand with it. I saw that there was blood also on his handkerchief. John and I went back into the tower room and washed the blood off. But neither on his hand nor mine was there the slightest trace of a scratch or cut. It seemed to me that, having ascertained this, we both, by a sort of tacit consent, did not allude to it again. Something in my case had dimly occurred to me that I did not wish to think about. It was but a conjecture, but I fancied that I knew the same thing had occurred to him. The heat and oppression of the air, for the storm we had expected was still undischarged, increased very much after dinner, and for some time most of the party, among whom were John Clinton and myself, sat outside on the path bounding the lawn where we had tea. The night was absolutely dark, and no twinkle of star or moon ray could penetrate the pall of cloud that overset the sky. By degrees our assembly thinned, the women went up to bed, men dispersed to the smoking or billiard room, and by eleven o'clock my host and I were the only two left. All the evening I thought that he had something on his mind, and as soon as we were alone he spoke. The man who helped us with the picture had blood on his hand too, did you notice, he said? I asked him just now if he had cut himself, and he supposed he had, but that he could find no mark of it. Now where did that blood come from? By dint of telling myself that I was not going to think about it, I had succeeded in not doing so, and I did not want, especially just at bedtime, to be reminded of it. I don't know, said I, and I don't really care so long as the picture of Mrs. Julius Stone is not by my bed. He got up. But it's odd, he said. Ha! Now you'll see another odd thing. A dog of his, an Irish terrier by breed, had come out of the house as we talked. The door behind us into the hall was open, and a bright oblong of light shone across the lawn to the iron gate which led on to the rough grass outside where the walnut tree stood. I saw that the dog had all his hackles up, bristling with rage and fright. His lips were curled back from his teeth as if he was ready to spring at something, and he was growling to himself. He took not the slightest notice of his master or me, but stiffly and tensely walked across the grass to the iron gate. There he stood for a moment, looking through the bars and still growling. Then, of a sudden, his courage seemed to desert him. He gave one long howl and scuttled back to the house with a curious, crouching sort of movement. "'He does that half a dozen times a day,' said John. "'He sees something which he both hates and fears.' I walked to the gate and looked over it. Something was moving on the grass outside." and soon a sound which I could not instantly identify came to my ears. Then I remembered what it was. It was the purring of a cat. I lit a match and saw the purrer, a big blue Persian, walking round and round in a little circle just outside the gate, stepping high and ecstatically, with tail carried aloft like a banner. Its eyes were bright and shining, and every now and then it put its head down and sniffed at the grass. I laughed. That's the end of that mystery, I am afraid, I said. Here's a large cat having Walpurgis night all alone. Yes, that's Darius, said John. He spends half the day and all night there. But that's not the end of the dog mystery, for Toby and he are the best of friends, but the beginning of the cat mystery. What's the cat doing there? And why is Darius pleased while Toby is terror-stricken? At that moment I remembered the rather horrible detail of my dreams when I saw through the gate just where the cat was now, the white tombstone with the sinister inscription. But before I could answer, the rain began, as suddenly and heavily as if a tap had been turned on, and simultaneously the big cat squeezed through the bars of the gate and came leaping across the lawn to the house for shelter. Then it sat in the doorway, looking out eagerly into the dark. It spat and struck at John with its paw, as he pushed it in in order to close the door. Somehow, with the portrait of Julia Stone in the passage outside, the room in the tower had absolutely no alarm for me, and as I went to bed feeling very sleepy and heavy, 
I had nothing more than interest for the curious incident about our bleeding hands and the conduct of the cat and dog. The last thing I looked at before I put out my light was the square, empty space by my bed where the portrait had been. Here the paper was of its original full tint of dark red. Over the rest of the walls it had faded. Then I blew out my candle and instantly fell asleep. My awaking was equally instantaneous, and I sat bolt upright in bed under the impression that some bright light had been flashed in my face, though it was now absolutely pitch dark. I knew exactly where I was in the room which I had dreaded in dreams, but no horror that I had ever felt when asleep approached the fear that now invaded and froze my brain. Immediately after, a peal of thunder cracked just above the house but the probability that it was only a flash of lightning which awoke me gave no reassurance to my galloping heart. Something I knew was in the room with me, and instinctively I put out my right hand, which was nearest the wall, to keep it away, and my hand touched the edge of a picture frame hanging close to me. I sprang out of bed, upsetting the small table that stood by it, and I heard my watch, candle, and matches clatter on to the floor. But for the moment there was no need of light, for a blinding flash leaped out of the clouds, and showed me that by my bed again hung the picture of Mrs. Stone. And instantly the room went into blackness again. But in that flash I saw another thing also, namely a figure that leaned over the end of my bed, watching me. It was dressed in some close, clinging white garment, spotted and stained with mold, and the face was that of the portrait. Overhead the thunder cracked and roared, and when it ceased and the deathly stillness succeeded, I heard the rustle of movement coming nearer me, and, more horrible yet, perceived an odor of corruption and decay. And then a hand was laid on the side of my neck, and close beside my ear I heard quick, taken, eager breathing. Yet I knew that this thing, though it could be perceived by touch, by smell, by eye, and by ear, was still not of this earth, but something that had passed out of the body and had power to make itself manifest. Then a voice, already familiar to me, spoke. I knew you would come to the room in the tower, it said. I have been long waiting for you. At last you have come. Tonight I shall feast. Before long we will feast together. And the quick breathing came closer to me. I could feel it on my neck. At that, the terror which I think had paralyzed me for the moment gave way to the wild instinct of self-preservation. I hit wildly with both arms, kicking out at the same moment, and heard a little animal squeal and something soft dropped with a thud beside me. I took a couple of steps forward, nearly tripping up over whatever it was that lay there, and by the merest good luck found the handle of the door. In another second I ran out on the landing, and had banged the door behind me. Almost at the same moment I heard a door open somewhere below, and John Clinton, candle in hand, came running upstairs. "'What is it?' he said. "'I sleep just below you and heard a noise as if... Good heavens, there's blood on your shoulder!' I stood there, so he told me afterwards, swaying from side to side, white as a sheet, with the mark on my shoulder as if a hand covered with blood had been laid there. It's in there, I said, pointing. She, you know. The portrait is in there, too, hanging up on the place we took it from. At that he laughed. My dear fellow, this is mere nightmare, he said. He pushed by me and opened the door, I standing there simply inert with terror, unable to stop him, unable to move. Phew, he said, what an awful smell. Then there was silence. He had passed out of my sight behind the open door. Next moment he came out again, as white as myself, and instantly shut it. Yes, the portrait's there, he said, and on the floor is a thing, a thing spotted with earth like what they bury people in. Come away, quick, come away. How I got downstairs I hardly know. An awful shuddering and nausea of the spirit rather than of the flesh had seized me, and more than once he had to place my feet upon the steps, while every now and then he cast glances of terror and apprehension up the stairs. But in time we came to his dressing room on the floor below, and there I told him what I have here described. 
the sequel can be made short. Indeed, some of my readers have perhaps already guessed what it was, if they remember that inexplicable affair of the churchyard at West Folly some eight years ago, where an attempt was made three times to bury the body of a certain woman who had committed suicide. On each occasion, the coffin was found in the course of a few days again protruding from the ground. After the third attempt, in order that the thing should not be talked about, the body was buried elsewhere, in unconsecrated ground. Where it was buried was just outside the iron gate of the garden belonging to the house where this woman had lived. She had committed suicide in a room at the top of the tower in that house. Her name was Julia Stone. Subsequently, the body was again secretly dug up, and the coffin was found to be full of blood. End of The Room in the Tower Story 2 of The Room in the Tower and Other Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Room in the Tower and Other Stories by E. F. Benson the dust cloud. The big French windows were open onto the lawn, and dinner being over, two or three of the party who were staying for the week at the end of August with the Coombe Martins had strolled out onto the terrace to look at the sea, over which the moon, large and low, was just rising and tracing a path of pale gold from horizon to shore, while others, less lunar of inclination, had gone in search of bridge or billiards. Coffee had come round immediately after dessert, and the end of dinner, according to the delectable custom of the house, was as informal as the end of breakfast. Every one, that is to say, remained or went away, smoked, drank port, or abstained, according to his personal tastes. Thus, on this particular evening it so happened that Harry Coombe Martin and I were very soon left alone in the dining room, because we were talking unmitigated motor shop, and the rest of the party, small wonder, were bored with it, and had left us. The shop was home shop, so to speak, for it was almost entirely concerned with the manifold perfections of the new six-cylinder Napier, which my host, in a moment of extravagance, which he did not in the least regret, had just purchased, in which, too, he proposed to take me over to lunch at a friend's house near Hunston on the following day. He observed with legitimate pride that an early start would not be necessary, as the distance was only eighty miles and there were no police traps. Queer things these big motors are, he said, relapsing into generalities as we rose to go. Often, I can scarcely believe that my new car is merely a machine. It seems to me to possess an independent life of its own. It is really much more like a thoroughbred with a wonderfully fine mouth. And the moods of a thoroughbred? I asked. No, it's got an excellent temper, I'm glad to say. It doesn't mind being checked, or even stopped, when it's going its best. Some of these big cars can't stand that. They get sulky. I assure you, it is literally true, if they are checked too often. He paused on his way to ring the bell. Guy Elphinstone's car, for instance, he said. It was a bad-tempered brute, a violent, vicious beast of a car. What make? I asked. Twenty-five horsepower Amade. They are a fretful strain of car. Too thin, not enough bone, and bone is very good for the nerves. The brute liked running over a chicken or a rabbit, though perhaps it was less the car's ill temper than Guy's, poor chap. Well, he paid for it. He paid to the uttermost farthing. Did you know him? No, but surely I have heard the name. Ah, yes, he ran over a child, did he not? Yes, said Harry, and then smashed up against his own park gates. Killed, wasn't he? Oh, yes, killed instantly, and the car just a heap of splinters. There's an odd story about it, I'm told, in the village. Rather in your line. Ghosts, I asked. Yes, 
the ghost of his motor car. Seems almost too up to date, doesn't it? And what's the story? I demanded. Why, just this. His place was outside the village of Bircham, 10 miles out from Norwich, and there's a long straight bit of road there. That's where he ran over the child. And a couple of hundred yards farther on, a rather awkward turn into the park gates. Well, a month or two ago, soon after the accident, one old gaffer in the village swore he had seen a motor there coming full tilt along the road, but without a sound, and it disappeared at the lodge gates of the park, which were shut. Soon after, another said he had heard a motor whirl by him at the same place, followed by a hideous scream, but he saw nothing. The scream is rather horrible, said I. Ah, I see what you mean. I only thought of his siren. Guy had a siren on his exhaust, same as I have. His had a dreadful, frightened sort of wail and always made me feel creepy. And is that all the story? I asked. That one old man thought he saw a noiseless motor and another thought he heard an invisible one. Harry flicked the ash off his cigarette into the grate. Oh dear, no, he said. Half a dozen of them have seen something or heard something. It is quite a heavily authenticated yarn. Yes, and talked over and edited in the public house, I said. Well, not a man of them will go there after dark. Also, the lodge keeper gave notice a week or two after the accident. He said he was always hearing a motor stop and hoot outside the lodge, and he was kept running out at all hours of the night to see what it was. And what was it? It wasn't anything, simply nothing there. He thought it rather uncanny anyhow and threw up a good post. Besides, his wife was always hearing a child scream and while her man toddled out to the gate, she would go and see whether the kids were all right. And the kids themselves? Ah, what of them? I asked. They kept coming to their mother, asking who the little girl was who walked up and down the road and would not speak to them or play with them. It's a many-sided story, I said. All the witnesses seem to have heard and seen different things. Yes, that is just what to my mind makes the yarn so good, he said. Personally, I don't take much stock in spooks at all. But given that there are such things as spooks, and given that the death of the child and the death of Guy have caused spooks to play about there, it seems to me a very good point that different people should be aware of different phenomena. One hears the car, another sees it, One hears the child scream, another sees the child. How does that strike you? This, I am bound to say, was a new view to me, and the more I thought of it, the more reasonable it appeared. For the vast majority of mankind have all those occult senses by which is perceived the spiritual world, which, I hold, is thick and populous around us, sealed up as it were. In other words, The majority of mankind never hear or see a ghost at all. Is it not then very probable that of the remainder, those, in fact, to whom occult experiences have happened or can happen, few should have every sense unsealed, but that some should have the unsealed ear, others the unsealed eye, that some should be clairaudient, others clairvoyant? Yes, it strikes me as reasonable, I said. Can't you take me over there? Certainly. If you will stop till Friday, I'll take you over on Thursday. The others all go that day, so that we can get there after dark. I shook my head. I can't stop till Friday, I'm afraid, I said. I must leave on Thursday. But how about tomorrow? Can't we take it on the way to or from Hunston? No, it's thirty miles out of our way. Besides, to be at Bircham after dark means that we shouldn't get back here till midnight. And as host to my guests, ah, things are only heard and seen after dark, are they? I asked. That makes it so much less interesting. It is like a seance where all lights are put out. Well, the accident happened at night, he said. I don't know the rules, but that may have some bearing on it, I should think. I had one more question in the back of my mind, but I did not like to ask it. At least, I wanted information on this subject without appearing to ask for it. Neither do I know the rules of motors, I said. And I don't understand you when you say that Guy Elphinstone's machine was an irritable, cross-grained brute that liked running over chickens and rabbits. But I think you subsequently said that the irritability may have been the irritability of its owner, 
Did he mind being checked? It made him blind mad if it happened often, said Harry. I shall never forget a drive I had with him once. There were hay carts and perambulators every hundred yards. It was perfectly ghastly. It was like being with a madman. And when we got inside his gate, his dog came running out to meet him. He did not go an inch out of his course. It was worse than that. He went for it, just grinding his teeth with rage. I never drove with him again. He stopped a moment, guessing what might be in my mind. I say, you mustn't think, you mustn't think, he began. No, of course not, said I. Harry Coombe Martin's house stood close to the weather-eaten, sandy cliffs of the Suffolk shore, which are being incessantly gnawed away by the hunger of the insatiable sea. Fathoms deep below it, and now many hundred yards out, lies what was once the second port in England. But now, of the ancient town of Dunwich, and of its seven great churches, nothing remains but one, and that, ruinous and already half destroyed by the falling cliff and the encroachments of the sea. Foot by foot, it too is disappearing, and of the graveyard which surrounded it, more than half is gone, so that from the face of the sandy cliff, on which it stands, there stick out like straws in glass, as Dante says, the bones of those who were once committed there to the kindly and stable earth. Whether it was the remembrance of this rather grim spectacle, as I had seen it that afternoon, or whether Harry's story had caused some trouble in my brain, or whether it was merely that the keen bracing air of this place, to one who had just come from the sleepy languor of the Norfolk broads, kept me sleepless, I do not know. But, anyhow, the moment I put out my light that night and got into bed, I felt that all the footlights and gas jets in the internal theatre of my mind sprang into flame, and that I was very vividly and alertly awake. It was in vain that I counted a hundred forwards and a hundred backwards, that I pictured to myself a flock of visionary sheep coming singly through a gap in an imaginary hedge, and tried to number their monotonous and uniform countenances, that I played knots and crosses with myself, that I marked out scores of double lawn tennis courts, for with each repetition of these supposedly soporific exercises, I only became more intensely wakeful. It was not in remote hope of sleep that I continued to repeat these weary performances long after their inefficacy was proved to the hilt, but because I was strangely unwilling in this timeless hour of the night to think about those protruding relics of humanity. Also, I quite distinctly did not desire to think about that subject with regard to which I had, a few hours ago, promised Harry that I would not make it the subject of reflection. For these reasons, I continued during the black hours to practice these narcotic exercises of the mind, knowing well that if I paused on the tedious treadmill, my thoughts, like some released spring, would fly back to rather gruesome subjects. I kept my mind, in fact, talking loud to itself, so that it should not hear what other voices were saying. Then, by degrees, these absurd mental occupations became impossible. My mind simply refused to occupy itself with them any longer, and next moment I was thinking intently and eagerly, not about the bones protruding from the gnawed section of sand cliff, but about the subject I had said I would not dwell upon. And like a flash, it came upon me why Harry had bidden me not think about it. Surely, in order that I should not come to the same conclusion as he had come to. Now, the whole question of haunt, haunted spots, haunted houses, and so forth, has always seemed to me to be utterly unsolved, and to be neither proved nor disproved to a satisfactory degree. From the earliest times, certainly from the earliest known Egyptian records, there has been a belief that the scene of a crime is often revisited, sometimes by the spirit of him who has committed it, seeking rest, we must suppose, and finding none, sometimes, and more inexplicably, by the spirit of his victim, crying, perhaps, like the blood of Abel, for vengeance. 
and though the stories of these village gossips in the ale house about noiseless visions and invisible noises were all as yet unsifted and unreliable yet i could not help wondering if they such as they were pointed to something authentic and to be classed under this head of appearances but more striking than the yarns of the gaffers seemed to me the questions of the lodge keeper's children how should children have imagined the figure of a child that would not speak to them or play with them perhaps it was a real child a sulky child yes perhaps but perhaps not then after this preliminary skirmish i found myself settling down to the question that i had said i would not think about in other words the possible origin of these phenomena interested me more than the phenomena themselves for what exactly had guy elphinstone that savage driver done had or had not the death of the child been entirely an accident a thing given he drove a motor at all outside his own control or had he irritated beyond endurance at the checks and delays of the day not pulled up when it was just possible he might have but had run over the child as he would have run over a rabbit or a hen or even his own dog and what in any case poor wretched brood must have been his thoughts in that terrible instant that intervened between the child's death and his own when a moment later he smashed into the closed gates of his own lodge was remorse his bitter despairing contrition that could hardly have been so or else surely knowing only for certain that he had knocked the child down he would have stopped he would have done his best whatever that might be to repair the irreparable harm but he had not stopped he had gone on it seemed at full speed for on the collision the car had been smashed into matchwood and steel shavings again with double force had this dreadful thing been a complete accident he would have stopped so then most terrible question of all had he after making murder rushed on to what proved to be his own death filled with some hellish glee at what he had done indeed as in the churchyard on the cliff bones of the buried stuck starkly out into the night the pale tired light of earliest morning had turned the window blinds into glimmering squares before i slept and when i woke the servant who called me was already rattling them briskly up on their rollers and letting the calm serenity of the august day stream into the room through the open windows poured in sunlight and sea wind the scent of flowers and the song of birds and each and all were wonderfully reassuring banishing the hooded forms that had haunted the night and i thought of the disquietude of the dark hours as a traveller may think of the billows and tempests of the ocean over which he has safely journeyed unable now that they belong to the limbo of the past to recall his qualms and tossings with any vivid uneasiness not without a feeling of relief too did i dwell on the knowledge that i was definitely not going to visit this equivocal spot our drive today as harry had said would not take us within thirty miles of it and to-morrow i but went to the station and away though a thorough paced seeker after truth might no doubt have regretted that the laws of time and space did not permit him to visit burton after the sinister dark had fallen and test whether for him there was visible or audible truth in the tales of the village gossips i was conscious of no such regret burton and its fables had given me a very bad night and i was perfectly aware that i did not in the least want to go near it though yesterday i had quite truthfully said i should like to do so in this brightness too of sun and sea wind i felt none of the malaise at my waking moments which a sleepless night usually gives me i felt particularly well particularly pleased to be alive and also as i have said particularly content not to be going to burton i was quite satisfied to leave my curiosity unsatisfied the motor came round about eleven and we started at once harry and mrs morrison a cousin of his sitting behind in the big back seat large enough to hold a comfortable three and i on the left of the driver in a sort of trance i am not ashamed to confess it 
of expectancy and delight. For this was in the early days of motors, when there was still the sense of romance and adventure around them. I did not want to drive any more than Harry wanted to, for driving, so I hold, is too absorbing. It takes the attention in too firm a grip. The mania of the true motorist is not consciously enjoyed. For the passion for motors is a taste, I had almost said a gift, as distinct and as keenly individual as the passion for music or mathematics. Those who use motors most, merely as a means of getting rapidly from one place to another, are often entirely without it, while those whom adverse circumstances over which they have no control compel to use them least may have it to a supreme degree. To those who have it, analysis of their passion is perhaps superfluous. To those who have it not, explanation is almost unintelligible. Pace, however, and the control of pace, and above all, the sensuous consciousness of pace, is at the root of it. And pleasure in pace is common to most people, whether it be in the form of a galloping horse, or the pace of the skate hissing over smooth ice, or the pace of a free-wheel bicycle humming downhill, or, more impersonally, the pace of the smashed ball at lawn tennis, the driven ball at golf, or the low boundary hit at cricket. But the sensuous consciousness of pace, as I have said, is needful. One might experience it seated in front of the engine of an express train, though not in a wadded, shut-windowed carriage, where the wind of movement is not felt. Then add to this rapture of the rush through riven air the knowledge that huge relentless force is controlled by a little lever, and directed by a little wheel on which the hands of the driver seem to lie so negligently. A great untamed devil has there his bridle, and he answers to it, as Harry had said, like a horse with a fine mouth. He has hunger and thirst too, unslakeable and greedily he laps off his soup of petrol, which turns to fire in his mouth. Electricity, the force that rends clouds asunder, and causes stars to totter, is the spoon with which he feeds himself. And as he eats, he races onward, and the road opens like torn linen in front of him. Yet how obedient, how amenable is he! For with a touch on his snaffle, his speed is redoubled, or melts into thin air, so that before you know you have touched the rain, he has exchanged his swallow flight for a mere saunter through the lanes. But he ever loves to run, and knowing this, you will bid him lift up his voice and tell those who are in his path that he is coming, so that he will not need the touch that checks. Hoarse and jovial is his voice, hooting to the wayfarer, and if his hooting be not heard, he has a great guttural falsetto scream that leaps from octave to octave, and echoes from the hedges that are passing in blurred lines of hanging green. And, as you go, the romantic isolation of divers in deep seas is yours. Masked and hooded companions may be near you also, in their driving dress for this plunge through the swift tides of air. But you, like them, are alone and isolated, conscious only of the ripped ribbon of road, the two great lantern eyes of the wonderful monster that look through drooped eyelids by day, but gleam with fire by night, the two ear laps of splash boards, and the long lean bonnet in front, which is the skull and brain case of that swift, untiring energy that feeds on fire, and whirls its two tons of weight uphill and down dale, as if some new law as everlasting as gravity, and like gravity making it go ever swifter, was its sole control. For the first hour, the essence of these joys, any description of which, compared to the real thing, is but as a stagnant pond compared to the bright rushing of a mountain stream, was mine. A straight switchback road lay in front of us, and the monster plunged silently downhill, and said below his breath, Ha ha, ha ha, ha ha, as Without diminution of speed, he breasted the opposing slope. In my control were his great vocal cords, for in those days, Hooter and Siren were on the driver's left, 
and lay convenient to the hand of him who occupied the box seat. And it rejoiced me to let him hoot to a pony cart, three hundred yards ahead, with the hand on his falsetto scream, if his ordinary tones of conversation were unheard or disregarded. Then came a road, crossing ours at right angles, and the dear monster seemed to say, Yes, yes, see how obedient and careful I am. I stroll with my hands in my pockets. Then again a puppy from a farmhouse staggered warlike into the road, and the monster said, Poor little chap, get home to your mother, or I'll talk to you in earnest. The poor little chap did not take the hint, so the monster slackened speed and just said, Woof! Then it chuckled to itself as the puppy scuttled into the hedge, seriously alarmed, and next moment our self-made wind screeched and whistled round us again. Napoleon, I believe, said that the power of an army lay in its feet. That is true also of the monster. There was a loud bang, and in thirty seconds we were at a standstill. The monster's off forefoot troubled it, and the chauffeur said, Yes, sir, burst. So the burst boot was taken off and a new one put on, a boot that had never been on foot before. The foot in question was held up on a jack during this operation and the new boot laced up with the pump. This took exactly 25 minutes. Then the monster got his spoon going again and said, Let me run, oh, let me run, and for 15 miles on a straight and empty road it ran. I timed the miles, but shall not produce their chronology for the benefit of a forsworn constabulary. But there were no more dithyrambics that morning. We should have reached Hunston in time for lunch. Instead, we waited to repair our fourth puncture at 1.45 p.m., 25 miles short of our destination. This fourth puncture was caused by a spicule of flint three-quarters of an inch long, Sharp, it is true, but weighing perhaps two penny weights, while we weighed two tons. It seemed an impertinence. So we lunched at a wayside inn, and during lunch the pundits held a consultation, of which the upshot was this. We had no more boots for our monster, for his off forefoot had burst once and punctured once, thus necessitating two socks and one boot. Similarly, but more so, his off hind foot had burst twice, thus necessitating two boots and two socks. Now, there was no certain shoemaker's shop at Hunston, as far as we knew, but there was a regular universal store at King's Lynn, which was about equidistant. And, so said the chauffeur, there was something wrong with the monster's spoon, ignition. And he didn't rightly know what, and therefore it seemed the prudent part not to go to Hunston, Lunch, a thing of the preterite, having been the object, but to the well-supplied King's Lynn. And we all breathed a pious hope that we might get there. Whiz, hoot, purr, the last boot held, the spoon went busily to the monster's mouth and we just flowed into King's Lynn. The return journey, so I vaguely gathered, would be made by other roads, but personally, Intoxicated with air and movement, I neither asked nor desired to know what those roads would be. This one small but rather salient fact is necessary to record here, that as we waited at King's Lynn and as we buzzed homewards afterwards, no thought of Bircham entered my mind at all. The subsequent hallucination, if hallucination it was, was not, as far as I know, self-suggested. That we had gone out of our way for the sake of the garage, I knew, and that was all. Harry also told me that he did not know where our road would take us. The rest that follows is the baldest possible narrative of what actually occurred. But it seems to me, a humble student of the occult, to be curious. While we waited, we had tea in a hotel, looking onto a very big empty square of houses and after tea we waited a very long time for our monster to pick us up. Then the telephone from the garage inquired for the gentleman on the motor, and since Harry had strolled out to get a local evening paper with news of the last test match, I applied ear and mouth to that elusive instrument. What I heard was not encouraging. 
the ignition had gone very wrong indeed, and perhaps in an hour we should be able to start. It was then about half past six, and we were just seventy-eight miles from Dunwich. Harry came back soon after this, and I told him what the message from the garage had been. What he said was this. Then we shan't get back till long after dinner. We might just as well have camped out to see your ghost. As I have already said, no notion of Bertram was in my mind, and I mentioned this as evidence that, even if it had been, Harry's remark would have implied that we were not going through Bertram. The hour lengthened itself into an hour and a half. Then the monster, quite well again, came hooting round the corner, and we got in. Wake her up, Jack, said Harry to the chauffeur. The roads will be empty. You had better light up at once. The monster, with its eyes agleam, was wagged up, and never in my life have I been carried so cautiously and yet so swiftly. Jack never took a risk or the possibility of a risk, but when the road was clear and open, he let the monster run just as fast as it was able. Its eyes made day of the road fifty yards ahead. and the romance of night was fairyland round us hares started from the roadside and raced in front of us for a hundred yards then just wheeled in time to avoid the ear flaps of the great triumphant brute that carried us moths flitted across struck sometimes by the lenses of its eyes and the miles peeled over our shoulders when it occurred we were going top speed and this was it quite unsensational but to us quite inexplicable unless my midnight imaginings happen to be true as i have said i was in command of the hooter and of the siren we were flying along on a straight down grade as fast as ever we could go for the engines were working though the decline was considerable then quite suddenly i saw in front of us a thick cloud of dust and knew instinctively and on the instant without thought or reasoning what that must mean evidently something going very fast or else so large a cloud could not have been raised was in front of us and going in the same direction as ourselves had it been something on the road coming to meet us we should of course have seen the vehicle first and run into the dust cloud afterwards had it again been something of low speed a horse and dog cart for instance no such dust could have been raised but as it was i knew at once that there was a motor travelling swiftly just ahead of us also that it was not going as fast as we were or we should have run into its dust much more gradually but we went into it as into a suddenly lowered curtain then i shouted to jack slow down and put on the brake i shrieked there's something just ahead of us as i spoke i wrought a wild concerto on the hooter and with my right hand groped for the siren but did not find it simultaneously i heard a wild frightened shriek just as if i had sounded the siren myself jack had felt for it too and our hands fingered each other then we entered the dust cloud we slowed down with extraordinary rapidity and still peering ahead we went dead slow through it i had not put on my goggles after leaving king's lynn and the dust stung and smarted in my eyes it was not therefore a belt of fog but real road dust and at the moment we crept through it i felt harry's hands on my shoulder there's something just ahead he said look don't you see the tail light as a matter of fact i did not and still going very slow we came out of that dust cloud the broad empty road stretched in front of us a hedge was on each side and there was no turning either to right or left only on the right was a lodge and gates which were closed the lodge had no lights in any window then we came to a standstill the air was dead calm not a leaf in the hedge row trees was moving not a grain of dust was lifted from the road but behind the dust cloud still hung in the air and stopped dead short at the closed lodge gates we had moved very slowly for the last 100 yards it was difficult to suppose that it was a far making 
Then Jack spoke with a curious crack in his voice. It must have been a motor, sir, he said. But where is it? I had no reply to this. And from behind, another voice, Harry's voice, spoke. For the moment, I did not recognize it, for it was strained and faltering. D did you open the siren? he asked. It didn't sound like our siren. It sounded like... like... I didn't open the siren, said I. Then we went on again. Soon we came to scattered lights in houses by the wayside. What's this place? I asked Jack. Burcham, sir, said he. End of The Dust Cloud Recording by Shruti Sinha, Lucknow Story 3 of The Room in the Tower and Other Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dom Ford. The Room in the Tower and Other Stories by E. F. Benson. Garvin's Eve. It is only the largest kind of ordnance map that records the existence of the village of Garvin in the Shire of Sutherland, and it is perhaps surprising that any map on whatever scale should mark so small and huddled a group of huts set on a bare, bleak headland between moor and sea, and, so one would have thought, of no import at all to any who did not happen to live there. But the River Garvan, on the right bank of which stand this half-dozen of chimneyless and wind-swept habitations, is a geographical fact of far greater interest to outsiders, for the salmon there are heavy fish, the mouth of the river is clear of nets, and all the way up to Garvan Lock, some six miles inland, the coffee-coloured water lies in pool after deep pool, which merge, if the river is in order, and the angler moderately sanguine, on a fishing probability amounting almost to a certainty. In any case, during the first fortnight of September last, I had no blank day on those delectable waters, and up till the 15th of that month there was no day on which someone at the lodge in which I was stopping did not land a fish out of the famous Pict's Pool. But after the 15th, that pool was not fished again. The reason why is here set forward. The river at this point, after some hundred yards of rapid, makes a sudden turn round a rocky angle and plunges madly into the pool itself. Very deep water lies at the head of it, but deeper still further down on the east side, where a portion of the stream flicks back again in a swift, dark backwater towards the top of the pool again. It is fishable only from the western bank, for to the east, above this backwater, a great wall of black and basaltic rock, heaved up, no doubt, by some fault in strata, rises sheer from the river to the height of some sixty feet. It is in fact nearly precipitous on both sides, heavily serrated at the top, and of so curious a thinness that at almost the middle of it where a fissure breaks its topmost edge, and some twenty feet from the top, there exists a long hole, a sort of lancet window, one would say, right through the rock, so that a slit of daylight can be seen through it. Since, therefore, no one would care to cast his line standing perched on that razor-edged eminence, the pool must needs be fished from the western bank. A decent fly, however, will cover it all. It is on the western bank that there stand the remains of that which gave its title to the pool, namely the ruins of a picked castle, built out of rough and scarcely hewn masonry, unmortared but on a certain large and impressive scale, and in a very well-preserved condition considering its extreme antiquity. It is circular in shape and measures some twenty yards of diameter in its internal span, a staircase of large blocks with a rise of at least a foot leads up to the main gate, and opposite this on the side towards the river is another smaller postern, through which down a rather hazardously steep slope a scrambling path, where progress demands both caution and activity, conducts to the head of the pool, which lies immediately beneath it. A gate chamber, still roofed over, exists in the solid wall, Inside there are foundation indications of three rooms, and in the centre of all a very deep hole, probably a well. Finally, just outside the postern leading to the river is a small artificially levelled platform some twenty feet across, as if made to support some superincumbent edifice. Certain stone slabs and blocks are dispersed over it. Brora, the post town of Garvan, lies some six miles to the southwest. 
and from it a track over the moor leads to the rapids immediately above the Picts Pool, across which, by somewhat extravagant striding from boulder to boulder, a man can pass dry foot when the river is low, and make his way up a steep path to the north of the basaltic rock, and so to the village. But this transit demands a steady head, and at the best is a somewhat giddy passage. Otherwise, the road between it and Brora lies in a long detour higher up the moor, passing by the gates of Garvan Lodge, where I was stopping. For some vague and ill-defined reason, the pool itself and the Picts Castle had an uneasy reputation on the countryside, and several times trudging back from a day's fishing, I have known my gilly take a longish circuit, though heavy with fish, rather than make this shortcut in the dusk by the castle. On the first occasion when Sandy, a strapping yellow-bearded viking of twenty-five, did this, he gave as a reason that the ground round about the castle was mossy, though, as a god-fearing man, he must have known he lied. But on another occasion he was more frank, and said that the picked pool was no canny after sunset. I am now inclined to agree with him, though, when he lied about it. I think it was because, as a god-fearing man, he feared the devil also. It was on the evening of September 14 that I was walking back with my host, Hugh Graham, from the forest beyond the lodge. It had been a day unseasonably hot for the time of year, and the hills were blanketed with soft furry clouds. Sandy, the gilly of whom I have spoken, was behind with the ponies, and idly enough I told Hugh about his strange distastes for the pig's pool after sunset. He listened, frowning a little. That's curious, he said. I know there is some dim local superstition about that place, but last year certainly Sandy used to laugh at it. I remember asking him what ailed the place, and he said he thought nothing about the rubbish folk talked. But this year you say he avoids it? On several occasions with me he has done so. Hugh smoked a while in silence, striding noiselessly over the dusky fragrant heather. Poor chap, he said. I don't know what to do about him. He's becoming useless. Drink? I asked. Yes, drink in a secondary manner. But trouble led to drink, and trouble, I'm afraid, is leading him to worse than drink. The only thing worse than drink is the devil, I remarked. Precisely. That's where he is going. He goes there often. What on earth do you mean? I asked. Well, it's rather curious, said Hugh. You know I dabble a bit in folklore and local superstition, and I believe I am on track of something odder than odd. Just wait a moment. We stood there in the gathering dusk till the ponies laboured up the hillside to us, Sandy, with his six feet of lithe strength, strolling easily beside them up the steep brae, as if his long day's trudging had but served to half awaken his dormant powers of limb. Going to see Mistress Macpherson again tonight? asked Hugh. Aye, poor body, said Sandy. She's old and she's lone. Very kind of you, Sandy, said Hugh, and we walked on. What then? I asked when the ponies had fallen behind again. Why, superstition lingers here, said Hugh, and it's supposed she's a witch. To be quite candid with you, the thing interests me a good deal. Supposing you asked me, on oath, whether I believed in witches, I should say no. But if you asked me again, on oath, whether I suspected I believed in them, I should, I think, say yes. And the 15th of this month, tomorrow, is Garvin's Eve. And what in heaven's name is that? I asked. And who is Garvin, and what's the trouble? Well, Garvin is the person, I suppose, not saint, who is what we should call the eponymous hero of this district. And the trouble is Sandy's trouble. Rather a long story. But there's a long mile in front of us yet, if you care to be told. During that mile, I heard. Sandy had been engaged a year ago to a girl of Garvin, who was in service at Inverness. In March last he had gone, without giving notice, to see her, and, as he walked up the street in which her mistress's house stood, had met her suddenly face to face, in company with a man whose clipped speech betrayed him English, whose manner a kind of gentleman. He had a flourish of his hat for Sandy, pleasure to see him, and scarcely any need of explanation as to how he came to be walking with Katrine. It was the most natural thing possible, for a city like Inverness boasted its innocent urbanities, and a girl could stroll with a man. And, for the time, since also Katrine was so frankly pleased to see him, Sandy was satisfied. But after his return to Garvin, suspicion, fungus-like, grew rank in his mind with the result that a month ago he had, with infinite pains and blottings, written a letter to Katrine, urging her return and immediate marriage. 
Thereafter, it was known that she had left Inverness. It was known that she had arrived by train at Brora. From Brora, she had started to walk across the moor by the park leading just above the Picts Castle, crossing the rapids to Garvan, leaving her box to be sent by the carrier. But at Garvan, she had never arrived. Also, it was said that, though it was a hot afternoon, she wore a big cloak. By this time we had come to the lodge, the lights of which showed dim and blurred through the thick hill mists that had streamed sullenly down from the higher ground. And the rest, said Hugh, which is as fantastic as this is sober fact, I will tell you later. Now, a fruit-bearing determination to go to bed is, to my mind, as difficult to ripen as a fruit-bearing determination to get up, and, in spite of our long day, I was glad when Hugh, the rest of the men having yawned themselves out of the smoking room, came back from the hospitable dispensing of bedroom candlesticks with a briskness that denoted that, as far as he was concerned, the distressing determination was not imminent. As regards Sandy, I suggested. Ah, I also was thinking of that, he said. Well, Katrine Gordon left Brora and never arrived here, that is fact. Now for what remains. Have you any remembrance of a woman always alone walking about the moor by the lock? I think I once called your attention to her. Yes, I remember, I said. Not Katrine, surely. A very old woman, awful to look at. Moustache, whiskers, and muttering to herself. Always looking at the ground, too. Yes, that is she, not Katrine. Katrine, my word, a May morning. But the other, it is Mrs. McPherson, reputed witch. Well, Sandy trudges there, a mile and more away, every night to see her. You know Sandy, Adonis of the North. Now, can you account by any natural explanation for that fact? That he goes off after a long day to see an old hag in the hills? It would seem unlikely, said I. Unlikely? Well, yes, unlikely. Hugh got up from his chair and crossed the room to where a bookcase of rather fusty-looking volumes stood between windows. He took a small Morocco-backed book from a top shelf. Superstitions of Sutherlandshire, he said, as he handed it to me. Turn to page 128 and read. I obeyed and read. September 15 appears to have been the date of what we may call this Devil Festival. On the night of that day, the powers of darkness held preeminent dominion and overrode for any who were abroad that night and invoked their aid, the protective providence of Almighty God. Witches, therefore, above all, were peculiarly potent. On this night, any witch could entice to herself the heart and the love of any young man who consulted her on matters of filter or love charm, with the result that on any night in succeeding years of the same date, he, though he was lawfully affianced and wedded, would, for that night, be hers. If, however, he should call on the name of God through any sudden grace of the spirit, her charm would be of no avail. On this night, too, all witches had the power by certain dreadful incantations and indescribable profanities to raise from the dead those who had committed suicide. Top of the next page, said Hugh. Leave out this next paragraph. It does not bear on this last. Near a small village in this county, I read, called Garvan, the moon at midnight is said to shine through a certain gap or fissure in a wall of rock close beside the river onto the ruins of a picked castle, so that the light of its beams falls onto a large flat stone erected there near the gate, and supposed by some to be an ancient and pagan altar. At that moment, so the superstition still lingers in the countryside, the evil and malignant spirits which hold sway on Garvin's Eve are at the zenith of their powers, and those who invoke their aid at this moment and in this place will though with infinite peril to their immortal souls, get all that they desire of them. The paragraph on the subject ended here, and I shut the book. Well? I asked. Under favourable circumstances, two and two make four, said Hugh. And four means this. Sandy is certainly in consultation with a woman who is supposed to be a witch, whose path no crofter will cross after nightfall. He wants to learn, at whatever cost, poor devil, what happened to Katrine. Thus, I think it more than possible that tomorrow, at midnight, there will be folk by the Pict's Pool. There is another curious thing. I was fishing there yesterday, and just opposite the river gate of the castle, someone has set up a great flat stone, which has been dragged, for I noticed the crushed grass, from the debris at the bottom of the slope. You mean that the old hag is going to try to raise the body of Katrine if she's dead? Yes, and I mean to see myself what happens. Come to. 
The next day, Hugh and I fished down the river from the lodge, taking with us not Sandy, but another gilly, and ate our lunch on the slope of the Pict's castle after landing a couple of fish there. Even as Hugh had said, a great flat slab of stone had been dragged onto the platform outside the river gate of the castle, where it rested on certain rude supports which, now that it was in place, seemed certainly designed to receive it. It was also exactly opposite that lancet window in the basaltic rock across the pool, so that if the moon at midnight did shine through it, the light would fall on the stone. This, then, was the almost certain scene of the incantations. Below the platform, as I have said, the ground fell rapidly away to the level of the pool, which, owing to rain on the hills, was running very high, and, streaked with lines of greyish bubbles, poured down an amazing and ear-filling volume. But directly underneath the steep escarpment of rock on the far side of the pool, it lay foamless and black, a still backwater of great depth. Above the altar-like erection against the ground rose up seven rough-hewn steps to the gate itself, on each side of which, to the height of about four feet, ran the circular wall of the castle. Inside again were the remains of partition walls between the three chambers, and it was in one of the nearest to the river gate that we determined to conceal ourselves that night. From there, should the witch and Sandy keep tryst at the altar, any sound of movement would reach us, and through the aperture of the gate itself we could see, concealed in the shadow of the wall, whatever took place at the altar or down below at the pool. The lodge, finally, was but a short ten minutes away, if one went in the direct line, so that by starting at a quarter to twelve that night, we could enter the Pict's castle by the gate away from the river, thus not betraying our presence to those who might be waiting for the moment when the moon would shine through the lancet window in the wall of rock on to the altar in front of the river gate. Night fell very still and windless, and when not long before midnight we let ourselves silently out of the lodge, though to the east the sky was clear, a black continent of cloud was creeping up from the west and had now nearly reached the zenith. Out of the remote fringes of it, occasional lightning winked, and the growl of very distant thunder sounded drowsily at long intervals after. But it seemed to me as if another storm hung over our heads, ready every moment to burst, for the oppression in the air was of a far heavier quality than so distant a disturbance could have accounted for. To the east, however, the sky was still luminously clear. The curiously hard edges of the western cloud were star-embroidered, and by the dove-coloured light in the east it was evident that the moonrise over the moor was imminent. And though I did not in my heart believe that our expedition would end in anything but yawns, I was conscious of an extreme tension and rawness of nerves which I set down to the thunder-charged air. For noiselessness of footstep we had both put on india-rubber-soled shoes, and all the way down to the pool we heard nothing but the very distant thunder and our own padded tread. Very silently and cautiously we ascended the steps of the gate away from the river, and, keeping close to the wall inside, sidled round to the river gate and peered out. For the first moment I could see nothing. So black lay the shadow of the rock wall opposite across the pool, but by degrees I made out the lumps and line of the glimmering foam which streaked the water. High as the river was running this morning, it was infinitely more voluminous and turbulent now, and the sound of it filled and bewildered the air with its sonorous roaring. Only under the very base of the rock opposite, it ran quite black and unfeckled by foam. There lay the deep, still surface of the backwater. Then, suddenly, I saw something black move in the dimness in front of me, and against the grey foam rose up first the head, then the shoulders, and finally the whole figure of a woman coming towards us up the bank. Behind her walked another, a man, and the two came to where the altar of stone had been newly erected and stood there side by side, silhouetted against the churned white of the stream. Hugh had seen two, and touched me on the arm to call my attention. So far, then, he was right. There was no mistaking the stalwart proportions of Sandy. Suddenly, across the gloom, shot a tiny spear of light, and momentarily as we watched, it grew larger and longer, till a tall beam, as from some window cut in the rock opposite, was shed on the bank below us. It moved slowly, imperceptibly to the left, till it struck full between the two black figures standing there, and shone with a curious bluish gleam on the flat stone in front of them. Then the roar of the river was suddenly overscored by a dreadful screaming voice, the voice of a woman, and from her side her arms shot up and out as if in invocation of some power. At first I could catch none of the words, but soon from repetition they began to convey an intelligible message to my brain, 
and I was listening as in the paralytic horror of nightmare to a bellowing of the most hideous and unnameable profanity. What I heard I cannot bring myself to record. Suffice it to say that Satan was invoked by every adoring and reverent name, that cursing and unspeakable malediction was poured forth on him whom we hold most holy. Then the yelling voice ceased as suddenly as it had begun, and for a moment there was silence again, but for the reverberating river. Then, once more that horror of sound was uplifted. So, Katrine Gordon, it cried, I bid ye in the name of my master and yours to rise from where ye lie. Up with ye, up! Once more there was silence. Then I heard Hugh at my elbow draw a quick, sobbing breath, and his finger pointed unsteadily to the dead black water below the rock. And I too looked and saw. Right under the rock there appeared a pale subaqueous light, which waved and quivered in the stream. At first it was very small and dim, but as we looked it seemed to swim upwards from remote depths and grew larger till, I suppose, the space of some square yard was illuminated by it. Then the surface of the water was broken, and a head, the head of a girl, dead white and with long, flowing hair, appeared above the stream. Her eyes were shut, the corners of her mouth drooped as in sleep, and the moving waters stood in a frill around her neck. Higher and higher rose the figure out of the tide, till at last it stood, luminous in itself, so it appeared, up to the middle. The head was bent down over the breast, and the hands clasped together. As it emerged from the water, it seemed to get nearer, and was by now halfway across the pool, moving quietly and steadily against the great flood of the hurrying river. Then I heard a man's voice crying out in a sort of strangled agony. Katrine, it cried, Katrine, in God's name, in God's name. In two strides, Sandy had rushed down the steep bank and hurled himself out into that mad swirl of waters. For one moment, I saw his arms flung up into the sky. The next he had altogether gone. And on the utterance of that name, the unholy vision had vanished too while simultaneously there burst in front of us a light so blinding, followed by a crack of thunder so appalling to the senses, that I know I just hid my face in my hands. At once, as if the floodgates of the sky had been opened, the deluge was on us, not like rain, but like one sheet of solid water so that we cowered under it. Any hope or attempt to rescue Sandy was out of the question. To dive into that whirlpool of mad water meant instant death, and even had it been possible for any swimmer to live there, in the blackness of the night there was absolutely no chance of finding him. Besides, even if it had been possible to save him, I doubt whether I was sufficiently master of my flesh and blood as to endure to plunge where that apparition had risen. Then, as we lay there, another horror filled and possessed my mind. Somewhere close to us in the darkness was that woman whose yelling voice just now had made my blood run ice cold while it brought the streaming sweat to my forehead. At that moment, I turned to Hugh. I cannot stop here, I said. I must run. Run right away. Where is she? Did you not see? He asked. No. What happened? The lightning struck the stone within a few inches of where she was standing. We, we must go down and look for her. I followed him down the slope, shaking as if I had the palsy and groping with my hands on the ground in front of me in deadly terror of encountering something human. The thunder clouds had in the last few minutes spread over the moon so that no ray from the window in the rock guided our search. But up and down the bank, from the stone that lay shattered there to the edge of the pool, we groped and stumbled but found nothing. At length we gave it up. It seemed morally certain that she, too, had rolled down the bank after the lightning stroke and lay somewhere deep in the pool from which she had called the dead. None fished the pool the next day, but men with dragnets came from Brora. Right under the rock in the backwater lay two bodies, close together, Sandy and the dead girl. Of the other, they found nothing. It would seem, then, that Katrine Gordon, in answer to Sandy's letter, left Inverness in heavy trouble. What happened afterwards can only be conjectured, but it seems likely that she took the shortcut to Garvan, meaning to cross the river on the boulders above the Pict's Pool, but whether she slipped accidentally in her passage and so was drawn down by the hungry water, or whether, unable to face the future, she had thrown herself into the pool, we can only guess. In any case, they sleep together now in the bleak, wind-swept graveyard at Brora, 
in obedience to the inscrutable designs of God. End of Garvin's Eve. Recording by Dom Ford. Story 4 of The Room in the Tower and Other Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eliza Dalton. The Room in the Tower and Other Stories by E. F. Benson. The Confession of Charles Langworth. Dr. Teasdale had occasion to attend the condemned man once or twice during the week before his execution, and found him, as is often the case, when his last hope of life has vanished, quiet and perfectly resigned to his fate, and not seeming to look forward with any dread to the morning that each hour that passed brought nearer and nearer. The bitterness of death appeared to be over for him. It was done with when he was told that his appeal was refused. But for those days, while... Well, Hope was not yet quite abandoned. The wretched man had drunk of death daily. In all his experience, the doctor had never seen a man so wildly and passionately tenacious of life, nor one so strongly knit to this material world by the sheer animal lust of living. Then the news that hope could no longer be entertained was told him, and his spirit passed out of the grip of that agony of torture and suspense and accepted the inevitable with indifference. Yet the change was so extraordinary that it seemed to the doctor rather that the news had completely stunned his powers of feeling, and he was, below the numbed surface, still knit into material things as strongly as ever. He had fainted when the result was told him, and Dr. Teasdale had been called in to attend him, but the fit was but transient, and he came out of it into full consciousness of what had happened. The murder had been a deed of peculiar horror, and there was nothing of sympathy in the mind of the public towards the perpetrator. Charles Linkworth, who now lay under capital sentence, was the keeper of a small stationery store in Sheffield, and there lived with him his wife and mother. The latter was the victim of his atrocious crime, the motive of it being to get possession of the sum of five hundred pounds, which was this woman's property. Linkworth, as came out at the trial, was in debt to the extent of a hundred pounds at the time, and during his wife's absence from home on a visit to relations, he strangled his mother, and during the night buried the body in the small back garden of his house. On his wife's return, he had a sufficiently plausible tale to account for the elder Mrs. Lingworth's disappearance, for there had been constant jarrings and bickerings between him and his mother for the last year or two, and she more than once had threatened to withdraw herself and the eight shillings a week which she contributed to household expenses and purchase an annuity with her money. It was true, also, that during the younger Mrs. Linkworth's absence from home, mother and son had had a violent quarrel arising originally from some trivial point in household management, and that in consequence of this, she had actually drawn her money out of the bank, intending to leave Sheffield next day and settle in London where she had friends. That evening she told him this, and during the night he killed her. His next step, before his wife's return, was logical and sound. He packed up all his mother's possession and took them to the station, from which he saw them dispatched to town by passenger train, and in the evening he asked several friends in to supper, and told them of his mother's departure. He did not, logically also and in accordance with what they probably already knew, feign regret but said that he and she had never got on well together, and that the cause of peace and quietness was furthered by her going. He told the same story to his wife, on her return, identical in every detail, adding, however, that the quarrel had been a violent one, and that his mother had not even left him her address. This again was wisely thought of. It would prevent his wife from writing to her. She appeared to accept his story completely. Indeed, there was nothing strange or suspicious about it. For a while, he behaved with the composure and astuteness which most criminals possess up to a certain point, 
the lack of which, after that, is generally the cause of their detection. He did not, for instance, immediately pay off his debts, but took into his house a young man as lodger, who occupied his mother's room, and he dismissed the assistant in his shop and did the entire serving himself. This gave the impression of economy, and at the same time he openly spoke of the great improvement in his trade, and not till a month had passed did he cash any of the banknotes which he had found in a locked drawer in his mother's room. Then he changed two notes of fifty pounds and paid off his creditors. At that point his astuteness and composure failed him. He opened a deposit account at a local bank with four more fifty-pound notes instead of being patient, and increasing his balance at the savings bank pound by pound, and he got uneasy about that which he had buried deep enough for security in the back garden. Thinking to render himself safer in this regard, he ordered a cartload of slag and stone fragments, and with the help of his lodger, employed the summer evenings when work was over, in building a sort of rockery over the spot. Then came the chance circumstance which really set match to this dangerous train. There was a fire in the lost luggage office at King's Cross Station, from which he ought to have claimed his mother's property, and one of the two boxes was partially burned. The company was liable for compensation, and his mother's name on her linen and a letter with the Sheffield address on it led to the arrival of a purely official and formal notice stating that the company were prepared to consider claims. It was directed to Mrs. Linkworth, and Charles Linkworth's wife received and read it. It seemed a sufficiently harmless document, but it was endorsed with his death warrant, for he could give no explanation at all of the fact of the boxes still lying at King's Cross Station, beyond suggesting that some accident had happened to his mother. Clearly, he had to put the matter in the hands of the police, with a view to tracing her movements, and if it proved that she was dead, claiming her property, which she had already drawn out of the bank. Such, at least, was the course urged on him by his wife and lodger, in whose presence the communication from the railway officials was read out, and it was impossible to refuse to take it. Then the silent, uncreaking machinery of justice, characteristic of England, began to move forward. Quiet men lounged about Smith Street, visited banks, observed the supposed increase in trade, and from a house nearby, looked into the garden where ferns were already flourishing on the rockery. Then came the arrest and the trial, which did not last very long, and on a certain Saturday night, the verdict. Smart women in large hats had made the court bright with color, and in all the crowd there was not one who felt any sympathy with the young athletic-looking man who was condemned. Many of the audience were elderly and respectable mothers, and the crime had been an outrage on motherhood, and they listened to the unfolding of the flawless evidence with strong approval. They thrilled a little when the judge put on the awful and ludicrous little black cap and spoke the sentence appointed by God. Linkworth went to pay the penalty for the atrocious deed, which no one who had heard the evidence could possibly doubt that he had done, with the same indifference as had marked his entire demeanor since he knew his appeal had failed. The prison chaplain who had attended him had done his utmost to get him to confess, but his efforts had been quite ineffectual, and to the last he asserted, though without protestation, his innocence. On a bright September morning when the sun shone warm on the terrible little procession that crossed the prison yard to the shed where was erected the apparatus of death, justice was done, and Dr. Teasdale was satisfied that life was immediately extinct. He had been present on the scaffold, had watched the bolt drawn, and the hooded and pinioned figure drop into the pit. He had heard the chunk and creak of the rope as a sudden weight came onto it, and, looking down, he had seen the queer twitchings of the hanged body. They had lasted but a second or two. The execution had been perfectly satisfactory. An hour later he made the post-mortem examination, and found that his view had been correct, the vertebrae of the spine had been broken at the neck, and death must have been absolutely instantaneous. It was hardly necessary even to make that little piece of dissection that proved this, but for the sake of form he did so. And at that moment he had a very curious and vivid mental impression that the spirit of the dead man was close beside him, as if it still dwelt in the broken habitation of its body. But there was no question at all that the body was dead. It had been dead an hour. 
Then followed another little circumstance, that at the first seemed insignificant, though curious also. One of the warders entered, and asked if the rope, which had been used an hour ago, and was the hangman's perquisite, had by mistake been brought into the mortuary with the body. But there was no trace of it, and it seemed to have vanished altogether, though it was a singular thing to be lost. It was not here, it was not on the scaffold, and though the disappearance was of no particular moment, it was quite inexplicable. Dr. Teasdale was a bachelor and a man of independent means, and lived in a tall-windowed and commodious house in Bedford Square, where a plain cook of surpassing excellence looked after his food and her husband his person. There was no need for him to practice a profession at all, and he performed his work at the prison for the sake of the study of the minds of criminals. Most crime, the transgression, that is, of the rule of conduct which the human race has framed for the sake of its own preservation, he held to be either the result of some abnormality of the brain or of starvation. Crimes of theft, for instance, he would by no means refer to one head. Often, it is true, they were the result of actual want, but more often dictated by some obscure disease of the brain. In marked cases, it was labeled as kleptomania, but he was convinced that there were many others which did not fall directly under the dictation of physical need. More especially was this the case where the crime in question involved also some deed of violence, and he mentally placed underneath this heading, as he went home that evening, the criminal at whose last moments he had been present that morning. The crime had been abominable, the need of money not so very pressing, and the very abomination and unnaturalness of the murder inclined him to consider the murderer as lunatic rather than criminal. He had been, as far as was known, a man of quiet and kindly disposition, a good husband, a sociable neighbor. And then he had committed a crime, just one, which put him outside all pales. So monstrous a deed, whether perpetrated by a sane man or a mad one, was intolerable. There was no use for the doer of it on this planet at all. But somehow the doctor felt that he would have been more at one with the execution of justice if the dead man had confessed. It was morally certain that he was guilty, but he wished that, when there was no longer any hope for him, he had endorsed the verdict himself. He dined alone that evening, and after dinner sat in his study which adjoined the dining room, and feeling disinclined to read, sat in his great red chair opposite the fireplace, and let his mind graze where it would. At once, almost, it went back to the curious sensation he had experienced that morning, of feeling that the spirit of Linkworth was present in the mortuary, though life had been extinct for an hour. It was not the first time, especially in cases of sudden death, that he had felt a similar conviction, though perhaps it had never been quite so unmistakable as it had been today. Yet the feeling, to his mind, was quite probably formed on a natural and psychical truth. The spirit, it may be remarked that he was a believer in the doctrine of future life, and the non-extinction of the soul with the death of the body, was very likely unable or unwilling to quit at once, and altogether the earthly habitation, very likely it lingered there, earthbound, for a while. In his leisure hours, Dr. Teasdale was a considerable student of the occult, for like most advanced and proficient physicians, he clearly recognized how narrow was the boundary of separation between soul and body, how tremendous the influence of the intangible was over material things, and it presented no difficulty to his mind that a disembodied spirit should be able to communicate directly with those who were still bounded by the finite and material. His meditations, which were beginning to group themselves into definite sequence, were interrupted at this moment. On his desk near at hand stood his telephone, and the bell rang, not with its usual metallic insistence, but very faintly, as if the current was weak or the mechanism impaired. However, it certainly was ringing, and he got up and took the combined ear and mouthpiece off its hook. Yes, yes, he said. Who is it? There was a whisper in reply almost inaudible and quite unintelligible. I can't hear you, he said. Again, the whisper sounded but with no greater distinctness, then it ceased altogether. 
He stood there for some half minute or so, waiting for it to be renewed. But beyond the usual chuckling and croaking, which showed, however, that he was in communication with some other instrument, there was silence. Then he replaced the receiver, rang up the exchange, and gave his number. Can you tell me which number rang me up just now? he asked. There was a short pause, then it was given him. It was the number of the prison where he was doctor. Put me on to it, please, he said. This was done. You rang me up just now, he set down the tube. Yes, I am Dr. Teasdale. What is it? I could not hear what you said. The voice came back quite clear and intelligible. Some mistake, sir, it said. We haven't rang you up. But the exchange tells me you did, three minutes ago. Mistake at the exchange, sir, said the voice. Very odd. Well, good night, then. Order Draycott, isn't it? Yes, sir. Good night, sir. Dr. Teasdale went back to his big armchair, still less inclined to read. He let his thoughts wander on for a while, without giving them definite direction, but ever and again his mind kept coming back to that strange little incident of the telephone. Often and often he had been rung up by mistake. Often and often he had been put on to the wrong number by the exchange. But there was something in this very subdued ringing of the telephone bell and the unintelligible whisperings at the other end that suggested a very curious train of reflection to his mind, and soon he found himself pacing up and down his room, with his thoughts eagerly feeding on a most unusual pasture. But it's impossible, he said aloud. He went down as usual to the prison next morning, and once again he was strangely beset with the feeling that there was some unseen presence there. He had before now had some odd psychical experiences, and knew that he was a sensitive one, that is, who is capable under certain circumstances of receiving supernormal impressions, and of having glimpses of the unseen world that lies about us. And this morning the presence of which he was conscious was that of the man who had been executed yesterday morning. It was local, and he felt it most strongly in the little prison yard, and as he passed the door of the condemned cell. So strong was it there that he would not have been surprised if the figure of the man had been visible to him, and as he passed through the door at the end of the passage he turned round, actually expecting to see it. All the time, too, he was aware of a profound horror at his heart. This unseen presence strangely disturbed him, and the poor soul, he felt, wanted something done for it. Not for a moment did he doubt that this impression of his was objective. It was no imaginative phantom of his own invention that made itself so real. The spirit of Linkworth was there. He passed into the infirmary, and for a couple of hours busied himself with his work, but all the time he was aware that the same invisible presence was near him, though its force was manifestly less here than in those places which had been more intimately associated with the man. Finally, before he left, in order to test his theory, he looked into the execution shed. But next moment, with a face suddenly stricken pale, he came out again, closing the door hastily. At the top of the steps stood a figure hooded and pinioned, but hazy of outline, and only faintly visible. But it was visible. There was no mistake about it. Dr. Teasdale was a man of good nerve, and he recovered himself almost immediately, ashamed of his temporary panic. The terror that had blanched his face was chiefly the effect of startled nerves, not of terrified heart, and yet, deeply interested as he was in psychical phenomena, he could not command himself sufficiently to go back there. Or rather, he commanded himself, but his muscles refused to act on the message. If this poor, earthbound spirit had any communication to make to him, he certainly much preferred that it should be made at a distance. As far as he could understand, its range was circumscribed. It haunted the prison yard, the condemned cell, the execution shed. It was more faintly felt in the infirmary. Then a further point suggested itself to his mind, and he went back to his room and sent for Warder Draycott, who had answered him on the telephone last night. "'You are quite sure,' he asked, "'that nobody rang me up last night, just before I rang you?' There was a certain hesitation in the man's manner which the doctor noticed. "'I don't see how it could be possible, sir,' he said. 
I had been sitting close to the telephone for half an hour before and again before that. I must have seen him if anyone had been to the instrument. And you saw no one? said the doctor with a slight emphasis. The man became more markedly ill at ease. No, sir, I saw no one, he said with the same emphasis. Dr. Teasdale looked away from him. But you had perhaps the impression that there was someone there, he asked carelessly, as if it was a point of no interest. Clearly, Warder Draycott had something on his mind, which he found it hard to speak of. Well, sir, if you put it like that, he began, but you would tell me I was half asleep, or had eaten something that disagreed with me at my supper. The doctor dropped his careless manner. I should do nothing of the kind, he said, any more than you would tell me that I had dropped asleep last night when I heard my telephone bell ring. Mind you, Draycott, it did not ring as usual. I could only just hear it ringing, though it was close to me, and I could only hear a whisper when I put my ear to it. But when you spoke, I heard you quite distinctly. Now I believed there was something, somebody, at this end of the telephone. You were here, and though you saw no one, you too felt there was someone there. The man nodded. I am not a nervous man, sir, he said, and I don't deal in fancies. But there was something there. It was hovering about the instrument, and it wasn't the wind, because there wasn't a breath of wind stirring, and the night was warm. And I shut the window to make certain. But it went about the room, sir, for an hour or more. It rustled the leaves of the telephone book, and it ruffled my hair when it came close to me. And it was bitter cold, sir. The doctor looked him straight in the face. Did it remind you of what had been done yesterday morning? he asked suddenly. Again, the man hesitated. Yes, sir, he said at length. Convict Charles Linkworth. Dr. Teasdale nodded reassuringly. That's it, he said. Now, are you on duty tonight? Yes, sir. I wish I wasn't. I know how you feel. I have felt exactly the same myself. Now, whatever this is, it seems to want to communicate with me. By the way, did you have any disturbance in the prison last night? Yes, sir. There was half a dozen men who had the nightmare. Yelling and screaming they were, and quiet men, too, usually. It happened sometimes the night after an execution. I've known it before, though nothing like what it was last night. I see. Now, if this, this thing you can't see wants to get at the telephone again tonight, give it every chance. It will probably come about the same time. I can't tell you why, but that usually happens. So unless you must, don't be in this room where the telephone is, just for an hour, to give it plenty of time between half-past nine and half-past ten. I will be ready for it at the other end. Supposing I am rung up, I will, when it has finished, ring you up, to make sure that I was not being called in... in the unusual way. And there is nothing to be afraid of, sir? asked the man. Dr. Teasdale remembered his own moment of terror this morning, but he spoke quite sincerely. I am sure there is nothing to be afraid of, he said reassuringly. Dr. Teasdale had a dinner engagement that night, which he broke, and was sitting alone in his study by half-past nine. In the present state of human ignorance, as to the law which governs the movements of spirits severed from the body, he could not tell the warder why it was that their visits are so often periodic, timed to punctuality according to our scheme of hours. But in scenes of tabulated instances of the appearance of revenants, especially if the soul was in sore need of help, as might be the case here, he found that they came at the same hour of day or night. As a rule, too, their power of making themselves seen or heard or felt grew greater for some little while after death, subsequently growing weaker as they became less earthbound, or often after that ceasing altogether, and he was prepared tonight for a less indistinct impression. The spirit apparently for the early hours of its disembodiment is weak, like a moth newly broken out from its chrysalis, and then suddenly the telephone bell rang, not so faintly as the night before, but still not with its ordinary imperative tone. Dr. Teasdale instantly got up, put the receiver to his ears, and what he heard was heartbroken sobbing, 
strong spasms that seemed to tear the weeper. He waited for a little before speaking, himself cold with some nameless fear, and yet profoundly moved to help if he was able. Yes, yes, he said at length, hearing his own voice tremble. I am Dr. Teasdale. What can I do for you? And who are you? He added, though he felt that it was a needless question. Slowly the sobbing died down. The whispers took its place, still broken by crying. I want to tell, sir. I want to tell. I must tell. Yes? Tell me, what is it? said the doctor. No, not you. Another gentleman. Who used to come to see me? Will you speak to him what I say to you? I can't make him hear me or see me. Who are you? asked Dr. Teasdale suddenly. Charles Linkworth. I thought you knew. I am very miserable. I can't leave the prison. And it is cold. Will you send for the other gentleman? Do you mean the chaplain? asked Dr. Teasdale. Yes, the chaplain. He read the service when I went across the yard yesterday. I shan't be so miserable when I have told. The doctor hesitated a moment. This was a strange story that he would have to tell Mr. Dawkins, the prison chaplain, that at the other end of the telephone was the spirit of a man executed yesterday. And yet he soberly believed that it was so that this unhappy spirit was in misery and wanted to tell. There was no need to ask what he wanted to tell. Yes, I will ask him to come here, he said at length. Thank you, sir, a thousand times. You will make him come, won't you? The voice was growing fainter. It must be tomorrow night, it said. I can't speak longer now. I have to go to see... Oh, my God, my God. The sobs broke out afresh, sounding fainter and fainter. But it was in a frenzy of terrified interest that Dr. Teasdale spoke. To see what? he cried. Tell me what you are doing. What is happening to you? I can't tell you. I mayn't tell you, said the voice very faint. That is part and it died away altogether. Dr. Teasdale waited a little, but there was no further sound of any kind, except the chuckling and croaking of the instrument. He put the receiver on to its hook again, and then became aware for the first time that his forehead was streaming with some cold dew of horror. His ears sang, his heart beat very quick and faint, and he sat down to recover himself. Once or twice he asked himself if it was possible that some terrible joke was being played on him, but he knew that it could not be so. He felt perfectly sure that he had been speaking with a soul in torment of contrition for the terrible and irremediable act it had committed. It was no delusion of his senses, either. Here in this comfortable room of his in Bedford Square, with London cheerfully roaring round him, he had spoken with the spirit of Charles Linkworth. But he had no time, nor indeed inclination, for somehow his soul sat shuddering within him, to indulge in meditation. First of all, he rang up the prison. Warder Draycott? he asked. There was a perceptible tremor in the man's voice as he answered. Yes, sir. Is it Dr. Teasdale? Yes. Has anything happened here with you? Twice it seemed that the man tried to speak and could not. At the third attempt, the words came. Yes, sir. He has been here. I saw him go into the room where the telephone is. Ah, oh, did you speak to him? No, sir. I sweated and prayed. And there's half a dozen men as have been screaming in their sleep tonight. But it's quiet again now. I think he has gone into the execution shed. Yes. Well, I think there will be no more disturbance now. By the way, please give me Mr. Dawkins' home address. This was given him, and Dr. Teasdale proceeded to write to the chaplain, asking him to dine with him on the following night. But suddenly he found that he could not write at his accustomed desk, with the telephone standing close to him, and he went upstairs to the drawing-room, which he seldom used, except when he entertained his friends. There he recaptured the serenity of his nerves, and could control his hand. The note simply asked Mr. Dawkins to dine with him next night, when he wished to tell him a very strange history and ask his help. Even if you have any other engagement, he concluded, I seriously request you give it up. Tonight I did the same. I should bitterly have regretted it if I had not. Next night, accordingly, the two sat at their dinner in the doctor's dining room, 
and when they were left to their cigarettes and coffee, the doctor spoke. "'You must not think me mad, my dear Dawkins,' he said, "'when you hear what I've got to tell you.' Mr. Dawkins laughed. "'I certainly promise not to do that,' he said. "'Good. Last night and the night before, a little later in the evening than this, I spoke through the telephone with the spirit of the man we saw executed two days ago, Charles Linkworth. The chaplain did not laugh. He pushed back his chair, looking annoyed. "'Teasdale,' he said. "'Is it to tell me this? I don't want to be rude. But this bogey tale that you have brought me here this evening?' "'Yes, you have not heard half of it. He asked me last night to get hold of you. He wants to tell you something. We can guess, I think, what it is.' Dawkins got up. "'Please, let me hear no more of this,' he said. "'The dead do not return.' In what state or under what condition they exist has not been revealed to us, but they have done with all material things. But I must tell you more, said the doctor. Two nights ago I was rung up, but very faintly, and could only hear whispers. I instantly inquired where the call came from and was told it came from the prison. I rang up the prison, and Warder Draycott told me that nobody had rung me up. He, too, was conscious of a presence. I think that man drinks, said Dawkins sharply. The doctor paused a moment. "'My dear fellow, you should not say that sort of thing,' he said. "'He is one of the steadiest men we have got, and if he drinks, why not I also?' The chaplain sat down again. "'You must forgive me,' he said. "'But I can't go into this. These are dangerous matters to meddle with. Besides, how do you know it's not a hoax?' "'Played by whom?' asked the doctor. "'Hark!' The telephone bell suddenly rang. It was clearly audible to the doctor. "'Don't you hear it?' he said. "'Hear what?' "'The telephone bell ringing.' "'I hear no bell,' said the chaplain, rather angrily. "'There is no bell ringing.' The doctor did not answer, but went through into his study and turned on the lights. Then he took the receiver and mouthpiece off its hook. "'Yes,' he said in a voice that trembled. "'Who is it?' "'Yes, Mr. Dawkins is here. "'I will try and get him to speak to you.' He went into the other room. "'Dawkins,' he said. "'There is a soul in agony. I pray you to listen. For God's sake, come and listen.' The chaplain hesitated a moment. "'As you will,' he said. He took up the receiver and put it to his ear. "'I am Mr. Dawkins,' he said. He waited. "'I can hear nothing, whatever,' he said at length. "'Ah!' Uh, there was something there, the faintest whisper. Ah, oh, try to hear, try to hear, said the doctor. Again the chaplain listened. Suddenly he laid the instrument down, frowning. Something, somebody said. I killed her, I confess it. I want to be forgiven. It's a hoax, my dear Teasdale. Somebody knowing your spiritualistic leanings is playing a very grim joke on you. I can't believe it. Dr. Teasdale took up the receiver. "'I am Dr. Teasdale,' he said. "'Can you give Mr. Dawkins some sign that it is you?' Then he laid it down again. "'He says he thinks he can,' he said. "'We must wait.' The evening was again very warm, and the window into the paved yard at the back of the house was open. For five minutes or so the men stood in silence, waiting, and nothing happened. Then the chaplain spoke. "'I think that is sufficiently conclusive,' he said. Even as he spoke, a very cold draught of air suddenly blew into the room, making the papers on the desk rustle. Dr. Teasdale went to the window and closed it. "'Did you feel that?' he asked. "'Yes, a breath of air. Chilly.' Once again in the closed room it stirred again. "'And did you feel that?' asked the doctor. The chaplain nodded. He felt his heart hammering in his throat suddenly. "'Defend us from all peril and danger of this coming night!' he exclaimed. "'Something is coming!' said the doctor. As he spoke, it came. In the center of the room, not three yards away from them, stood the figure of a man with his head bent over onto his shoulder, so that the face was not visible. Then he took his head in both hands and raised it like a weight, and looked them in the face. The eyes and tongue protruded, 
a livid mark was round the neck. Then there came a sharp rattle on the boards of the floor, and the figure was no longer there. But on the floor there lay a new rope. For a long while neither spoke. The sweat poured off the doctor's face, and the chaplain's white lips whispered prayers. Then, by a huge effort, the doctor pulled himself together. He pointed at the rope. It has been missing since the execution, he said. Then again, the telephone bell rang. This time the chaplain needed no prompting. He went to it at once, and the ringing ceased. For a while he listened in silence. Charles Linkworth, he said at length, in the sight of God, in whose presence you stand, are you truly sorry for your sin? Some answer inaudible to the doctor came, and the chaplain closed his eyes, and Dr. Teasdale knelt as he heard the words of the absolution. At the close there was silence again. I can hear nothing more, said the chaplain, replacing the receiver. Presently the doctor's manservant came in with the tray of spirits and siphon. Dr. Teasdale pointed without looking to where the apparition had been. "'Take the rope that is there and burn it, Parker,' he said. There was a moment's silence. "'There is no rope, sir,' said Parker. End of the Confession of Charles Linkworth Recorded by Eliza Dalton Story 5 of The Room in the Tower and Other Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Room in the Tower and Other Stories by E. F. Benson At Abdul Ali's Grave Luxor, as most of those who have been there will allow, is a place of notable charm and boasts many attractions for the traveller, chief among which he will reckon an excellent hotel containing a billiard room, a garden fit for the gods to sit in, any quantity of visitors, at least a weekly dance on board a tourist steamer, quail shooting, a climate as of avilion, and a number of stupendously ancient monuments for those archaeologically inclined. But to certain others, few indeed in number, but almost fanatically convinced of their own orthodoxy, the charm of Luxor, like some sleeping beauty, only wakes when these things cease, when the hotel has grown empty and the billiard marker has gone for a long rest to Cairo, when the decimated quail and the decimating tourist have fled northwards, and the Theban plain, done to a tropical sun, is a gradient across which no man would willingly make a journey by day not even if Queen Hatasu herself should signify that she would give him audience on the terraces of Deir al-Bahari. A suspicion, however, that the fanatic few were right, for in other respects they were men of estimable opinions, induced me to examine their convictions for myself. And thus it came about that two years ago, certain days toward the beginning of June, saw me still there, a confirmed convert. Much tobacco and the length of summer days had assisted us to the analysis of the charm of which summer in the south is possessed, and Weston, one of the earliest of the elect, and myself, had discussed it at some length, and though we reserved as the principal ingredient a nameless something which baffled the chemist and must be felt to be understood, we were easily able to detect certain other drugs of sight and sound, which we were agreed contributed to the whole. A few of them are here subjoined. The waking in the warm darkness just before dawn to find that the desire for stopping in bed fails with the awakening. The silent start across the Nile in the still air with our horses, who, like us, stand and sniff at the incredible sweetness of the coming morning without apparently finding it less wonderful in repetition. The moment infinitesimal in duration, but infinite in sensation, just before the sun rises, when the grey shrouded river is struck suddenly out of darkness and becomes a sheet of green bronze. The rose flush, rapid as a change of colour in some chemical combination, which shoots across the sky from east to west, 
followed immediately by the sunlight which catches the peaks of the western hills and flows down like some luminous liquid. The stir and whisper which goes through the world. A breeze springs up. A lark soars and sings. The boatman shouts, Ya Allah! Ya Allah! The horses toss their heads. The subsequent ride. The subsequent breakfast on our return. The subsequent absence of anything to do. At sunset, the ride into the desert thick with the scent of warm, barren sand, which smells like nothing else in the world, for it smells of nothing at all. The blaze of the tropical night. Camel's milk. Converse with the Philahan, who are the most charming and least accountable people on the face of the earth, except when tourists are about, and when in consequence there is no thought but bakshish. Lastly, and with this we are concerned, the possibility of odd experiences. The beginning of the things which make this tale occurred four days ago, when Abdul Ali, the oldest man in the village, died suddenly, full of days and riches. Both, some thought, had probably been somewhat exaggerated, but his relations affirmed without variation that he had as many years as he had English pounds, and that each was a hundred. The apt roundness of these numbers was incontestable. The thing was too neat not to be true, and before he had been dead for twenty-four hours, it was a matter of orthodoxy. But with regard to his relations, that which turned their bereavement, which must soon have occurred, into a source of blank dismay instead of pious resignation, was that not one of these English pounds, not even their less satisfactory equivalent in notes, which, out of the tourist season, are looked upon at Luxor as a not very dependable variety of philosopher's stone, though certainly capable of producing gold under favourable circumstances, could be found. Abdul Ali, with his hundred years, was dead, his century of sovereigns, they might as well have been an annuity, were dead with him, and his son Muhammad, who had previously enjoyed a sort of brevet rank in anticipation of the event, was considered to be throwing far more dust in the air than the genuine affection even of a chief mourner wholly justified. Abdul, it is to be feared, was not a man of stereotyped respectability. Though full of years and riches, he enjoyed no great reputation for honour. He drank wine whenever he could get it. He ate food during the days of Ramadan. Scornful of the fact when his appetite desired it, he was supposed to have the evil eye. And in his last moments, he was attended by the notorious Achmet, who was well known here to be practised in black magic, and has been suspected of the much meaner crime of robbing the bodies of those lately dead. For in Egypt, while to despoil the bodies of ancient kings and priests is a privilege for which advanced and learned societies vie with each other, to rob the corpses of your contemporaries is considered the deed of a dog. Mohammed, who soon exchanged the throwing of dust in the air for the more natural mode of expressing chagrin, which is to gnaw the nails, told us in confidence that he suspected Ajmet of having ascertained the secret of where his father's money was. But it appeared that Ajmet had as blank a face as anybody when his patient, who was striving to make some communication to him, went out into the great silence, and the suspicion that he knew where the money was gave way in the minds of those who were competent to form an estimate of his character to a but dubious regret that he had just failed to learn that very important fact. So Abdul died and was buried, and we all went to the funeral feast at which we ate more roast meat than one naturally cares about at five in the afternoon on a June day, in consequence of which Weston and I, not requiring dinner, stopped at home after our return from the ride into the desert and talked to Muhammad, Abdul's son, and Hussein, Abdul's youngest grandson, a boy of about twenty, who was also our valet, cook, and housemaid, and they together woefully narrated of the money that had been and was not, and told us scandalous tales about Ajmet concerning his weakness for symmetries. They drank coffee and smoked, for though Hussein was our servant, we had been that day the guests of his father, and shortly after they had gone, up came Machmut. Machmut, who says he thinks he is twelve, but does not know for certain, is kitchen maid, groom, and gardener, and has to an extraordinary degree some occult power resembling clairvoyance. 
Weston, who is a member of the Society for Psychical Research, and the tragedy of whose life has been the detection of the fraudulent medium Mrs. Blunt, says that it is all thought reading, and has made notes of many of Machmut's performances, which may subsequently turn out to be of interest. Thought reading, however, does not seem to me to fully explain the experience which followed Abdul's funeral. And with Machmut, I have to put it down to white magic, which should be a very inclusive term, or to pure coincidence, which is even more inclusive, and will cover all the inexplicable phenomena of the world, taken singly. Machmut's method of unloosing the forces of white magic is simple, being the ink mirror known by name to many, and it is as follows. A little black ink is poured into the palm of Machmut's hand, or, as ink has been at a premium lately owing to the last post board from Cairo, which contained stationery for us, having stuck on a sand bank, a small piece of black American cloth about an inch in diameter is found to be a perfect substitute. Upon this he gazes. After five or ten minutes, his shrewd monkey-like expression is struck from his face. His eyes, wide open, remain fixed on the cloth. A complete rigidity sets in over his muscles, and he tells us of the curious things he sees. In whatever position he is, in that position he remains without the deflection of a hair's breadth until the ink is washed off or the cloth removed. Then he looks up and says, Khalas, which means, it is finished. We only engaged Machmut's services as second general domestic a fortnight ago. But the first evening he was with us, he came upstairs when he had finished his work, and said, I will show you white magic, give me ink, and proceeded to describe the front hall of our house in London, saying that there were two horses at the door, and that a man and woman soon came out, gave the horses each a piece of bread and mounted. The thing was so probable that by the next mail I wrote asking my mother to write down exactly what she was doing and where at half past five. English time, on the evening of June 12. At the corresponding time in Egypt, Machmut was describing, speaking to us of a sit, lady, having tea in a room which he described with some minuteness, and I am waiting anxiously for her letter. The explanation which Weston gives us of all these phenomena is that a certain picture of people I know is present in my mind, though I may not be aware of it. Present to my subliminal self, I think he says, and that I give an unspoken suggestion to the hypnotized Machmut. My explanation is that there isn't any explanation, for no suggestion on my part would make my brother go out and write at the moment when Machmut says he is so doing, if indeed we find that Machmut's visions are chronologically correct. Consequently, I prefer the open mind and am prepared to believe anything. Weston, however, does not speak quite so calmly or scientifically about Machmut's last performance, and since it took place, he has almost entirely ceased to urge me to become a member of the Society for Psychical Research, in order that I may no longer be hidebound by vain superstitions. Machmut will not exercise these powers if his own folk are present, for he says that when he is in this state, if a man who knew black magic was in the room, or knew that he was practicing white magic, he could get the spirit who presides over the black magic to kill the spirit of white magic for the black magic is the more potent, and the two are foes. And as the spirit of white magic is on occasions a powerful friend, he had before now befriended Machmut in a manner which I consider incredible, Machmut is very desirous that he should abide long with him. But Englishmen, it appears, do not know the black magic, so with us he is safe. The spirit of black magic, to speak to whom it is death, Machmut saw once between heaven and earth, and night and day, so, he phrases it, on the Karnak road. He may be known, he told us, by the fact that he is of paler skin than his people, that he has two long teeth, one in each corner of his mouth, and that his eyes, which are white all over, are as big as the eyes of a horse. Machmut squatted himself comfortably in the corner, and I gave him the piece of black American cloth. As some minutes must elapse before he gets into the hypnotic state in which the visions begin, I strolled out onto the balcony for coolness. It was the hottest night we had yet had, and though the sun had set three hours, the thermometer still registered close on hundred degrees. Above, 
The sky seemed veiled with grey, where it should have been dark velvety blue, and a fitful puffing wind from the south threatened three days of the sandy, intolerable khamsin. A little way up the street to the left was a small cafe in front of which were glowing and waning little glow-warm specks of light from the water pipes of Arabs sitting out there in the dark. From inside came the click of brass castanets in the hands of some dancing girl, sounding sharp and precise against the wailing bagpipe music of the strings and pipes which accompany these movements which Arabs love and Europeans think so unpleasing. Eastwards the sky was paler and luminous, for the moon was imminently rising, and even as I looked, the red rim of the enormous disk cut the line of the desert, and on the instant, with a curious aptness, one of the Arabs outside the cafe broke out into that wonderful chant. I cannot sleep for longing for thee, O full moon. Far is thy throne over Mecca. Slip down, O beloved, to me. Immediately afterwards I heard the piping monotone of Mashmood's voice begin, and in a moment or two I went inside. We have found that the experiments gave the quickest result by contact a fact which confirmed Weston in his explanation of them by thought transference of some elaborate kind, which, I confess, I cannot understand. He was writing at a table in the window when I came in, but looked up. Take his hand, he said. At present he is quite incoherent. Do you explain that? I asked. It is closely analogous, so Myers thinks to talking in sleep. He has been saying something about a tomb. Do make a suggestion and see if he gives it right. He is remarkably sensitive and he responds quicker to you than to me. Probably Abdul's funeral suggested the tomb. A sudden thought struck me. Hush, I said. I want to listen. Masmood's head was thrown a little back and he held the hand in which was the piece of cloth rather above his face. As usual, he was talking very slowly and in a high staccato voice absolutely unlike his usual tones. On one side of the grave, he piped, is a tamarisk tree, and the green beetles make fantasia about it. On the other side is a mud wall. There are many other graves about, but they are all asleep. This is the grave because it is awake and is moist and not sandy. I thought so, said Beston. It is Abdul's grave he is talking about. There is a red moon sitting on the desert, continued Mashmood, and it is now. There is the puffing of Khamsin and much dust coming. The moon is red with dust and because it is low. Still sensitive to external conditions, said Weston. That is rather curious. Pinch him, will you? I pinched Mashmood. He did not pay the slightest attention. In the last house of the street and in the doorway stands a man. Ah, ah, cried the boy suddenly. It is the black magic he knows. Don't let him come. He is going out of the house. He shrieked. He is coming. No, he is going the other way, towards the moon and the grave. He has the black magic with him, which can raise the dead. And he has a murdering knife and a spade. I cannot see his face, but the black magic is between it and my eyes. Weston had got up and, like me, was hanging on Mashmood's words. We will go there, he said. Here is an opportunity of testing it. Listen a moment. He is walking, 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 piped Mashmood, still walking to the moon and the grave. The moon sits no longer on the desert, but has sprung up a little way. I pointed out of the window. That at any rate is true, I said. Weston took the cloth out of Mashmood's hand, and the piping ceased. In a moment he stretched himself and rubbed his eyes. Khalas, he said. Yes, it is Khalas. Did I tell you of the sit in England? He asked. Yes, oh yes, I answered. Thank you, little Mashmood. The white magic was very good tonight. Get you to bed. Mashmood trotted obediently out of the room, and Weston closed the door after him. We must be quick, he said. It is worthwhile going and giving the thing a chance, though I wish he had seen something less gruesome. The odd thing is that he was not at the funeral, and yet he describes the grave accurately. What do you make of it? I make that the white magic has shown Mashmood that somebody with black magic is going to Abdul's grave, perhaps to rob it, I answered resolutely. 
What are we to do when we get there? Asked Weston. See the black magic at work? Personally, I am in a blue funk. So are you. There is no such thing as black magic, said Weston. Ah, I have it. Give me that orange. Weston rapidly skinned it and cut from the rind two circles as big as a five-shilling piece and two long white fangs of skin. The first he fixed in his eye, the two latter in the corners of his mouth. The spirit of black magic? I asked. The same. He took up a long black burnus and wrapped it around him. Even in the bright lamp light, the spirit of black magic was a sufficiently terrific personage. I don't believe in black magic, he said, but others do. If it is necessary to put a stop to to anything that is going on, we will hoist the man on his own petard. Come along. Whom do you suspect it is? I mean, of course, who was the person you were thinking of when your thoughts were transferred to Machmut? What Machmut said, I answered, suggested Ashmeth to me. Weston indulged in a laugh of scientific incredulity, and we set off. The moon, as the boy had told us, was just clear of the horizon, and as it rose higher, its colour at first red and sombre, like the blaze of some distant conflagration, paled to a tawny yellow. The hot wind from the south, blowing no longer fitfully but with a steadily increasing violence, was thick with sand, and of an incredibly scorching heat, and the tops of the palm trees in the garden of the deserted hotel, on the right, were lashing themselves to and fro with a harsh rattle of dry leaves. The cemetery lay on the outskirts of the village, and, as long as our way lay between the mud walls of the huddling street, the wind came to us only as the heat from behind closed furnace doors. Every now and then, with a whisper and whistle, rising into a great buffeting flap, a sudden whirlwind of dust would scar some twenty yards along the road, and then break like a shore-quenched wave against one or other of the mud walls, or throw itself heavily against a house and fall in a shower of sand. But once free of obstructions, we were opposed to the full heat and blast of the wind which blew full in our teeth. It was the first summer come scene of the year, and for the moment I wished I had gone north with the tourist and the quail and the billiard marker, for Khamsin fetches the marrow out of the bones and turns the body to blotting paper. We passed no one in the street, and the only sound we heard, except the wind, was the howling of moonstruck dogs. The cemetery is surrounded by a tall mud-built wall, and sheltering for a few moments under this, we discussed our movements. The row of tamarisks close to which the tomb lay went down the centre of the graveyard and by skirting the wall outside and climbing softly over where they approached it, the fury of the wind might help us to get near the grave without being seen, if anyone happened to be there. We had just decided on this, and were moving on to put the scheme into execution, when the wind dropped for a moment, and in the silence we could hear the chump of the spade being driven into the earth, and what gave me a sudden thrill of intimate horror the cry of the carrion-feeding hawk from the dusty sky just overhead. Two minutes later, we were creeping up in the shade of the tamarisks, to where Abdul had been buried. The great green beetles, which live on the trees, were flying about blindly, and once or twice one dashed into my face with a whir of mail-clad wings. When we were within some twenty yards of the grave, we stopped for a moment, and, looking cautiously out from our shelter of tamarisks, saw the figure of a man already waist deep in the earth, digging out the newly turned grave. Weston, who was standing behind me, had adjusted the characteristics of the spirit of black magic so as to be ready for emergencies, and turning round suddenly, and finding myself unawares face to face with that realistic impersonation, though my nerves are not precariously strong, I could have found it within me to shriek aloud. But that unsympathetic man of iron only shook with suppressed laughter, and, holding the eyes in his hand, motioned me forward again without speaking to where the trees grew thicker. There we stood not a dozen yards away from the grave. We waited, I suppose, for some ten minutes, while the man, whom we saw to be Achmet, toiled on at his impious task. He was entirely naked and his brown skin glistened with the dews of exertion in the moonlight. At times, he chattered in a cold, uncanny manner to himself, and once or twice he stopped for breath. 
Then he began scraping the earth away with his hands, and soon afterwards searched in his clothes which were lying near for a piece of rope with which he stepped into the grave, and in a moment reappeared again with both ends in his hands. Then, standing astride the grave, he pulled strongly, and one end of the coffin appeared above the ground. He chipped a piece of the lid away to make sure that he had the right end, and then, setting it upright, wrenched off the top with his knife and there faced us, leaning against the coffin lid, the small shriveled figure of the dead Abdul, swathed like a baby in white. I was just about to motion the spirit of black magic to make his appearance, when Machmut's words came into my head. He has with him the black magic which can raise the dead. And sudden overwhelming curiosity, which froze disgust and horror into chill, unfeeling things, came over me. Wait, I whispered to Weston, he will use the black magic. Again the wind dropped for a moment, and again in the silence that came with it, I heard the chiding of the hawk overhead, this time nearer, and thought I heard more birds than one. Ashmeet meantime had taken the covering from off the face, and had undone the swathing band, which at the moment after death is bound round the chin to close the jaw, and an Arab burial is always left there, and from where we stood I could see that the jaw dropped when the bandage was untied, as if, though the wind blew towards us with the ghastly scent of mortality on it, the muscles were not even now set, though the man had been dead sixty hours. But still a rank and burning curiosity to see what this unclean gowl would do next stifled all other feelings in my mind. He seemed not to notice, or, at any rate, to disregard that mouth-gaping awry, and moved about nimbly in the moonlight. He took from a pocket of his clothes, which were lying near, two small black objects, which now are safely embedded in the mud at the bottom of the Nile, and rubbed them briskly together. By degrees, they grew luminous with the sickly yellow pallor of light, and from his hands went up a wavy, phosphorescent flame. One of these cubes he placed in the open mouth of the corpse, the other in his own, and, taking the dead man closely in his arms as though he would indeed dance with death, he breathed long breaths from his mouth into that dead cavern which was pressed to his. Suddenly he started back with a quick-drawn breath of wonder, and perhaps of horror, and stood for a space as if irresolute, for the cube which the dead man held, instead of lying loosely in the jaw, was pressed tight between clenched teeth. After a moment of irresolution, he stepped back quickly to his clothes again, and took up from near them the knife with which he had stripped off the coffin lid, and holding this in one hand behind his back, with the other he took out the cube from the dead man's mouth, though with a visible exhibition of force, and spoke. Abdul, he said, I am your friend, and I swear I will give your money to Muhammad if you will tell me where it is. Certain I am that the lips of the dead moved, and the eyelids fluttered for a moment like the wings of a wounded bird. But at that sight, the horror so grew on me that I was physically incapable of stifling the cry that rose to my lips, and Ashmeet turned round. Next moment, the complete spirit of black magic glided out of the shade of the trees and stood before him. The wretched man stood for a moment without stirring. Then, turning with shaking knees to flee, he stepped back and fell into the grave he had just opened. Weston turned on me angrily, dropping the eyes and the teeth of the Afrit. You spoiled it all, he cried. It would perhaps have been the most interesting and his eyes lighted on the dead Abdul, who peered open-eyed from the coffin, then swayed, tottered, and fell forward, face downwards on the ground close to him. For one moment he lay there, and then the body rolled slowly onto its back without visible cause of movement, and lay staring into the sky. The face was covered with dust, but with the dust was mingled fresh blood. A nail had caught the cloth that wounded him, underneath which, as usual, were the clothes in which he had died, for the Arabs do not wash their dead, and it had torn a great rent through them all, leaving the right shoulder bare. Weston strove to speak once, but failed. Then, I will go and inform the police, he said, if you will stop here and see that Ashmeet does not get out. But this I altogether refuse to do, 
and after covering the body with the coffin to protect it from the hawks, we secured Ashmeet's arms with the rope he had already used that night and took him off to Luxor. Next morning, Mohammed came to see us. I thought Ashmeet knew where the money was, he said exultantly. Where was it? In a little purse tied round the shoulder. The dog had already begun stripping it, see? And he brought it out of his pocket. It is all there in those English notes. Five pounds each, and there are twenty of them. Our conclusion was slightly different, for even Weston will allow that Ashmeet hoped to learn from dead lips the secret of the treasure, and then to kill the man anew and bury him. But that is pure conjecture. The only other point of interest lies in the two black cubes which we picked up, and found to be graven with curious characters. These I put one evening into Mashmood's hand, when he was exhibiting to us his curious powers of thought transference. The effect was that he screamed aloud, crying out that the black magic had come, and though I did not feel certain about that, I thought they would be safer in mid Nile. Weston grumbled a little and said that he had wanted to take them to the British Museum, but that, I feel sure, was an afterthought. End of At Abdul Ali's Grave Recording by Shruti Sinha, Lucknow Story number six of The Room in the Tower and Other Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Loretta in Manhattan. The Room in the Tower and Other Stories by E. F. Benson. The Shootings of Aknalish. The dining room windows, both front and back, the one looking into Oakley Street, the other into a small backyard with three sooty shrubs in it, known as the garden, were all open, so that the table stood in midstream of such air as there was. But in spite of this the heat was stifling, since, for once in a way, July had remembered that it was the duty of good little summers to be hot. Hot in consequence it had been, heat reverberated from the house walls. It rose through the boot from the paving stones. It poured down from a large, superheated sun that walked the sky all day long in a benignant and golden manner. Dinner was over, but the small party of four who had eaten it still lingered. Mabel Armitage, it was she who had laid down the duty of good little summers, spoke first. Oh, Jim, it sounds too heavenly, she said. It makes me feel cool to think of it. Just fancy in a fortnight's time we shall all four of us be there, in our own shooting lodge. Farm house, said Jim. Well, I didn't suppose it was Balmoral with our own coffee-coloured salmon river roaring down to join the waters of our own lock. Jim lit a cigarette. Mabel, you mustn't think of shooting lodges and salmon rivers and locks, he said. It's a farmhouse, rather a big one though I'm sure we shall find it hard enough to fit in. The Salmon River you speak of is a big burn no more, though it appears that salmon have been caught there. But when I saw it, it would have required as much cleverness on the part of a salmon to fit into it as it will require on our parts to fit into our farmhouse. And the lock is a tarn. Mabel snapped the guide to Highland shootings out of my hand with the rudeness that even a sister should not show her elder brother and pointed a withering finger at her husband. Acnelie, she declaimed, is situated in one of the grandest and most remote parts of Sutherlandshire, to be let from August the 12th to the end of October. The lodge was shooting and fishing belonging, proprietor supplies two keepers, fishing gilly, boat on lock and dogs, Tenants should secure about 500 head of grouse and 500 head of mixed game, including partridge, black game, woodcock, snipe, roe deer, also rabbits in very large number, especially by ferreting. Large baskets of brown trout can be taken from the lock, and whenever the water is high, sea trout and occasional salmon. Lodge contains... Oh, I can't go on. It's too hot, and you know the rest. Rent only 350 pounds. Jim listened patiently. Well, he said, what then? Mabel rose with dignity. It's a shooting lodge with a salmon river and a lock, just as I have said. Come, Madge, let's go out. It is too hot to sit in the house. You'll be calling Buxton the major domo next, remarked Jim as his wife passed by him. 
I had picked up the guide to Highland shootings again, which my sister had so unceremoniously plucked from me, and idly compared the rent and attractions of Aknalish with other places that were to let. Seems cheap, too, I said. Why, here's another place, just the same sort of size and bag, for which they asked five hundred pounds. Here's another at five fifty. Jim helped himself to coffee. Yes, it does seem cheap, he said, but of course it's very remote. It took me a good three hours from Lerg, and I don't suppose I was driving very noticeably below the legal limit, but it's cheap, as you say. Now Madge, who is my wife, has her prejudices. One of them, an extremely expensive one, is that anything cheap has always some hidden and subtle drawback, which you discover when it is too late. And the drawback to cheap houses is drains or offices, the presence, so to speak, of the former, and the absence of the latter, so I hazarded these. No, the drains are all right, said Jim, because I got the certificate of inspector, and as for offices, really I think the servants' parts are better than ours. No, why it's so cheap, I can't imagine. Perhaps the bag is overstated, I suggested. Jim again shook his head. No, that's the funny thing about it, he said. The bag, I am sure, is understated. At least, I walked over the moor for a couple of hours, and the whole place is simply crawling with hares. Why, you could shoot five hundred hares alone on it. Hares, I asked. That's rather queer. So far up, isn't it? Jim laughed. So I thought, and the hares are queer, too. Big beasts, very dark in color. Let's join the others outside. Jove, what a hot night. Even as Mabel had said, that day fortnight found us all four, the four who had stifled and sweltered in Chelsea, flying through the cool and invigorating winds of the north. The road was in admirable condition, and I should not wonder if for the second time Jim's big napier were not noticeably below the legal limit. The servants had gone straight up, starting the same day as we, while we had got out at Perth, motored to Inverness, and were now on the second day nearing our goal. Never have I seen so depopulated a road. I do not suppose there was a man to a mile of it. We had left Lairg about five that afternoon, expecting to arrive at Aknalish by eight, but one disaster after another overtook us. Now it was the engine, and now a tire that delayed us, till finally we stopped some eight miles short of our destination to light up, for with the evening had come a huge rack of cloud out of the west, so that we were cheated of the clear post-sunset twilight of the north, then on again, till, with a little dancing of the car over a bridge, Jim said, That's the bridge of our Salmon River, so look out for the turning up to the lodge. It is to the right, and only a narrow track. You can send her along, Sefton, he called to the chauffeur. We shan't meet a soul. I was sitting in front, finding the speed and the darkness extraordinarily exhilarating. A bright circle of light was cast by our lamps, fading into darkness in front, while at the sides, cut off by the casing of the lamps, the transition into blackness was sharp and sudden. Every now and then, across the circle of illumination, some wild thing would pass. Now a bird, with hurried flutter of wings, when it saw the speed of the luminous monster would just save itself from being knocked over now a rabbit feeding by the side of the road would dash on to it and then bounce back again but more frequently it would be a hare that sprang up from its feeding and raced in front of us they seemed dazed and scared by the light unable to wheel into the darkness again until time and again i thought we must run over one so narrowly in giving a sort of desperate sideways leap did it miss our wheels then it seemed that one started up almost from under us and i saw to my surprise it was an en it was enormous in size and in color apparently quite black for some hundred yards it raced in front of us fascinated by the bright light pursuing it then like the rest it dashed for the darkness but it was too late and with a horrid jolt we ran over it at one sefton slowed down and stopped for Jim's rule is to go back always and make sure that any poor runover is dead. So we stopped. The chauffeur jumped down and ran back. What was it? Jim asked me as we waited. A hare. Sefton came running back. Yes, sir, quite dead, he said. I picked it up, sir. 
What for? Thought you might like to see it, sir. It's the biggest hair I ever see, and it's quite black. It was immediately after this that we came to the track up to the house, and in a few minutes we were within doors. There we found that if shooting lodge was a term unsuitable, so also was farmhouse, so roomy, excellently proportioned, and well furnished was our dwelling, while the contentment that beamed from Buxton's face was sufficient testimonial for the offices. In the hall, too, with its big open fireplace, were a couple of big solemn bookcases, full of serious works, such as some educated minister might have left, and coming down dressed for dinner before the others, I dipped into the shelves. Then something must long have been vaguely simmering in my brain, for I pounced on the book as soon as I saw it. I came upon Ewell's Folklore of the Northwest Highlands, and looked out hair in the index. Then I read, nor is it only witches that are believed to have the power of changing themselves into animals. Men and women on whom no suspicion of the sort lies are thought to be able to do this and to don the bodies of certain animals, notably hares. Such, according to local superstition, are easily distinguishable by their size and color, which approaches jet black. I was up and out early next morning, prey to the vivid desire that attacks many folk in new places, namely to look on the fresh country and the new horizons. And on going out, certainly the surprise was great, for I had imagined an utterly lonely and solitary habitation. Instead, scarce half a mile away, down the steep bray side, at the top of which stood our commodious farmhouse, ran a typically Scottish village street, the Hamlin, no doubt, of Achnalish. So steep was this hillside that the village was really remote. If it was half a mile away in crow-flying measurement, it must have been a couple of hundred yards below us. But its existence was the odd thing to me. There were some four dozen houses at the least, while we had not seen half that number since leaving Laird. A mile away, perhaps, lay the shining shield of the western sea. To the other side, away from the village, I had no difficulty in recognizing the river and the lock. The house, in fact, was set on a hog's back. From all sides, it must needs be climbed to. But, as is the custom of the Scots, no house, however small, should be without its due brightness of flowers. And the walls of this were purple with clematis, and orange with tripolium. It all looked very placid serene and serene and home-like. I continued my tour of exploration and came back rather late for breakfast. A slight check in the day's arrangements had occurred, for the head keeper, McLaren, had not come up, and the second, Sandy Ross, reported that the reason for this had been the sudden death of his mother the evening before. She was not known to be ill, but just as she was going to bed, she had thrown up her arms, screamed suddenly as if with fright, and was found to be dead. Sandy, who reported this news to me after breakfast, was just a slow, polite Scotchman, rather shy, rather awkward. Just as he finished, we were standing about outside the back door. There came up from the stables the smart, very English-looking Sefton. In one hand, he carried the black hair. He touched his hat to me as he went in. Just to show it to Mr. Armitage, sir, he said. She's as black as a boot. He turned into the door, but not before Sandy Ross had seen what he carried, and the slow, polite Scotchman was instantly turned into some furtive, frightened-looking man. And where might it be that you found that, sir? he asked. Now the black hair superstition had already begun to intrigue me. Why does that interest you? I asked. The slow Scotch look was resumed with an effort. It'll no interest me, he said. I just asked. There are unco many black hairs in Achnalish. Then his curiosity got the better of him. She'd have been nigh to where the road passes by and on to Achnalish, she asked. The hare? Yes, we found her on the road there. Sandy turned away. She a sat there, he said. 
There were a number of little plantations climbing up the steep hillside from Aknalish to the moor above, and we had a pleasant slack sort of morning shooting there, walking through and round them with a nondescript tribe of beaters, among whom the serious Buxton figured. We had fair enough sport, but of the hares which Jim had seen in such profusion, none that morning came to the gun, till at last, just before lunch, there came out of the apex of one of these plantations, some thirty yards from where Jim was standing, a very large dark colored hare. For one moment I saw him hesitate, for he holds the correct view about long or doubtful shots at hares. Then he put up his gun to fire. Sandy, who had walked round outside after giving the beaters their instructions, was at this moment close to him, and with incredible quickness rushed upon him, and with his stick struck up the barrels of the gun before he could fire. Black hair, he cried. You'd shoot the black hair? There's no shooting of black hairs at all in Aknalish, and mark that. Never have I seen so sudden and extraordinary a change in a man's face. It was as if he had just prevented some black guard on the street from murdering his wife. Then he seemed to recover himself. I ask your pardon, sir, he said to Jim. I was upset with an thing and another, and the black hair you found dead last night. Ah, uh, I'm blathering again, but there's no a hair shot on Aknalish, that's sure. Jim was still looking in mere speechless astonishment at Sandy when I came up, and though shooting is dear to me, so too is folklore. But we've taken the shooting of Aknalish, Sandy, I said. There was nothing there about not shooting hares. Sandy suddenly boiled up again for a minute. And maybe there was nothing there about shooting the burns and the women, he cried. I looked round and saw that by now the beaters had all come through the wood, of them, Buxton and Jim's valet, who was also among them, stood apart. All the rest were standing round us, too, with gleaming eyes and open mouths, hanging on the debate, and forced, so I imagine, from their imperfect knowledge of English, to attend closely in order to catch the drift of what went on. Every now and then a murmur of Gaelic passed between them, and this somehow I found peculiarly disconcerting. But what have the hares to do with the children or women of Aknalish? I asked. There was no reply to this beyond the reiterated sentence. There's no shooting of hares in Aknalish, whatever. And then Sandy turned to Jim. That's the end of the bit, Wood, sir, he said. We've been around. Certainly the beat had been very satisfactory. A row had fallen to Jim. One ought also to have fallen to me, but remained, if not standing at any rate, running away. We had a dozen of black game, four pigeons, six brace of grouse. These were, of course, but outliers, as we had not gone on to the moor proper at all. Some thirty rabbits and four a couple of woodcock. This, it must be understood, was just from the fringe of plantations about the house. But this was all we meant to do today, making only a morning of it, since our ladies had expressly desired first lessons in the art of angling in the afternoon, so that they too could be busy. Excellently, too, had Sandy worked the beat, leaving us now, after going, as he said, all around, a couple of hundred yards only from the house, at a few minutes to two. So, after a little private signaling from Jim to me, he spoke to Sandy, dropping the hair question altogether. Well, the beat has gone excellently, he said, and this afternoon we'll be fishing. Please settle with the beaters every evening and tell me what you have paid out. Good morning to all. We walked back to the house, but the moment we had turned, a hum of confabulation began behind us, and looking back, I saw Sandy and all the beaters in close whispering conclave. Then Jim spoke. More in your line than mine, he said. I prefer shooting a hare to routing out some cock and bull story as to why I shouldn't. What does it all mean? I mentioned what I had found in Yule's last night. Then do you think it was we who killed the old lady on the road, and that I was going to kill somebody else this morning, he said. How does one know that they won't say that rabbits are their aunts, and will cock their uncles, and grouse their children? 
I have never had such rot, and tomorrow we'll have a hair drive. Blow the grouse. We'll settle this hair question first. Jim, by this time, was in the frame of mind typical of the English when their rights are threatened. He had the shooting of Acne Leash, on which were hares, Sir Hares, and if he chose to shoot hares, neither Papal Bull nor Royal Charter could stop him. Then there'll be a row, said I, and Jim sniffed scornfully. At lunch, Sandy's remark about the sickness, which I had forgotten till that moment, was explained. Fancy that horrible influenza getting here, said Madge. Mabel and I went down to the village this morning, and, oh, Ted, you can get all sorts of things, from Mackintoshes to peppermints, at the most heavenly shop, and there was a child there looking awfully ill and feverish. So we inquired. It was the sickness. That was all they knew. But from what the woman said, it's clearly influenza, sudden fever, and all the rest of it. Bad type, I asked. Yes, there have been several deaths among the old people from pneumonia following it. Now, I hope that as an Englishman, I too have a notion of my rights, and attempt anyhow to enforce them, as a general rule, if they are wantonly threatened. But if a mad bull wishes to prevent my going across a certain field, and do not insist on my rights, but go round instead, since I see no reasonable hope of convincing the bull that according to the constitution of my country, I may walk in this field unmolested. And that afternoon, as Madge and I drifted about the lock, while I was not employed in disentangling her flies from each other, or her hair, or my coat, I pondered over our position with regard to the hares and the men of Achnalish, and thought that the question of the bull in the field represented our standpoint pretty accurately. Jim had the shooting of Achnalish, and that undoubtedly included the right to shoot hares. So, too, he might have the right to walk over a field in which was a mad bull, but it seemed to me not more futile to argue with the bull than to hope to convince these folk of Achnalish that the hares were, as was assuredly the case, only hares, and not embodiments of their friends and relations. For that, beyond all doubt, was their belief, and it would take not half an hour's talk, but perhaps a couple of generations of education, to kill that belief, or even to reduce it to the level of a superstition. At present it was no superstition. The terror and incredulous horror on Sandy's face when Jim raised his gun to fire at the hare told me that. It was a belief as sober and commonplace as our own belief that the hares were not incarnations of living folk in Achnalish. Also, virulent influenza was raging in the place, and Jim proposed to have a hare drive tomorrow. What would happen? That evening, Jim raved about it in the smoking room. But, good gracious man, what can they do? he cried. What's the use of an old gaffer from Achnalish saying, I've shot his granddaughter, and, when he is asked to produce the corpse, telling the jury that we've eaten it, but that he has got the skin as evidence? What skin? A hare skin? Oh, folklore is all very well in its way, a nice subject for discussion when topics are scarce. But don't tell me it can enter into practical life. What can they do? They can shoot us, I remarked. The canny, God-fearing Scotchman shoot us for shooting hares, he asked. Well, it's a possibility. However, I don't think you'll have much of a hare drive in any case. Why not? Because you won't get a single native, native beater, and you won't get a keeper to come either. You'll have to go with Buxton and your man. Then I'll discharge Sandy, sniped Jim. That would be a pity. He knows his work. Jim got up. Well, his work tomorrow will be to drive hares for you and me, said Jim. Or do you funk? I funk, I replied. The scene the next morning was extremely short. Jim and I went out before breakfast and found Sandy at the back door, silent and respectful. In the yard were a dozen young Highlanders who had beaten for us the day before. Morning, Sandy, said Jim shortly. We'll drive hares today. We ought to get a lot in those narrow gaps above. Get a dozen beaters more, can you? 
There will be no hair drive here, said Sandy quietly. I've given you your orders, said Jim. Sandy turned to the group of beaters outside and spoke half a dozen words in Gaelic. Next moment the yard was empty, and they were all running down the hillside towards Achnalish. One stood on the skyline a moment, waving his arms, making some signal, as I suppose, to the village below. Then Sandy turned again. And where are your beaters, sir? he asked. For the moment I was afraid Jim was going to strike him, but he controlled himself. You are discharged, he said. The hair drive, therefore, since there were neither beaters nor keeper, McLaren, the head keeper, having been given this day off to bury his mother, was clearly out of the question, and Jim, still blustering rather, but a good bit taken aback at the sudden discipline defection of the beaters, was in betting humor that they would all return by tomorrow morning. Meanwhile, the post, which should have arrived before now, had not come, though Mabel, from her bedroom window, had seen the postcard on its way up the drive a quarter of an hour ago. At that, a sudden idea struck me, and I ran to the edge of the hog's back on which the house was set. It was even as I thought. The postcard was just striking the high road below, going away from the house and back to the village without having left our letters. I went back to the dining room. Everything apparently was going wrong this morning. The bread was stale, the milk was not fresh, and the bell was rung for Buxton. Quite so, neither milkman nor baker had called. From the point of view of folklore, this was admirable. There's another cock and bull story called taboo, I said. It means that nobody will supply you with anything. My dear fellow, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing, said Jim, helping himself to marmalade. I laughed. You are irritated, I said, because you are beginning to be afraid that there is something in it. Yes, quite true, he said, but who could have supposed there was anything in it? Ah, dash it, there can't be. A hare is a hare, except when it's your first cousin, I said. Then I shall go out and shoot first cousins by myself, he said. That, I am glad to say, in the light of what happened, we dissuaded him from doing, and instead he went off with Madge down the burn, and, I may confess, occupied myself the whole morning, ensconced in a thick piece of shrub, on the edge of the steep brae above Achnalish, and watching, through a field glass, what went on there. One could see, as from a balloon almost, the street with its houses was spread like a map below. First, then, there was a funeral, the funeral, I suppose, of the mother of McLaren, attended, I should say, by the whole village. But after that, there was no dispersal of the folk to their work. It was as if it was the Sabbath. They hung about the street talking. Now one group would break up, but it would only go to swell another, and no one went either to his house or to the fields. Then, shortly before lunch, another idea occurred to me, and I ran down the hillside, appearing suddenly in the street, to put it to the test. Sandy was there, but he turned his back square on me, as did everyone else, and as I approached any group, talk fell dead. But a certain movement seemed to be going on. Where they stood and talked before, they now moved and were silent. Soon I saw what that meant. None would remain in the street with me. Every man was going to his house. The end house of the street was clearly the heavenly shop we had been told of yesterday. The door was open, and a small child was looking round it as I approached, for my plan was to go in, order something, and try to get into conversation. But while I was still a yard or two off, I saw through the glass of the door a man inside come quickly up and pull the child roughly away, banging the door and locking it. I knocked and rang, but there was no response. Only from inside came the crying of the child. Cutting fuel. Fuel. The street, which had been so busy and populous, was now completely empty. It might have been the street of some long deserted place, but that thin smoke curled here and there above the houses. It was so silent, too, as the grave, but for all that I knew it was watching. From every house I felt sure I was being watched by eyes of mistrust and hate. 
yet no sign of living being could I see. There was to me something rather eerie about this. To know one is watched by invisible eyes is never, I suppose, quite a comfortable sensation. To know that those eyes are all hostile does not increase the sense of security. So I just climbed back up the hillside again, and from my thicket above the bray again I peered down. Once more the street was full. Now all this made me uneasy. The taboo had been started, and, since not a soul had been near us since Sandy gave the word, whatever it was, that morning was in excellent working order. Then what was the purport of these meetings and colloquies? What else threatened? The afternoon told me. It was about two o'clock when these meetings finally broke up, and at once the whole village left the street for the hillsides, much as if they were all returning to work. The only odd thing indeed was that no one remained behind. Women and children alike went out, all in little parties of two and three. Some of these I watched rather idly, for I had formed the hasty conclusion that they were all going back to their usual employments, and saw that here a woman and a girl were cutting dead bracken and heather. That was reasonable enough, and I turned my glass on others. Group after group I examined, all doing the same thing, cutting fuel, fuel. Then vaguely, with a sense of impossibility, a thought flashed across me. Again it flashed, more vividly. This time I left my hiding place with considerable alacrity and went to find Jim down by the burn. I told him exactly what I had seen and what I believed it meant, and I fancied that his belief in the possibility of folklore entering the domain of practical life was very considerably quickened. In any case, it was not a quarter of an hour afterwards that the chauffeur and I were going, precisely as fast as the Napier was able, along the road to Laird. We had not told the women what my conjecture was, because we believed that, making the dispositions we were making, there was no cause for alarm sounding. One private signal only existed between Jim within the house that night and me outside. If my conjecture proved to be correct, he was to place a light in the window of my room, which I should see returning after dark from Laird. My ostensible reason for going was to get some local fishing flies. As we flowed, there is no other word for the movement of these big cars but that, over the road to Laird, I ran over everything in my mind. I felt no doubt whatever that all the brushwood and kindling I had seen being gathered in was to be piled after nightfall round our walls and set on fire. This certainly would not be done till after dark. Indeed, we both felt sure that it would not be done till it was supposed that we were all abed. It remained to see whether the police at Laird agreed with my conjecture, and it was to ascertain this that I was now flowing there. I told my story to the chief constable as soon as I got there, omitting nothing and, I think, exaggerating nothing. His face got graver and graver as I proceeded. "'Yes, sir, you did right to come.' he said. The folk at Achnelish are the dourest and the most savage in all Scotland. You'll have to give up this hare hunting, though, whatever, he added. He rang up his telephone. I'll get five men, he said, and I'll be with you in ten minutes. Our plan of campaign was simple. We were to leave the car well out of sight of Achnelish, and, supposing the signal was in my window, steal up from all sides to command the house from every direction. It would not be difficult to make our way unseen through the plantations that run up close to the house, and hidden at the margins we could see whether the brushwood and heather were piled up round the lodge. There we should wait to see if anybody attempted to fire it. That somebody, whenever he showed his light, would be instantly covered by a rifle and challenged. It was about ten when we dismounted and stalked our way up to the house. The light burned in my window. All else was quiet. Personally, I was unarmed, and so, when I had planted the men in places of advantageous concealment round the house, my work was over. Then I returned to Sergeant Duncan, the chief constable, at the corner of the hedge by the garden, and waited. 
How long we waited, I do not know, but it seemed as if eons slipped by over us. Now and then an owl would hoot. Now and then a rabbit ran out from cover and nibbled the short, sweet grass of the lawn. The night was thickly overcast with clouds, and the house seemed no more than a black dot, with slits of light where windows were lit within. By and by even these slits of illumination were extinguished, and other lights appeared in the top story. After a while they too vanished. No sign of life appeared on the quiet house. Then, suddenly, the end came. I heard a foot grate on the gravel. I saw the gleam of a lantern and heard Duncan's voice. Mon, he shouted, if you move hand or foot thy fire, my rifle bead is dead on you. Then I blew the whistle. The others ran up, and in less than a minute it was all over. The man we closed in on was McLaren. They killed my mother with that hell carriage, he said, as she just sat on the road, poor body, who had never hurt them. And that seemed to him an excellent reason for attempting to burn us all to death. But it took time to get into the house. Their preparations had been singularly workmanlike, for every window and door on the ground floor was wired up. Now we had Acnalish for two months, but we had no wish to be burned or otherwise murdered. What we wanted was not a prosecution of our head keeper, but peace, the necessities of life and beaters. For that we were willing to shoot no hares and release McLaren. An hour's conclave next morning settled these things. The ensuing two months were most enjoyable, and relations were the friendliest. But if anybody wants to test how far what Jim still calls cock and bull stories can enter into practical life, I should suggest to go a shootin' hares at Aknalish. End of the shootings of Aknalish. Story 7 of The Room in the Tower and Other Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Room in the Tower and Other Stories by E. F. Benson How Fear Departed from the Long Gallery Hers Parable is a household visit and frequented by spectres, both visible and audible, that none of the family which it shelters under its acre and a half of green copper roofs take physical phenomena with any seriousness. For to the parables, the appearance of a ghost is a matter of highly greater significance than is the appearance of the post to those who live in more ordinary houses. It arrives, that is to say, Practically every day, it knocks or makes other noises. It is observed coming up the drive or in other places. I, myself, when staying there, have seen the present Mrs. Perival, who is rather short-sighted, peer into the dusk while we were taking our coffee on the terrace after dinner and say to her daughter, My dear, was not that the blue lady who has just gone into the shrubbery? I hope she won't frighten Flo. We suffer Flo, dear. Flo, it may be remarked, is the youngest and most precious of many their sons. Blanche, however, gave a cursory whistle and crunched the sugar left unmelted at the bottom of her coffee cup between her very white teeth. Oh, darling, Flo isn't so silly as to mine. She said, Poor blue Aunt Bababa is such a bore. Whenever I met her, she always looks as if she wanted to speak to me. But when I say, What is it, Aunt Bababa? She never utters, but only points somewhere towards the house, which is so vague. I believe there was something she wanted to confess about 200 years ago, but she has forgotten what it is. Here Flo gave two or three short please bucks and came up of the shrubbery wagging her tail, and curbing round what appeared to me to be a perfectly empty space on the lawn. There, Flo has made friends with her, said Mrs. Perival. I wonder why she dresses in that very stupid state of blue. 
from this, it may be gathered that even with regard to physical phenomena, there is some truth in the proverb that speaks of familiarity. But the parables do not exactly treat their ghosts with contempt, since most of that delightful family never despise anybody except such people as Arably did not care for hunting or shooting, or golf or skating, and as all of their ghosts are of their family. It seems reasonable to suppose that they all, even the poor blue lady, excel at one time in a few spots. So, so far, then they harbor no such unkindness or contempt, but only pity. Of one parallel, indeed, who broke his neck in vainly attempting to ride up the main staircase on a top of bread mare after some monstrous and violent deed in the back garden, they are very fond. And Blanche comes downstairs in the morning with an eye unusually bright when she can announce that Master Anthony was very loud that night. He, apart from the fact of his having been so far a ruffian, was a tremendous fellow across country, and they like this in the cases of the continuance of his superb vitality. In fact, it is supposed to be a compliment when you go to stay at Church Parable to be assigned a bedroom is frequented by defunct members of the family. It means that you are worthy to look on the august and villainous dead, and you will find yourself sewn into some vaulted or tapestried chamber, without benefit of electric light, and are told that great-great-grandmama Bridget Occasion ally has very business by the fireplace, but it's better not to talk to her, and that you will hear Master Anthony awfully well if he attends the front staircase any time before morning. There you are left for your nice repose, and, having quirkingly undressed, begin reluctantly to put out your candles. It is dirty in these great chambers, and the solemn tapestry swings and bellows and subsides, and the firelight dances on the forms of huntsmen and warriors and stern pursuits. Then you climb into your bed, a bed so huge that you feel as if the desert of Sahara was spread for you, and pray, like the mariners who sail with St. Paul for a day. And all the time, you are aware that Freddy and Harry and Blunt, and possibly even Mrs. Parable, are quite capable of dressing up and making disquieting tappings outside your door, so that when you open it, some incontestable horror fronts you. For myself, I stick steadily to the assertion that I have an obscure morbula disease of the heart, and so sleep undisturbed in the new wing of the house where Aunt Barbara and great great grandmama Bridget and Master Anthony never penetrate. I forgot the details of great great grandmama Bridget, but she certainly cut the throat of some distant relation before she disempowered herself with the axe that has been used at Agincourt. Before that, she had led a very sultry life crammed with amazing incident. But this one goes at such parable at which the family never laugh, in which they feel no friendly and amused interest, and of which they only speak just as much as is necessary for the safety of their guests. More properly, it will be described as two ghosts, for the haunt in question is that of two very young children, who were twins. This, not without reason, the family take very seriously. Indeed, the story of them, as told me by Mrs. Parable, is as follows. In the year 1602, the same being the last of Queen Elizabeth's reign, a certain Dick Parable was greatly in favour at court. He was brother to Master Joseph Parable, then owner of the family house and lands, who two years previously, at the respectable age of 74, became father of twin boys firstborn of his progeny. It is known that the royal and ensign virgin had said to handsome Dick, who was nearly forty years his brother's junior, This pity that you are not master of such parable, and this was probably suggested to him a sinister design. Be that as it may, handsome Dick, who very adequately sustained the family reputation for wickedness, set off to ride down to Yorkshire, and found that, very conveniently, his brother Joseph had just been seized with an apoplexy, which appeared to be the result of a continuous spell of hot weather combined with a necessity of quenching his thirst with an augmented amount of sack, and had actually died while Handsome Dick, 
with God knows what thoughts in his mind, was journeying northwards. Thus, it came about that he arrived at Church Parable just in time for his brother's funeral. It was with great propriety that he attended the obsequies, and returned to spend a sympathetic day or two of mourning with his widowed sister-in-law, who was but a faint-hearted dame, little fit to be mated with such hawks as these. On the second night of his stay, he did that with the perilous regret to this day. He entered the room where the twins slept with their nurse, and quietly strangled the latter as he slept. Then he took the twins and put them into the fire which warms the long gallery. The weather, which up to the day of Joseph's death had been so hot, had changed suddenly to bitter cold, and the fire was heaped high with burning logs and was exultant with flame. In the core of this conflagration, he struck out a cremation chamber, and into that he threw the two children, standing them down with his riding boots. They could just walk but they could not walk out of that other place. He said that he laughed as he had the more locks. Thus, he became master of such parallel. The crime was never brought home to him, but he lived no longer than a year in the enjoyment of his bloodstained inheritance. When he lay a dying, he made his confession to the priest who attended him, but his spirit struggled forth from his fleshy coil before absolution could be given him. On that very night, there began in Church Parable the hunting which to this day is but seldom spoken of by the family, and then only in low tones and with seriousness. For, only an hour or two after Handsome Dick's death, one of the servants passing the door of the long gallery heard from within peals of the loud laughter so jovial and yet so sinister, which he had thought would never be heard in the house again. In the moment of that cold courage, which is so nearly akin to mortal terror, he opened the door and entered, expecting to see he knew not what manifestation of him who lay dead in the room below. Instead, he saw two little white robed figures toddling towards him, hand in hand, across the moonlit floor. The watchers in the room below ran upstairs startled by the crest of his fallen body and found him lying in the grip of some dread convulsion. Just before morning, he regained consciousness and told his tale, then pointing with trembling and as gray finger towards the door. He screamed aloud, and so fell back dead. During the next fifty years, this twins and terrible legend of the twin babies became fixed and consolidated. Their appearance, luckily for those who inhabit the house, was exceedingly rare. And during these years, they seem to have been seen four or five times only. On each occasion, they appeared at night, between sunset and sunrise, always in the same long gallery, and always as two twirling children, scarcely able to walk. And on each occasion, the luckless individual who saw them died either speedily or terribly, or with both speed and terror, after the accursed reason had appeared to him. Sometimes he might live for a few months. He was lucky if he died, as did the servant who first saw them in a few hours. Must be more awful was the fate of a certain Mrs. Canning, who had the ill luck to see them in the middle of the next century, or to be quite accurate, in the year 1760. By this time the hours and the place of their appearance were well known, and, as up till a year ago, Visitors were warned not to go between sunset and sunrise into the long gallery. But Mrs. Canning, a brilliantly clever and beautiful woman, admirer also and friend of the notorious sceptic Monsieur Voltaire, willfully ran and sat night after night, in spite of all protestants, in the haunted place. For four evenings, she saw nothing. But on the fifth, she had her view, for the door in the middle of the gallery opened, and they came toddling towards her, the ill woman innocent little pair. It seemed that even then she was not frightened, but she thought good poor rats to mock at them, telling them it was time for them to get back into the fire. They gave no word in answer, but turned away from her crying and sobbing. Immediately after they disappeared from her vision, and she rustled downstairs to where the family and guests in the house were waiting for her, 
with the triumphant announcement that she had seen them both. I must need to write to Monsieur Voltaire, saying that she had spoken to spirits made manifest. It would make him laugh. But when some months later the whole news with him, he did not laugh at all. Mrs. Canning was one of the great beauties of her day, and in the year 1760, she was at the height and zenith of her blossoming. The chief beauty, if it is possible to single out one point where all was so exquisite, lay in the dazzling color and incomparable brilliance of her complexion. She was now just 30 years of age, but in spite of the excesses of her life, retained the snow and roses of girlhood. As he courted the bright light of day with other women's sun, for it but so to greater advantage the splendor of her skin. In consequence, she was very considerably dismayed one morning, about a fortnight after her strange experience in the long gallery, to observe on her left cheek an ease or two below her turquoise-colored eyes, a little grayish patch of skin about as big as a three-penny piece. It was in vain that she applied her accustomed washes and unguents, vain to but the arts of her fathers and of her medical adviser. For a week, she kept herself secluded, muttering herself with solitude and unaccustomed physics, and for result, at the end of the week, she had no amelioration to comfort herself with. Instead, this woeful grave has had doubled itself in size. Day after the nameless disease, whatever it was, developed in new and terrible ways. From the center of the discolored place, there sprouted forth little litten, like tendrils of greenish gray, and another pest appeared on her lower lip. This, too, soon vegetated, and one morning, on opening her eyes to the horror of a new day, she found that her vision was strangely blurred. She sprang to her looking glass, and what she saw caused her to speak aloud with horror. From under her upper eyelid, a fresh growth had sprung up, mushroom like in the night, and its filaments extended downwards, screening the pupil of her eye. Soon after her tongue and throat were attacked, the air passages became obstructed, and death by suffocation was merciful after such suffering. More terrible yet was the case of a certain colonial Blanchard who fired at the children with his revolver. What he went through is not to be recorded here. It is this haunting, then, that the perverts take quite seriously, and every guest on his arrival in the house is told that the long gallery must not be entered after nightfall on any pretext whatever. By day, however, it is a delightful room and intrinsic ally Mary's description. Apart from the fact that the due understanding of its geography is necessary for the account that here follows, it is full 80 feet in length and is lit by a row of six tall windows looking over the gardens at the back of the house. A door communicates with the landing at the top of the main staircase and about halfway down the gallery in the wall facing the windows is another door communicating with the black staircase and servants' quarters and thus the gallery forms a constant place of passage for them in going to the rooms on the first landing. It was through this door that the baby figures came when they appeared to Mrs. Canning, and on several other occasions, they have been known to make their entry here, for the room out of which handsome Dick took them lies just beyond at the top of the back stairs. Further on again in the gallery is the fireplace into which he thrust them, and at the far end a last bow window looks straight down the avenue. Above this fireplace there hangs with grim significance a portrait of handsome Dick, in the insolent beauty of early manhood, attributed to Holbein, and a dozen other portraits of great merit face the windows. During the day, this is the most frequented sitting room in the house, for its other visitors never appear there then, nor does it then ever resound with the harsh, jovial laugh of handsome Dick, which sometimes, after dark has fallen, is heard by a passerby on the landing outside. But Blanche does not go bright-eyed when she hears it. 
She sucks her ears and hastens to put a greater distance between her and the sound of that atrocious muff. But during the day, the long gallery is frequented by many occupants. Emma's laughter in no way sinister or saturnine resounds there. When summer lies hot over the land, those occupants lounge in the deep window seats, and when winter spreads his icy fingers and blows sweetly between his frozen palms, congregate round the fireplace at the far end and put in companies of cheerful chatterers upon sofa and chair and chair back and floor. Often have I sat there on long August evenings up till dressing time, but never have I been there when anyone has seemed disposed to linger over late without hearing the warning. It's close on sunset, so we go. Later on in the shorter autumn days, they often have tea late there, and sometimes it has happened that, even while my woman was most uproarious, Mrs. Perler has suddenly looked out of the window and said, My dears, it's getting so late. Let us finish our nonsense downstairs in the hall. And then, for a moment, a curious house always falls on Loquacious family and guests alike. And as if some bad news had just been known, we all make our silent way out of the place. But the spirits of the parables of the living ones, that is to say, are the most mercurial imaginable. And the blight with the top of handsome Dick and his doings cast over them passes away again with amazing rapidity. A typical party, lads, young and peculiarly cheerful, was staying at Sir's Parable softly after Christmas last year. And as usual on December 31st, Mrs. Parable was giving her annual New Year's Eve ball. The house was quite full, and she had commanded as well the greater part of the Parable arms to provide sleeping quarters for the overflow from the house. For some days past, a black and windless frost had stopped all hunting, but it is an ill windlessness that blows no good. If so, miss a metaphor may be forgiven, and the lake below the house had for the last day or two been covered with an adequate and admirable sheet of ice. Everyone in the house had been occupied all the morning of that day in performing swift and violent maneuvers on the elusive surface, and as soon as lunch was over we all, with one exception, hurried out again. This one exception was Max Dalrymple, who had had the misfortune to fall rather badly earlier in the day, but hoped, by resting her injured knee, instead of joining the skaters again, to be able to dance that evening. The hope, it is true, was of the most sanguine sort, for she could but hobble ignobly back to the house, but with the breezy optimism which characterized the parables, she is Blanche's first cousin. She remarked that it would be but tepid enjoyment that she could, in her present state, derive from further skating, and thus she sacrificed little, but might gain much. Accordingly, after a rapid cup of coffee, which was served in the long gallery, we left Max comfortably reclined on the big sofa at right angles to the fireplace, with an attractive book to beguile the tedium tail tea. Being of the family, she knew all about handsome Dick and the babies, and the fate of Mrs. Cannon and Colonel Blanche. But as we went out, I heard Blanche say to her, Don't want it too fine, dear. And Max had replied, No, I'll go away well before sunset. And so he left her alone in the long gallery. Max read her attractive book for some minutes, but failing to get a sob in it, peeled it down and leaned across to the window. Though it was still but little after two, it was but a dim and uncertain light that entered, for the crystalline brightness of the morning had given place to a real obscurity produced by flocks of thick clouds which were coming sluggishly up from the northeast. Already the whole sky was overcast with them, and occasionally a few snowflakes fluttered wiveringly down past the long windows. From the darkness and bitter cold of the afternoon, it seemed to her that there was like to be a heavy snowfall before long, and these outward signs were echoed inwardly in her by that muffled drowsiness of the brain, 
This to those who are sensitive to the presence and likenesses of weather for ten storm. Mars was particularly the prey of such external influences. To her, a brief morning gave an ineffable brightness and briskness of spirit, and correspondingly, the approach of heavy weather produced a soundness in the sensation that both drowns and depresses her. It was in such mood as this that she leaned back again to the sofa beside the log fire. The whole house was comfortably heated by water pipes, and and though the fire of logs and peat and a durable mixture had been allowed to burn low, the room was very warm. Adelie she watched the dwindling flames, not opening her book again, but lying on the sofa with face towards the fireplace, intending drowsily and not immediately to go to her own room and spend the hours, until the return of the skaters. Made gaiety in the house again, inviting one or two neglected letters. Still drowsily, she began thinking over what she had to communicate. One letter, several days overdue, should go to her mother, who was immensely interested in the physical affairs of the family. She would tell her how Master Anthony had been prodigiously active on the staircase a night or two ago, and how the blue lady, regardless of the severity of the weather. Had been seen by Mrs. Parable that morning, strolling about. It was rather interesting. The blue lady had gone down the lower walk and had been seen by her to enter the stables, where, at the moment, Freddy Parable was inspecting the frost-bound hunters. Identically, then, a sudden panic had spread through the stables, and the horses had whinnied and kicked, and sighed and sweated. Of the fatal twins, nothing had been seen for many years past. But as her mother knew, the Parables never used the long gallery after dark. Then, for a moment, she sat up, remembering that she was in the long gallery now. But it was still but a little after half past two, and if she went to her room in half an hour, she would have ample time to write this and another letter before tea. Till then, she would read her book. But she found she had left it on the window sill, and it seemed scarcely worthwhile to get it. She felt exceedingly drowsy. The sofa where she lay had been lately recovered, in a greyish green silk of velvet, somewhat the colour of lichen. It was of very thick, soft texture, and she lustrously stretched her arms out, one on each side of her body, and pressed her fingers into the neck. How horrible that story of Mrs. Canning was! The growth on her face was of the colour of lichen, and then, without further transition or blurring of thought, Mars fell asleep. She dreamed. She dreamed that she awoke and found herself exactly where she had gone to sleep, and in exactly the same attitude. The flames from the logs had burned up again, and leaped on the walls. Fitfully illuminating the picture of handsome Dick above the fireplace, in her dream she knew exactly what she had done today, and for what reason she was lying here now instead of being up with the rest of the skaters. She remembered also, still dreaming, that she was going to write a letter or two before tea, and prepared to get up in order to go to her room. As she half rose, she caught sight of her own arms lying out. On each side of her, on the grey velvet sofa, but she could not see where her hands ended, and where the grey velvet began. Her fingers seemed to have melted into the stuff. She could see her wrist quite clearly, and the blue line on the backs of her hands, and here and there a knuckle. Then, in her dream, she remembered the last thought which had been in her mind before she fell asleep. Dimly, the growth of the lichen-coloured vegetation on the face, and the eyes, and the throat of Mrs. Canning. At that thought, the strangling terror of real nightmare began. She knew that she was being transformed into this grey stuff, and she was absolutely unable to move. Soon, the grey would spread up her arms and over her feet. When they came in from skating, they would find here nothing but a huge misshapen cushion of lichen-coloured velvet. And there will be C. The horror grew more acute, and then, by a violent effort, she shook herself free of the clutches of this very evil dream, and she awoke. 
For a minute or two, she lay there, conscious only of the tremendous relief at finding herself awake. She felt again with her fingers the pleasant touch of the velvet, and drew them backwards and forwards, assuring herself that she was not, as her dream had suggested, melting into greyness and softness. But she was still, in spite of the violence of her awakening, very sleepy, and lay there till, looking down, she was aware that she could not see her hands at all. It was nearly very dark. At that moment, a sudden flicker of flame came from the dying fire, and a flare of burning gas from the pit flooded the room. The portrait of Hanson Dick looked evilly down on her, and her hands were visible again. And then the panic, worse than the panic of her dreams, seized her. Daylight had altogether faded, and she knew that she was alone in the dark in the terrible gallery. This panic was of nature of nightmare for she felt unable to move for terror. But it was worse than nightmare because she knew she was awake. And then the full cause of this frozen fear dawned on her. She knew with the certainty of absolute conviction that she was about to see the twin babies. She felt a sudden moisture break out on her face, and between her mouth, her tongue, and throat went suddenly dry, and she felt her tongue grit along the inner surface of her teeth. All power of movement had slipped from her lips, leaving them dead and inert, and she stared with white eyes into the blackness. The spurt of flame from the pit had burned itself out again, and darkness encompassed her. Then on the wall opposite her, facing the windows, there grew a faint light of dusky crimson. For a moment she thought it, but heralded the approach of the awful vision. Then hope revived in her heart and she remembered that thick clouds had overcast the sky before she went to sleep, and guessed that this light came from the sun, not yet quite sunk and set. This sudden revival of hope gave her the necessary stimulus, and she sprang off the sofa where she lay. She looked out of the window and saw the dull glow on the horizon. But before she could take a step forward, it was obscured again. A tiny sparkle of light came from the half, which did no more than illuminate the tiles of the fireplace, and snow falling heavily tapped at the window panes. There was neither light nor sound except this. But the courage that had come to her, giving her the power of movement, had not quite deserted her. And she began feeling her way down the gallery, and then she found that she was lost. She stumbled against a chair, and, recovering herself, stumbled against another. Then a table bowed her way, and, turning swiftly aside, she found herself up against the back of a sofa. Once more, she turned and saw the dim gleam of the firelight on the side opposite to that on which she expected it. In her blind gropings, she must have reversed her direction. But which way was she to go now? She seemed blocked in by furniture. And all the time insistent and imminent was the fact that the two innocent, terrible girls were about to appear to her. Then she began to pray. Lighten our darkness, O oh Lord, she said to herself. But she could not remember how the prayer continued, and she had so need of it. There was something about the perverse of the night. All this time, she felt about her with groping, fluttering hands. The fire glimmer which so have been on her left was on her right again. Therefore, she must turn herself round again. Lighten our darkness, she whispered, and then aloud she repeated, Lighten our darkness. She stumbled up against a screen, and could not remember the existence of any such screen. Hastily, she felt beside it with blind hands, and touched something soft and velvety. Was it the sofa on which she had laid? If so, where was the head of it? It had a head and a back and feet. It was like a person, all covered with grey lichen. Then she lost her head completely. All that remained to her was to pray. She was lost, lost in this awful place, where no one came in the dark except the babies that cried. And she heard her voice rising from whisper to speech, 
and spits to scream. She swigged out the Hollywoods. She yelled them as is blaspheming as she groped among tables and chairs and the pleasant things of ordinary life which had become so terrible. Then came a sudden and an awful answer to her scream prayer. Once more, a pocket of inflammable gas in the pit on the hearth was reached by the smoldering embers, and the room started into light. She saw the evil eyes of Hanson Dick. She saw the little ghostly snowflakes falling thickly outside. And she saw where she was, just opposite the door through where the terrible twins made their entrance. Then the flame went up again and left her in blackness once more. But she had gained something, for she had her geography now. The center of the room was bare of furniture, and one swift dart would take her to the door of the landing above the main staircase and into safety. In that gleam, she had been able to see the handle of the door. Bright brass, luminous like a star, she would go straight for it. It was but a matter of a few seconds now. She took a long breath, partly of relief, partly to satisfy the demands of her galloping heart. But the breath was only half taken when she was stricken once more into the immobility of nightmare. There came a little whisper. It was no more than that. From the door opposite which she stood and through which the twin babies entered. It was not quite dark outside it, for she could see that the door was opening. And there stood in the opening two little white figures side by side. They came towards her slowly, softly. She could not see face or form at all distinctly, but the two little white figures were advancing. She knew them to be the ghosts of terror, innocent of the awful doom they were bound to bring. Even as she was innocent, with the inconceivable rapidity of thought, she made up her mind what to do. She had not heard them or laughed at them. And they? They were but babies when the wicked and bloody deed had sent them to their burning death. Surely the spirits of these children will not be inaccessible to the cry of one who was of the same blood as they, who had committed no fault that merited the doom they brought. If she entreated them, they might have mercy. They might forbear to bring the curse on her. They might allow her to pass out of the place without blood, without the sentence of death, or the shadow of things worse than death upon her. It was but for the space of a moment that she hesitated. Then she sank down on to her knees and stretched out her hands towards them. Oh, my dears, she said, I only fell asleep. I have done no more wrong than that. She paused a moment, and her tender girl's heart thought no more of herself, but only of them, those little innocent spirits on whom so awful a doom was laid, that she should bring death where other children bring laughter and doom from delight. But all those who had seen them before had dreaded and feared them, or had mocked at them. Then, as the enlightenment of pity dawned on her, her fear fell from her like the wrinkled seed that holds the sweet for the buds of spring. Dears, I am so sorry for you, she said. It is not your fault that you must bring me what you must bring, but I am not afraid any longer. I am only sorry for you. God bless you, you poor darlings. She raised her head and looked at them. Though it was so dark, she could now see their faces, though all was dim and wavering, like the light of pure flames shaken by a draught. But the faces were not miserable or fierce. They smiled at her with sly little baby smiles, and as she looked, they grew faint, fading slowly away like wreaths of vapor in frosty 311. Mads did not at once move when they had vanished, for instead of fear, there was wrapped round her a wonderful sense of peace, so happy and serene that she would not willingly stir, and so perhaps disturb it. But before long, she got up, and feeling her way, but without any sense of nightmare pressing her on, or frenzy of fear to spur her, she went out of the long gallery, 
the fine blondes just coming upstairs, whistling and swinging her skates. How's the leg, dear? She asked. You are not limping anymore. Till that moment, Mark had not thought of it. I think it must be all right, she said. I have forgotten it anyhow. Blunt, dear, you won't be frightened for me, will you? But, but I have seen the twins. For a moment, Blunt's face whitened with terror. What? She said in a whisper. Yes, I saw them just now, but they were kind. They smiled at me, and I was sorry for them. And somehow I am sure I have nothing to fear. It seems that Matt was right, for nothing untoward has come to her. Something, her attitude to them, we must suppose, her pity, her sympathy, touched and dissolved and annihilated the curse. Indeed, I was at Church Parallel only last week, arriving there after dark. Just as I passed the gallery door, Blanche came out. Ah, there you are, she said. I have just been seeing the twins. They look too sweet and stop nearly ten minutes. Let us have tea at once. End of How Fear Departed from the Long Gallery Story 8 of The Room in the Tower and Other Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrew Gantz The Room in the Tower and Other Stories by E. F. Benson Caterpillars I saw a month or two ago in an Italian paper that the Villa Cascana, in which I once stayed, had been pulled down, and that a manufactory of some sort was in process of erection on its site. There is therefore no longer any reason for refraining from writing of those things which I myself saw, or imagined I saw, in a certain room and on a certain landing of the villa in question, nor for mentioning the circumstances which followed, which may or may not, according to the opinion of the reader, throw some light on, or be somehow connected with this experience. The Villa Cascana was in all ways but one a perfectly delightful house. Yet, if it were standing now, nothing in the world, and I use the phrase in its literal sense, would induce me to set foot in it again, for I believe it to have been haunted in a very terrible and practical manner. Most ghosts, when all is said and done, do not do much harm. They may perhaps terrify, but the person whom they visit usually gets over their visitation. They may, on the other hand, be entirely friendly and beneficent. But the appearances in the Villa Cascana were not beneficent, and had they made their visit in a very slightly different manner, I do not suppose I should have got over it any more than Arthur Inglis did. The house stood on an ilex-clad hill not far from Sestri di Levante on the Italian Riviera, looking out over the iridescent blues of that enchanted sea, while behind it rose the pale green chestnut woods that climb up the hillsides till they give place to the pines that, black in contrast with them, crown the slopes. All round it the garden and the luxuriance of mid-spring bloomed and was fragrant, and the scent of magnolia and rose borne on the salt freshness of the winds from the sea flowed like a stream through the cool vaulted rooms. On the ground floor, a broad pillared loggia ran round three sides of the house, the top of which formed a balcony for certain rooms of the first floor. The main staircase, broad and of grey marble steps, led up from the hall to the landing outside these rooms, which were three in number, namely two big sitting rooms and a bedroom arranged en suite. The latter was unoccupied, the sitting rooms were in use. From these, the main staircase was continued to the second floor, where were situated certain bedrooms, one of which I occupied, while from the other side of the first floor landing some half-dozen steps led to another suite of rooms where, at the time I am speaking of, Arthur Inglis, the artist, had his bedroom and studio. Thus, the landing outside my bedroom at the top of the house commanded both the landing of the first floor and also the steps that led to Inglis's rooms. Jim Stanley and his wife, finally, whose guest I was, occupied rooms in another wing of the house, where also were the servants' quarters. I arrived just in time for lunch on a brilliant noon of mid-May. 
The garden was shouting with color and fragrance, and not less delightful after my broiling walk up from the marina should have been the coming from the reverberating heat and blaze of the day into the marble coolness of the villa. Only, the reader has my bare word for this and nothing more, the moment I set foot in the house I felt that something was wrong. This feeling, I may say, was quite vague, though very strong, and I remember that when I saw letters waiting for me on the table in the hall I felt certain that the explanation was here. I was convinced that there was bad news of some sort for me. Yet when I opened them I found no such explanation of my premonition. My correspondence all reeked of prosperity. Yet this clear miscarriage of a presentiment did not dissipate my uneasiness. In that cool, fragrant house there was something wrong. I am at pains to mention this, because to the general view it may explain that though I am, as a rule, so excellent a sleeper that the extinction of my light on getting into bed is apparently contemporaneous with being called on the following morning, I slept very badly on my first night in the Villa Cascana. It may also explain the fact that when I did sleep, if it was indeed in sleep that I saw what I thought I saw, I dreamed in a very vivid and original manner. Original, that is to say, in the sense that something that, as far as I knew, had never previously entered into my consciousness, usurped it then. But since, in addition to this evil premonition, certain words and events occurring during the rest of the day might have suggested something of what I thought happened that night, it will be well to relate them. After lunch, then, I went around the house with Mrs. Stanley, and during our tour she referred, it is true, to the unoccupied bedroom on the first floor, which opened out of the room where we had lunched. We left that unoccupied, she said, because Jim and I have a charming bedroom and dressing room, as you saw, in the wing, and if we used it ourselves, we should have to turn the dining room into a dressing room and have our meals downstairs. As it is, however, we have our little flat there, Arthur Inglis has his little flat in the other passage, and I remembered, aren't I extraordinary, that you once said that the higher up you were in a house, the better you were pleased. So I put you at the top of the house instead of giving you that room. It is true that a doubt, vague as my uneasy premonition, crossed my mind at this. I did not see why Mrs. Stanley should have explained all this if there had not been more to explain. I allow, therefore, that the thought that there was something to explain about the unoccupied bedroom was momentarily present to my mind. The second thing that may have borne on my dream was this. At dinner, the conversation turned for a moment on ghosts. Inglis, with the certainty of conviction, expressed his belief that anybody who could possibly believe in the existence of supernatural phenomena was unworthy of the name of an ass. The subject instantly dropped. As far as I can recollect, nothing else occurred or was said that could bear on what follows. We all went to bed rather early, and personally I yawned my way upstairs feeling hideously sleepy. My room was rather hot, and I threw all the windows wide, and from without poured in the white light of the moon, and the love song of many nightingales. I undressed quickly and got into bed, but though I had felt so sleepy before, I now felt extremely wide awake. But I was quite content to be awake. I did not toss or turn. I felt perfectly happy listening to the song and seeing the light. Then, it is possible, I may have gone to sleep, and what follows may have been a dream. I thought, anyhow, that after a time the nightingales ceased singing and the moon sank. I thought also that if, for some unexplained reason, I was going to lie awake all night, I might as well read and I remembered that I had left a book in which I was interested in the dining room on the first floor. So I got out of bed, lit a candle, and went downstairs. I went into the room, saw on a side table the book I had come to look for, and then, simultaneously, saw that the door into the unoccupied bedroom was open. A curious gray light, not of dawn nor of moonshine, came out of it, and I looked in. The bed stood just opposite the door, a big four-poster, hung with tapestry at the head. Then I saw that the grayish light of the bedroom came from the bed, or rather from what was on the bed. For it was covered with great caterpillars, a foot or more in length, which crawled over it. They were faintly luminous, and it was the light from them that showed me the room. Instead of the sucker feet of ordinary caterpillars, they had rows of pincers like crabs, and they moved by grasping what they lay on with their pincers, and then sliding their bodies forward. In color, these dreadful insects were yellowish-gray, 
and they were covered with irregular lumps and swellings. There must have been hundreds of them, for they formed a sort of writhing, crawling pyramid on the bed. Occasionally, one fell off onto the floor with a soft, fleshy thud, and though the floor was of hard concrete, it yielded to the pincer feet as if it had been putty, and, crawling back, the caterpillar would mount onto the bed again to rejoin its fearful companions. They appeared to have no faces, so to speak, but at one end of them there was a mouth that opened sideways in respiration. Then, as I looked, it seemed to me as if they all suddenly became conscious of my presence. All the mouths, at any rate, were turned in my direction, and next moment they began dropping off the bed with those soft, fleshy thuds onto the floor and wriggling towards me. For one second a paralysis as of a dream was on me, but the next I was running upstairs again to my room, and I remember feeling the cold of the marble steps on my bare feet. I rushed into my bedroom and slammed the door behind me, and then, I was certainly wide awake by now, I found myself standing by my bed with the sweat of terror pouring from me. The noise of the banged door still rang in my ears, but, as would have been more usual if this had been mere nightmare, the terror that had been mine when I saw those foul beasts crawling about the bed or dropping softly onto the floor did not cease then. Awake now, if dreaming before, I did not at all recover from the horror of the dream. It did not seem to me that I had dreamed, and until dawn I sat or stood, not daring to lie down, thinking that every rustle or movement that I heard was the approach of the caterpillars. To them, and the claws that bit into the cement, the wood of the door was child's play. Steel would not keep them out. But with the sweet and noble return of the day, the horror vanished. The whisper of the wind became benignant again. The nameless fear, whatever it was, was smoothed out and terrified me no longer. Dawn broke, hueless at first. Then it grew dove-colored. Then the flaming pageant of light spread over the sky. The admirable rule of the house was that everybody had breakfast where and when he pleased, and in consequence it was not till lunchtime that I met any of the other members of our party, since I had breakfast on my balcony and wrote letters and other things till lunch. In fact, I got down to that meal rather late, after the other three had begun. Between my knife and fork there was a small pillbox of cardboard, and as I sat down, Inglis spoke. Do look at that, he said, since you are interested in natural history. I found it crawling on my counterpane last night, and I don't know what it is. I think that before I opened the pillbox I expected something of the sort which I found in it. Inside it, anyhow, was a small caterpillar, grayish-yellow in color, with curious bumps and excrescences on its rings. It was extremely active, and hurried round the box this way and that. Its feet were unlike the feet of any caterpillar I ever saw. They were like the pincers of a crab. I looked and shut the lid down again. No, I don't know what I said, but it looks rather unwholesome. What are you going to do with it? Oh, I shall keep it, said Inglis. It has begun to spin. I want to see what sort of a moth it turns into. I opened the box again, and saw that these hurrying movements were indeed the beginning of the spinning of the web of its cocoon. Then Inglis spoke again. It has got funny feet, too, he said. They're like crab's pincers. What's the Latin for crab? Ah, oh, yes, cancer. So, in case it is unique, let's christen it Cancer Inglisenis. Then something happened in my brain, some momentary piecing together of all that I had seen or dreamed. Something in his words seemed to me to throw light on it all, and my own intense horror at the experience of the night before linked itself on to what he had just said. In effect, I took the box and threw it, caterpillar and all, out of the window. There was a gravel path just outside, and beyond it a fountain playing into a basin. The box fell onto the middle of this. Inglis laughed. So the students of the occult don't like solid facts, he said. My poor caterpillar. The talk went off again at once on to other subjects, and I have only given in detail as they happened these trivialities in order to be sure myself that I have recorded everything that could have borne on occult subjects or on the subject of caterpillars. But at the moment when I threw the pillbox into the fountain, I lost my head. My only excuse is that, as is probably plain, 
The tenant of it was, in miniature, exactly what I had seen crowded onto the bed in the unoccupied room. And though this translation of those phantoms into flesh and blood, or whatever it is that caterpillars are made of, ought perhaps to have relieved the horror of the night, as a matter of fact it did nothing of the kind. It only made the crawling pyramid that covered the bed in the unoccupied room more hideously real. After lunch, we spent a lazy hour or two strolling about the garden or sitting in the loggia, and it must have been about four o'clock when Stanley and I started off to bathe, down the path that led by the fountain into which I had thrown the pillbox. The water was shallow and clear, and at the bottom of it I saw its white remains. The water had disintegrated the cardboard, and it had become no more than a few strips and shreds of sodden paper. The center of the fountain was a marble Italian cupid which squirted the water out of a wineskin held under its arm, and crawling up its leg was the caterpillar. Strange and scarcely credible as it seemed, it must have survived the falling to bits of its prison and made its way to shore, and there it was, out of arm's reach, weaving and waving this way and that as it evolved its cocoon. Then, as I looked at it, it seemed to me again that, like the caterpillar I had seen last night, it saw me and breaking out of the threads that surrounded it, it crawled down the marble leg of the cupid and began swimming like a snake across the water of the fountain towards me. It came with extraordinary speed. The fact of a caterpillar being able to swim was new to me, and in another moment was crawling up the marble lip of the basin. Just then, Inglis joined us. "'Why, if it isn't old Cancer Inglisenis again,' he said, catching sight of the beast. "'What a tearing hurry it's in!' We were standing side by side on the path, and when the caterpillar had advanced to within about a yard of us, it stopped, and began waving again, as if in doubt as to the direction in which it should go. Then it appeared to make up its mind, and crawled onto Inglis's shoe. "'It likes me best,' he said. "'But I don't really know that I like it, and as it won't drown, I think perhaps—' He shook it off his shoe onto the gravel path, and trod on it. All afternoon the air got heavier and heavier with the Sirocco that was without doubt coming up from the south, and that night again I went up to bed feeling very sleepy. But below my drowsiness, so to speak, there was the consciousness, stronger than before, that there was something wrong in the house, that something dangerous was close at hand. But I fell asleep at once, and, how long after I do not know, either woke or dreamed I awoke, feeling that I must get up at once, or I should be too late. Then, dreaming or awake, I lay and fought this fear, telling myself that I was but the prey of my own nerves disordered by Sirocco or what not, and at the same time quite clearly knowing in another part of my mind, so to speak, that every moment's delay added to the danger. At last this second feeling became irresistible, and I put on a coat and trousers and went out of my room onto the landing. And then I saw that I had already delayed too long, and that I was now too late. The whole of the landing of the first floor below was invisible under the swarm of caterpillars that crawled there. The folding doors into the sitting room from which opened the bedroom where I had seen them last night were shut, but they were squeezing through the cracks of it and dropping one by one through the keyhole, elongating themselves into mere string as they passed and growing fat and lumpy again on emerging. Some, as if exploring, were nosing about the steps into the passage at the end of which were Inglis's rooms. Others were crawling on the lowest steps of the staircase that led up to where I stood. The landing, however, was completely covered with them. I was cut off, and of the frozen horror that seized me when I saw that I can give no idea in words. Then at last a general movement began to take place, and they grew thicker on the steps that led to Inglis's room. Gradually, like some hideous tide of flesh, they advanced along the passage, and I saw the foremost, visible by the pale gray luminousness that came from them, reach his door. Again and again I tried to shout and warn him, in terror all the time that they would turn at the sound of my voice and mount my stair instead, but for all my efforts I felt that no sound came from my throat. They crawled along the hinge crack of his door, passing through as they had done before, and still I stood there making impotent efforts to shout to him, to bid him escape while there was still time. At last the passage was completely empty. They had all gone, and at that moment I was conscious for the first time of the cold of the marble landing on which I stood barefooted. 
The dawn was just beginning to break in the eastern sky. Six months later, I met Mrs. Stanley in a country house in England. We talked on many subjects, and at last she said, I don't think I have seen you since I got that dreadful news about Arthur Inglis a month ago. I haven't heard, I said. No, he's got cancer. They don't even advise an operation, for there is no hope of a cure. He is riddled with it, the doctors say. Now, during all these six months, I do not think a day had passed on which I had not had in my mind the dreams, or whatever you like to call them, which I had seen in the Villa Cascana. It is awful, is it not? she continued. And I feel I can't help feeling that he may have... Caught it at the villa? I asked. She looked at me in blank surprise. Why did you say that? she asked. How did you know? Then she told me. In the unoccupied bedroom a year before, there had been a fatal case of cancer. She had, of course, taken the best advice, and had been told that the utmost dictates of prudence would be obeyed so long as she did not put anybody to sleep in the room, which had also been thoroughly disinfected and newly whitewashed and painted. But... End of Caterpillars Story 9 of The Room in the Tower and Other Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrew James. The Room in the Tower and Other Stories by E.F. Benson. The Cat. Many people will doubtless remember that exhibition at the Royal Academy not so many seasons ago, which came to be known as Allingham's Year, when Dick Allingham vaulted with one bound, as it were, out of the crowd of strugglers and seated himself with admirably certain poise on the very top most pinnacle of contemporary fame. He exhibited three portraits, each a masterpiece, which killed every picture within range. But since that year nobody cared anything for pictures, whether in or out of range except for those three, it did not signify so greatly. The phenomenon of his appearance was as sudden as that of the meteor, coming from nowhere and sliding large and luminous across the remote and star-sown sky, as inexplicable as the bursting of a spring on some dust-ridden rocky hillside. Some fairy godmother, one might conjecture, had bethought herself of her forgotten godson, and with a wave of her wand bestowed on him this transcendent gift. But, as the Irish say, she held her wand in her left hand, for her gift had another side to it. Or perhaps again, Jim Merrick is right, and the theory he propounds in his monograph on obscure certain obscure lesions of the nerve centres, says the final word on the subject. Dick Allingham himself, as was indeed natural, was delighted with his fairy godmother, or his obscure lesion, whichever was responsible, and, the monograph spoken above was written after Dick's death, confessed frankly to his friend Merrick, who was still struggling through the crowds of rising young medical practitioners, that it was all quite as inexplicable to himself as it was to anyone else. All I know about it, he said, is that last autumn I went through two months of mental depression so hideous that I thought again and again that I must go off my head. For hours daily I sat here, waiting for something to crack, which, as far as I am concerned, would end everything. Yes, there was a cause. You know it. He paused a moment, and poured into his glass a fairly liberal allowance of whisky, filled it half up from a siphon, and lit a cigarette. The cause, indeed, had no need to be enlarged on, for Merrick quite well remembered how the girl Dick had been engaged to, threw him over with an abruptness that was almost superb, when a more eligible suitor made his appearance. The latter was certainly very eligible indeed, with his good looks, his title and his millions of money, and Lady Maddingley, ex-future Mrs Allingham, was perfectly content with what she had done. She was one of those blonde, lithe, silken girls who happily for the peace of men's minds are rather rare and who remind one of some humanised yet celestial and bestial cat. I needn't speak of the cause, Dick continued, but, as I say, for those two months I soberly thought that the one end of it would be madness, 
Then, one evening when I was sitting here alone, I was always sitting alone, something did snap in my head. I know, I wondered, without caring at all, whether this was the madness which I had been expecting, or whether, which would be preferable, some more fatal breakage had happened. And even while I wondered, I was aware that I was not depressed or unhappy any longer. He paused for so long in a smile in retrospect that Merrick indicated to him that he had a listener. Well, he said. It was well indeed. I haven't been unhappy since. I have been riotously happy instead. Some divine doctor, I suppose, just wiped off that stain on my brain that hurt so. Heavens, how it hurt. Have a drink, by the way. No, thanks, said Merrick. But what has all this got to do with your painting? Well, everything, for I had hardly realised the fact that I was happy again when I was aware that everything looked different. The colours of all I saw were twice as vivid as they had been. Shape and outline were intensified too. The whole visible world had been dusty and blurred before and seen in a half light, but now the lights were turned up and there was a new heaven and a new earth, and in the same flash I knew that I could paint things as I saw them, which, he concluded, I have done. There was something rather sublime about this, and Merrick laughed. I wish something would snap in my brain if it kindles the perceptions in that way, he said. But it is just possible that the snapping of things in one's brain does not always produce just that effect. That is possible. Also, as I gather, things don't snap unless you have gone through some such hideous period as I have been through. And I tell you frankly, I wouldn't go through that again even to ensure a snap that would make me see things like Titian. What did the snapping feel like? asked Merrick. Dick considered a moment. Do you know when a parcel comes, tied up with string, and you can't find a knife? He said. And therefore you burn the string through, holding it taut. Well, it was like that. Quite painless. Only something got weaker and weaker, and then parted, softly without effort. Not very lucid, I'm afraid, but it was just like that. It had been burning a couple of months, you see. He turned away and hunted among the letters and papers which littered his writing table till he found an envelope with a coronet on it. He chuckled to himself as he took it up. Commend me to Lady Maddingly, he said, for a brazen impudence in comparison with which brass is softer than putty. She wrote to me yesterday, asking me if I would finish the portrait I had begun of her last year and let her have it at my own price. Then I think you have had a lucky escape, remarked Merrick. I suppose you didn't even answer her. Oh yes, I did. Why not? I said the price would be £2,000 and I was ready to go on at once. She has agreed and sent me a cheque for a 1000 this evening. Merrick stared at him in blank astonishment. Are you mad? he asked. I hope not, though one can never be sure about little points like that. Even doctors, like you, don't know exactly what constitutes madness. Merrick got up. But it is possible that you don't see what a terrible risk you run, he asked. To see her again, to be with her like that, and having to look at her, I saw her, this afternoon by the way, hardly human, may not that so easily revive again all that you felt before? It's too dangerous, much too dangerous. Dick shook his head. There is not the slightest risk, he said. Everything within me is utterly and absolutely indifferent to her. I don't even hate her. If I hated her, there might be a possibility of my again loving her. As it is, the thought of her does not arouse in me any emotion of any kind. And really, such stupendous calmness deserves to be rewarded. I respect colossal things like that. He finished his whisky as he spoke and instantly poured himself out another glass. That's the fourth, said his friend. Is it? I never count. It shows a sordid attention to uninteresting detail. Funnily enough, too, alcohol does not have the smallest effect on me now. Why drink, then? Because, if I give it up, this entrancing vividness of colour and clarity of outline is a little diminished. Can't be good for you, said the doctor. Dick laughed. My dear fellow, look at me carefully, he said, and then, if you can conscientiously declare that I show any signs of indulging in stimulants, I'll give them up altogether. Certainly, it would have been hard to find a point in which Dick did not present the appearance of perfect health. He had paused and stood still, 
a moment, his glass in one hand, the whisky bottle in the other, black against the front of his shirt, and not a tremor of unsteadiness was there. His face, of wholesome sunburnt hue, was neither puffy nor emaciated, but firm of flesh and of a wonderful clearness of skin. Clear too was his eye, with eyelids neither baggy nor puckered. He looked indeed a model of condition, hard and fit, as if he was in training for some athletic event. Lithe and active too was his figure. His movements were quick and precise, and even Merrick, with his doctor's eye, trained to detect any symptom, however slight, in which the drinker must betray himself, was bound to confess that no such was here present. His appearance contradicted it authoritatively. So, also, his manner. He met the eye of a man he was talking to without sideways glances. He showed no signs, however small, of any disorder of the nerves. Yet Dick was altogether an abnormal fellow. The history he had just recounted was abnormal. These weeks of depression, followed by the sudden snap in his brain, which had apparently removed, as a wet cloth removes a stain, all the memory of his love, and of the cruel bitterness that resulted from it. Abnormal, too, was his sudden leap into high artistic achievement from a past of very mediocre performance. Why should there then not be a similar abnormality here? Yes, I confess you show no sign of taking excessive stimulant, said Merrick, but if I attended you professionally, ah, I'm not touting, I should make you give up all stimulants and go to bed for a month. Why in the name of goodness? asked Dick. Because, theoretically, it must be the best thing you could do. You had a shock, how severe, the misery of those weeks in depression tells you. Well, common sense says, go slow after a shock, recoup. Instead, of which you go very fast indeed, and produce. I grant it seems to suit you. You also became suddenly capable of feats which... Oh, it's sheer nonsense, man. What sheer nonsense? You are. Professionally, I detest you, because you appear to be an exception to a theory that I am sure must be right. Therefore, I have got to explain you away, and at present, I can't. What's the theory? asked Dick. Well, the treatment of shock, first of all, and secondly, that in order to do good work, one ought to eat and drink very little, and sleep a lot. How long do you sleep, by the way? Dick considered. Oh, I go to bed about three, usually, he said. I suppose I sleep for about four hours. And live on whiskey, and eat like a Strasbourg goose, and are prepared to run a race tomorrow? Go away, or at least I will. Perhaps you'll break down, though. That would satisfy me. But even if you don't, it still remains quite interesting. Merrick found it more than quite interesting, in fact. When he got home that night, he searched in his shelves for a certain dusky volume, in which he turned to a chapter called Shock. The book was a treaty on obscure diseases and abnormal conditions of the nervous system. He had often read it before for in his profession he was a special student of the rare and curious, and the following paragraph, which had interested him much before, interested him more than ever this evening. The nervous system also can act in a way that must always, even to the most advanced student, be totally unexpected. Cases are known, and well authenticated ones, when a paralytic person has jumped out of bed on the cry of fire. Cases too are known when a great shock which produces depression so profound as to amount to lethargy, is followed by abnormal activity and the calling into use of powers which were previously unknown to exist, or at any rate, existed in quite ordinary degree. Such a hypersensitive state, especially since the desire for sleep or rest is very often much diminished, demands much stimulant in the way of food and alcohol. It would appear also that the patient suffering from this rare form of the after-consequences of shock has sooner or later some sudden and complete breakdown. It is impossible, however, to conjecture what form this will take. The digestion, however, may become suddenly atrophied. Delirium tremens may, without warning, supervene, or he may go completely off his head. But the weeks passed on. The July suns made London reel in a haze of heat, and yet Allingham remained busy, brilliant and altogether exceptional. Merrick, unknown to him, was watching him closely, and at present was completely puzzled. He held Dick to his word that if he could detect the slightest sign of overindulgence in stimulants, he would cut it off altogether. 
but he could see absolutely none. Lady Maddingley, meantime, had given him several sittings, and in this connection again Merrick was utterly mistaken in the view he had expressed to Dick as to the risks he ran. For strangely enough, the two had become great friends. Yet Dick was quite right. All emotion with regard to her on his part was dead. It might have been a piece of still life that he was painting, instead of a woman he had wildly worshipped. One morning in mid-July she had been sitting to him in his studio, and contrary to custom, he had been rather silent, biting the ends of his bushes, frowning at his canvas, frowning too at her. Suddenly he gave a little impatient exclamation. It's so like you, he said, but it just isn't you. There's a lot of difference. I can't help making you look as if you were listening to a hymn, one of those in four sharps, don't you know, written by an organist, probably after eating muffins, and that's not characteristic of you. She laughed. You must be rather ingenious to put all that in, she said. I am. Where do I show it all? Dick sighed. Oh, in your eyes, of course, he said. You show everything by your eyes, you know. It is entirely characteristic of you. You are a throwback. Don't you remember? We settled that ever so long ago, to the brute creation, who likewise show everything by their eyes. Oh, I should have thought that dogs growled at you and cats scratched. Those are practical measures, but short of that, you and animals use their eyes only, whereas people use their mouths and foreheads and other things. A pleased dog, an expectant dog, a hungry dog, a jealous dog, a disappointed dog. One gathers all that from a dog's eyes. Their mouths are comparatively immobile, and a cat's is even more so. You have often told me that I belong to genus cat, said Lady Maddingley, with complete composure. By Jove, yes, he said. Perhaps looking at the eyes of a cat would help me to see what I miss. Many thanks for the hint. He put down his palette and went to the side table on which stood bottles and ice and siphons. No drink of any kind in this Sahara of morning, he asked. No, thanks. Now, when will you give me the final sitting? You said you only wanted one more. Dick helped himself. Will I go down to the country with this, he said, to put in the background I told you of. With luck, it will take me three days hard painting. Without luck, a week or more. Oh, my mouth waters at the thought of the background. So shall we say tomorrow week? Lady Maddingley made a note of this in a minute gold and jewelled memorandum book. And am I to be prepared to see the cat's eyes painted there instead of my own when I see it next? She asked, passing by the canvas. Dick laughed. Oh, you will hardly notice the difference, he said. How odd it is that I always have detested cats so. They make me feel actually faint, although you always remind me of a cat. You must ask your friend, Mr Merrick, about these metaphysical mysteries, she said. The background of the picture was at present only indicated by a few vague splashes close to the side of the head of the brilliant purple and brilliant green. The artist's mouth might well water at the thoughts of the few days painting that lay before him, for behind the figure in the long panel-shaped canvas was to be painted a green trellis, over which, almost hiding the woodwork, there was to sprawl a great purple clematis in full flaunting glory of varnished leaf and starry flower. At the top would be just a strip of pale summer sky, at her feet just a strip of grey-green grass, but all the rest of the background, greatly daring, would be this diaper of green and purple. For the purpose of putting this in, he was going down to a small cottage of his near Godalming, where he had built, in the garden, a sort of outdoor studio, an erection betwixt a room and a mere shelter, with a side to the north entirely open, and flanked by this green trellis, which was now one immense constellation of purple stars. Framed in this, he well knew how the strange pale beauty of his sitter would glow on the canvas, how she would start out of the background, she in her huge grey hat and shining grey dress, and yellow hair and ivory white skin, and pale eyes, now blue, now grey, now green. This was indeed a thing to look forward to, for there is probably no such unadulterated rapture known to men as creation. And it was small wonder that Dick's mood, as he travelled down to Godalming, was buoyant and effervescent, for he was going, so to speak, to realise his creation. Every purple star of clematis, every green leaf and piece of trellis work that he put in, would cause 
was he had painted to live and shine, just as it is the layers of dusk that fall over the sky at evening, which make the stars to sparkle there, jewel-like. His scheme was assured he had hung his constellation, the figure of Lady Maddingley, in the sky, and now he had to surround it with a green and purple night, so that it might shine. His garden was but a circumscribed plot, but walls of old brick circumscribed it. He had dealt with the space, at his command, with a certain originality. At no time had his grass plot, you could scarcely call it a lawn, been spacious. Now the outdoor studio, 25 feet by 30, took up the greater part of it. He had a solid wooden wall on one side, and two trellis walls to the south and east, which creepers were beginning to clothe, and which were faced internally by hangings of Syrian and Oriental work. Here in the summer he passed the greater part of the day, painting or idling, and living an outdoor existence. The floor, which had once been grass, which had withered completely under the roof, was covered with Persian rugs. A writing table and a dining table was there, a bookcase full of familiar friends and a half dozen of basket chairs. One corner, too, was frankly given up to the affairs of the garden, and a mowing machine, a hose for watering, shears and a spade stood there. For like many excitable persons, Dick found that in gardening, that incessant process of planting and designings, to suit the likings of plants and make them gorgeous in colour and high in growth, there was a wonderful calm haven of refuge for the brain that had been tossing on emotional seas. Plants too were receptive, so responsive to kindness. Thought given to them was never thought wasted, and to come back now after a month's absence in London was to be assured of fresh surprise and pleasure in every foot of garden bed. And here, with how regal a generosity was the purple clematis to repay him for the care lavished on it. Every flower would show its practical gratitude by standing model for the background of his picture. The evening was very warm, warm not with any sultry premonition of thunder, but with the clear, clean heat of summer, and he dined alone in his shelter, with the afterflames of the sunset for his lamp. These slowly faded into a sky of velvet blue, but he lingered long over his coffee, looking northwards across the garden towards the row of trees that screened him from the house beyond. These were acacias, most graceful and feminine of all green things that grow, some are plumaged now, yet still fresh of leaf. Below them ran a little raised terrace of turf, and nearer the beds of the beloved garden. Clumps of sweet peas made an inimitable fragrance, and the rose beds were pink, with Baroness Rothschild and La France, and copper-coloured with Bute in Constant, and the Richardson Rose. Then nearer at hand was the green trellis, foaming with purple. He was sitting there, hardly looking, but unconsciously drinking, in this great festival of colour, when his eyes were arrested by a dark, slinking form that appeared among the roses, and suddenly turned two shining, luminous orbs on him. At this he started up, but his movement caused no perturbation in the animal, which continued with back arched for stroking and poker-like tail to advance towards him, purring. As it came closer, Dick felt that shuddering faintness, which often affected him in the presence of cats, come over him, and he stamped and clapped his hands. At this he turned tail quickly, a sort of dark shadow streaked the garden wall for a moment, and it vanished but its appearance had spoiled for him the sweet spell of the evening, and he went indoors. The next morning was pellucid summer, a faint north wind blew, and a sun worthy to illuminate the isles of Greece flooded the sky. Dick's dreamless and, for him, long sleep had banished from his mind that rather disquieting incident of the cat, and he set up his canvas facing the trellis work and purple clematis with a huge sense of imminent ecstasy. Also, the garden, which at present he had only seen in the magic of sunset, was gloriously rewarding and glowed with colour. And though life, this was present in his mind for the first time for months, in the shape of Lady Maddingley, had not been very proficious, yet a man, he argued to himself, must be a very poor hand at living, if, with a passion for plants and a passion for art, he cannot fashion a life that shall be full of content. So breakfast being finished and his model being ready and glowing with beauty, he quickly sketched in the broad lines of flowers and foliage and began to paint. 
purple and green, green and purple. Was there ever such a feast for the eye? Gourmet-like and greedy as well. He was utterly absorbed in it. He was right, too. As soon as he put on the first brush of colour, he knew he was right. It was just those divine and violent colours that would cause his figure to step out from the picture. It was just that pale strip of sky above which would focus her again. It was just that strip of grey-green grass below her feet that would prevent her, so it seemed, from actually leaving the canvas. And with swift, eager sweeps of the bush, which never paused and never hurried, he lost himself in his work. He stopped at length with a sense of breathlessness, feeling too as if he had been suddenly called back from some immense distance off. He must have been working some three hours, for his man was already laying the table for lunch, yet it seemed to him that the morning had gone by in one flash. The progress he had made was extraordinary, and he looked long at his picture. Then his eye wandered from the brightness of the canvas to the brightness of the garden beds. There, in front of the bed of sweet peas not two yards from him, stood a very large grey cat watching him. Now the presence of the cat was a thing that usually produced in Dick a feeling of deadly faintness, yet at this moment he looked at the cat and the cat at him. He was conscious of no such feeling, and put down the absence of it, in so far as he consciously thought about it, to the fact that he was in the open air, not in the atmosphere of a closed room. Yet, last night out there, the cat had made him feel faint, but he hardly gave a thought to this, for what filled his mind was that he saw in the rather friendly, interested look of the beast that expression in the eye which had so baffled him in his portrait of Lady Maddingley. So slowly and without any sudden movement that might startle the cat, he reached out his hand for the palette he had just put down, and in a corner of the canvas not yet painted over, recorded in half a dozen swift, intuitive touches what he wanted. Even in the broad sunlight where the animal stood, its eyes looked as if they were internally smouldering, as well as being lit from without. It was just so that Lady Maddingley looked. He would have to lay colour very thinly over white. For five minutes or so, he painted them with quiet, eager strokes, drawing the colour thinly over the background of white and then looking long at the sketch of the eye to see if he had got what he wanted. Then he looked back at the cat, which had stood so charmingly for him. But there was no cat there. That, however, since he detested them, and this one had served his purpose, was no matter for regret, and he merely wondered a little at the suddenness of its disappearance. But the legacy it had left on the canvas could not vanish thus. It was his own a possession, an achievement. Truly this was to be a portrait that would altogether outdistance all he had ever done before. A woman, real, alive, wearing a soul in her eyes, should stand there and summer riot around her. An extraordinary clearness of vision was his all day, and towards sunset an empty whisky bottle. But this evening he was conscious for the first time of two feelings, one physical, one mental, altogether strange to him. The first an impression that he had drunk as much as was good for him, the second a sort of echo in his mind of those tortures he had undergone in the autumn when he had been tossed aside by the girl to whom he had given his soul like a soiled glove. Neither were at all acutely felt, but both were present to him. The evening altogether belied the brilliance of the day, and about six o'clock thick clouds had driven up over the sky and the clear heat of summer had given place to a heat no less intense, but full of the menace of storm. A few big hot drops, too, of rain warned him further, and he pulled his easel into shelter and gave orders that he would dine indoors. As was usual with him when he was at work, he shunned the distracting influence of any companionship, and he dined alone. Dinner finished, he went into his sitting room, prepared to enjoy his solitary evening. His servant had brought him in the tray, until he went to bed, he would be undisturbed. Outside, the storm was moving nearer, and the reverberation of the thunder, though not yet close, kept up a continual growl. Any moment it might move up and burst above in riot of fire and sound. Dick read a book for a while, but his thoughts wandered. The poignancy of his trouble last autumn, which he thought had passed away from him forever, grew suddenly and strangely more acute, also his head was heavy, perhaps with a storm, but possibly with what he had drunk. So intending to go to bed and sleep off his disquietude, he closed his book 
and went across to the window to close that also. But halfway towards it, he stopped. There on the sofa, below it, sat a large grey cat with yellow gleaming eyes. In its mouth, it held a young thrush, still alive. Then horror woke in him. His feeling of sick faintness was there, and he loathed and was terrified by this dreadful feline glee in the torture of its prey. A glee so great that it preferred the postponement of its meal to a shortening of the other. More than all, the resemblance of the eyes of this cat to those of his portrait suddenly struck him as something hellish. For one moment, this all held him bound, as if with paralysis. The next, his physical shuddering could be withstood no longer, and he threw the glass he carried at the cat, missing it. For one second, the animal paused there, glaring at him with an intense and dreadful hostility. Then it made one spring of it out of the open window. Dick shut it with a bang that startled himself, and then searched on the sofa and the floor for the bird, which he thought the cat had dropped. Once or twice he thought he heard it feebly fluttering, but this must have been an illusion, for he could not find it. All this was rather shaky business, so before going to bed he steadied himself as his unspoken phrase ran with a final drink. Outside the thunder had ceased, but the rain beat hissing onto the grass. Then another sound mingled with it, the mewing of a cat. Not the long-drawn screeches and cries that are usual, but the plaintive calls of the beast that wants to be admitted into its own home. The blind was down, but after a while he could not resist peeping out. There on the windowsill was seated the large grey cat. Though it was raining heavily, its fur seemed dry, for it was standing stiffly away from its body. But when it saw him, it spat at him, scratching angrily at the glass, and then vanished. Lady Maddingly. Heavens, how he had loved her, and infernally as she had treated him, how passionately he wanted her now. Was all this trouble then to begin over again? Had that nightmare dawned anew on him? It was the cat's fault. The eyes of the cat had done it. Yet just now all this desire was blurred by this dullness of brain that was as unaccountable as the reawakening of his desire. For months now, he had drunk far more than he had drunk today. Yet evening had seen him clear-headed, acute, master of himself, and revelling in the liberty that had come to him, and in the cool joy of creative vision. But tonight he stumbled and groped across the room. The neutral coloured light of dawn awoke him, and he got up at once, feeling still very drowsy, but in answer to some silent, imperative call. The storm had altogether passed away, and a jewel of a morning star hung in a pale heaven. His room looked strangely unfamiliar to him. His own sensations were unfamiliar. There was a vagueness about things, a barrier between him and the world. One desire alone possessed him, to finish the portrait. All else, so he felt, he left to chance, or whatever laws regulate the world, those laws which choose that a certain thrush shall be caught by a certain cat and choose one scapegoat out of a thousand, and let the rest go free. Two hours later his servant called him, and found him gone from his room. So as the morning was so fair, he went out to lay breakfast in the shelter. The portrait was there. It had been dragged back into position by the clematis, but it was covered with strange scratches as if the claws of some enraged animal or the nails perhaps of a man had furiously attacked it. Dick Allingham was there too, lying very still in front of the disfigured canvas. Claws, also, or nails, had attacked him. His throat was horribly mangled by them, but his hands were covered with paint. The nails of his fingers, too, were choked with it. End of section 9《The Room and the Tower and Other Stories》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Doug Daly《The Room and the Tower and Other Stories》by E. F. Benson, The Bus Conductor
My friend Hugh Granger and I had just returned from a two days visit in the country, where we had been staying in a house of sinister repute which was supposed to be haunted by ghosts of a peculiarly fearsome and truculent sort. The house itself was all that such a house should be, jackal bean and oak paneled, with long dark passages and high vaulted rooms. It stood also very remote, and was encompassed by a wood of somber pines that muttered and whispered in the dark. And all the time that we were there, a southwesterly gale with torrents of scolding rain had prevailed, so that by day and night weird voices moaned and fluted in the chimneys. A company of uneasy spirits held colloquy among the trees, and sudden tattoos and tappings beckoned from the window panes. But in spite of these surroundings, which were sufficient in themselves, one would almost say, to spontaneously generate occult phenomena, nothing of any description had occurred. I am bound to add, also, that my own state of mind was peculiarly well adapted to receive or even invent the sights and sounds we had gone to seek, for I was, I confess, during the whole time that we were there, in a state of abject apprehension, and lay awake both nights through hours of terrified unrest, afraid of the dark, yet more afraid of what a lighted candle might show me. Hugh Granger, on the evening after our return to town, had dined with me, and after dinner our conversation, as was natural, soon came back to these entrancing topics. But why you go ghost-seeking I cannot imagine, he said, because your teeth were chattering and your eyes starting out of your head all the time you were there, from sheer fright. Or do you like being frightened? Hugh, though generally intelligent, is dense in certain ways. This is one of them. Why, of course I like being frightened, I said. I want to be made to creep and creep and creep. Fear is the most absorbing and luxurious of emotions. One forgets all else if one is afraid. Well, the fact that neither of us saw anything, he said, confirms what I have always believed. And what have you always believed? That these phenomena are purely objective, not subjective, and that one state of mind has nothing to do with the perception that perceives them nor have circumstances or surroundings anything to do with them either. Look at Osburton. It has had the reputation of being a haunted house for years, and it certainly has all the accessories of one. Look at yourself, too. With all your nerves on edge, afraid to look around or light a candle for fear of seeing something, surely there was the right man in the right place then, if ghosts are subjective. He got up and lit a cigarette, and looking at him, he was about six feet high and as broad as he is long. I felt a retort on my lips, for I could not help my mind going back to a certain period in his life when, for some cause which, as far as I knew, he had never told anybody, he had become a mere quivering mass of disordered nerves. Oddly enough, at the same moment and for the first time, he began to speak of it himself. You may reply that it was not worth my while to go either, he said because I was so clearly the wrong man in the wrong place. But I wasn't. You, for all your apprehensions and expectancy, have never seen a ghost. But I have, though I am the last person in the world you would have thought likely to do so. And, though my nerves are steady again now, it knocked me all to bits. He sat down again in his chair. No doubt you remember my going to bits, he said. And since I believe that I am sound again now, I should rather like to tell you about it. But before, I couldn't. I couldn't speak of it at all to anybody. Yet there ought to have been nothing frightening about it. What I saw was certainly a most useful and friendly ghost, but it came from the shaded side of things. It looked suddenly out of the night and the mystery with which life is surrounded. I want first to tell you quite shortly my theory about ghost seeing, he continued, and I can explain it best by a simile, an image. Imagine then that you and I and everybody in the world are like people whose eye is directly opposite a little tiny hole in a sheet of cardboard which is continually shifting and revolving and moving about. Back to back with that sheet of cardboard is another, which also, by laws of its own, is in perpetual but independent motion. In it, too, there is another hole, and when, fortuitously it would seem, these two holes, the one through which we are always looking, and the other in the spiritual plane come opposite one another, we see through, and then only do the sights and sounds of the spiritual world become visible or audible to us. 
With most people, these holes never come opposite each other during their life. But at the hour of death, they do. And then they remain stationary. That, I fancy, is how we pass over. Now, in some natures, these holes are comparatively large and are constantly coming into opposition. Clairvoyance, mediums are like that. But as far as I knew, I had no clairvoyant or mediumistic powers at all. I, therefore, am the sort of person who long ago made up his mind that he would never see a ghost. It was, so to speak, an incalculable chance that my minute spy hole should come into opposition with the other. But it did, and it knocked me out of time. I had heard some such theory before, and though Hugh put it rather picturesquely, there was nothing in the least convincing or practical about it. It might be so, or again it might not. I hope your ghost was more original than your theory, said I, in order to bring him to the point. Yes, I think it was. You shall judge. I put on more coal and poked up the fire. Hugh has got, so I have always considered, a great talent for telling stories and that sense of drama which is so necessary for the narrator. Indeed, before now, I have suggested to him that he should take up this as a profession, sit by the fountain in Piccadilly Circus when times are, as usual, bad, and tell stories to passerbys in the street, Arabian fashion, for reward. The most part of mankind, I am aware, do not like long stories, but to the few among whom I number myself, who really like to listen to lengthy accounts of experiences, Hugh is an ideal narrator. I do not care for his theories or for his similes, but when it comes to facts, to things that happened, I like him to be lengthy. Go on, please, and slowly, I said. Brevity may be the soul of wit, but it is the ruin of storytelling. I want to hear when and where and how it all was, and what you had for lunch, and where you had dined, and what Hugh began. It was the 24th of June, just 18 months ago, he said. I had let my flat, you remember, and came up from the country to stay with you for a week. We had dined alone here. I could not help interrupting. Did you see the ghost here? I asked. In this square little box of a house in a modern street? I was in the house when I saw it. I hugged myself in silence. We had dined alone here in Graham Street, he said. And after dinner, I went out to some party, and you stopped at home. At dinner, your man did not wait, and when I asked where he was, you told me he was ill, and, I thought, changed the subject rather abruptly. You gave me your latch key when I went out, and on coming back, I found you had gone to bed. There were, however, several letters for me which required answers. I wrote them there and then, and posted them at the pillar box opposite, so I suppose it was rather late when I went upstairs. You had put me in the front room, on the third floor, overlooking the street, a room which I thought you generally occupied yourself. It was a very hot night, and though there had been a moon when I started to my party, on my return the whole sky was cloud-covered, and it both looked and felt as if we might have a thunderstorm before morning. I was feeling very sleepy and heavy. It was not till after I got into bed that I noticed by the shadows of the window frames on the blind that only one of the windows was open. But it did not seem worthwhile to get out of bed in order to open it, though I felt rather airless and uncomfortable, and I went to sleep. What time it was when I awoke, I do not know. But it was certainly not yet dawn, and I never remember being conscious of such an extraordinary stillness as prevailed. There was no sound, either of foot passengers or wheeled traffic. The music of life appeared to be absolutely mute. But now, instead of being sleepy and heavy, I felt though I must have slept an hour or two at the most, since it was not yet dawn, perfectly fresh and wide awake, and the effort which had seemed not worth making before, that of getting out of bed and opening the other window, was quite easy now, and I pulled up the blind, threw it wide open and leaned out, for somehow I parched and pined for air. Even outside the oppression was very noticeable. And though, as you know, I'm not easily given to feel the mental effects of climate, I was aware of an awful creepiness coming over me. I tried to analyze it away, but without success. The past day had been pleasant. I looked forward to another pleasant day tomorrow, and yet I was full of some nameless apprehension. I felt, too, dreadfully lonely in this stillness before the dawn. Then I heard suddenly and not very far away the sound of some approaching vehicle. I could distinguish the tread of two horses walking at a slow foot's pace. 
They were, though yet invisible, coming up the street, and yet this indication of life did not abate that dreadful sense of loneliness which I have spoken of. Also, in some dim, unformulated way, that which was coming seemed to me to have something to do with the cause of my oppression. Then the vehicle came into sight. At first I could not distinguish what it was. Then I saw that the horses were black and had long tails, and that what they dragged was made of glass, but had a black frame. It was a hearse. Empty. It was moving up this side of the street. It stopped at your door. Then the obvious solution struck me. You had said at dinner that your man was ill, and you were, I thought, unwilling to speak more about his illness. No doubt, so I imagine now, he was dead. And for some reason, perhaps because you did not want me to know anything about it, you were having the body removed at night. This, I must tell you, passed through my mind quite instantaneously, and it did not occur to me how unlikely it really was before the next thing happened. I was still leaning out the window, and I remember also wondering, yet only momentarily, how odd it was that I saw things, or rather the one thing I was looking at, so very distinctly. Of course, there was a moon behind the clouds, but it was curious how every detail of the hearse and the horse were visible. There was only one man, the driver with it, and the street was obviously absolutely empty. It was at him I was looking now. I could see every detail of his clothes, but from where I was, so high above him, I could not see his face. He had on gray trousers, brown boots, and a black coat buttoned all the way up, and a straw hat. Over his shoulder there was a strap, which seemed to support some sort of little bag. He looked exactly like, well, from my description, what did he look exactly like? Why, a bus conductor, I said instantly. So I thought, and even while I was thinking this, he looked up at me. He had a rather long, thin face, and on his left cheek there was a mole with a growth of dark hair on it. All this was as distinct as if it had been noonday, and as if I was within a yard of him. But, so instantaneous was all that takes so long in the telling, I had not time to think it strange that the driver of the hearse should be so unfunerally dressed. Then he touched his hat to me and jerked his thumb over his shoulder. Just room for one inside, sir, he said. There was something so odious, so coarse, so unfeeling about this that I instantly drew my head in, pulled the blind down again, and then, for what reason I do not know, turned on the electric light in order to see what time it was. The hands of my watch pointed to half past eleven. It was then for the first time, I think, that a doubt crossed my mind as to the nature of what I had just seen. But I put out the light again, got into bed, and began to think. We had dined, I had gone to a party, I had come back and written letters, had gone to bed and had slept. So how could it be half past eleven? Or what half past eleven was it? Then another easy solution struck me. My watch must have stopped, but it had not. I could hear it ticking. There was stillness and silence again. I expected every moment to hear muffled footsteps on the stairs, footsteps moving slowly and smallly under the weight of a heavy burden. But from inside the house, there was no sound whatever. Outside, too, there was the same dead silence while the hearse waited at the door. And the minutes ticked on and ticked on. And at length, I began to see a difference in the light of the room and I knew that the dawn was beginning to break outside. But how had it happened then that if the corpse was to be removed at night, it had not gone, and that the hearse still waited when morning was already coming? Presently I got out of bed again, and with the sense of a strong physical shrinking, I went to the window and pulled back the blind. The dawn was coming fast. The whole street was lit by that silver hueless light of morning, but there was no hearse there. Once again I looked at my watch. It was just a quarter past four, but I would swear not half an hour had passed since it had told me it was half past eleven. Then a curious double sense, as if I were living in the present and at the same moment had been living in some other time, came over me. It was dawn on June 25th, and the street, as natural, was empty. But a little while ago, the driver of a hearse had spoken to me, and it was half past eleven. What was that driver? To what plane did he belong? And again, what half past eleven was it that I had seen recorded on the dial of my watch? And then I told myself that the whole thing had been a dream. But if you ask me whether I believe what I told myself, 
I must confess that I did not. Your man did not appear at breakfast next morning, nor did I see him again before I left that afternoon. I think if I had, I should have told you about all this, but it was still possible, you see, that what I had seen was a real hearse, driven by a real driver, for all the ghastly gaiety of the face that had looked up to mine and the levity of his pointing hand. I might possibly have fallen asleep soon after seeing him and slumbered through the removal of the body and the departure of the hearse, so I did not speak of it to you. There was something wonderfully straightforward and prosaic in all this. Here were no Jacobean houses, oak panel, and surrounded by weeping pine trees. And somehow, the very absence of suitable surroundings made the story more impressive. But for a moment, a doubt assailed me. Don't tell me it was all a dream, I said. I don't know whether it was or not. I can only say that I believe myself to have been wide awake. In any case, the rest of the story is odd. I went out of town again that afternoon, he continued. And I may say that I don't think that even for a moment did I get the haunting sense of what I had seen or dreamed that night out of my mind. It was present to me always as some vision unfulfilled. It was as if some clock had struck the four quarters, and I was still waiting to hear what the hour would be. Exactly a month afterwards I was in London again, but only for the day. I arrived at Victoria about eleven and took the underground to Sloan Square in order to see if you were in town and would give me lunch. It was a baking hot morning, and I intended to take the bus from King's Road as far as Graham Street. There was one standing at the corner just as I came out of the station, but I saw that the top was full, and the inside appeared to be full also. Just as I came up to it, the conductor, who, I suppose, had been inside collecting fares or what not, came out onto the step within a few feet of me. He wore gray trousers, brown boots, a black coat buttoned, a straw hat, and over his shoulder was a strap on which hung his little machine for punching tickets. I saw his face, too. It was the face of the driver of the hearse, with a mole on the left cheek. Then he spoke to me, jerking his thumb over his shoulder. Just room for one inside, sir, he said. At that, a sort of panic terror took possession of me and I knew I gesticulated wildly with my arms and cried, No, no. But at that moment I was living not in the hour that was then passing, but in that hour which had passed a month ago, when I leaned from the window of your bedroom here, just before the dawn broke. At this moment, too, I knew that my spy hole had been opposite the spy hole in the spiritual world. What I had seen there had some significance, now being fulfilled, beyond the significance of the trivial happenings of today and tomorrow. The powers of which we know so little were visibly working before me, and I stood there on the pavement, shaking and trembling. I was opposite the post office at the corner, and just as the bus started, my eye fell on the clock in the window there. I need not tell you what the time was. Perhaps I need not tell you the rest, for you probably conjecture it since you will have not forgotten what happened at the corner of Sloan Square at the end of July, the summer before last. The bus pulled out from the pavement into the street in order to get around a van that was standing in front of it. At the moment there came down King's Road a big motor going at a hideously dangerous pace. It crashed full into the bus, burrowing into it as a gimlet burrows into a board. He paused. And that's my story, he said. End of the Bus Conductor Recording by Doug Daly Story 11 of The Room in the Tower and Other Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Rafe Ball the Room in the Tower and Other Stories by E. F. Benson The Man Who Went Too Far The little village of St. Faith's nestles in a hollow of wooded hill up on the north bank of the River Fawn in the county of Hampshire, huddling close round its grey Norman church as if for spiritual protection against the fays and fairies, the trolls and little people who might be supposed still to linger in the vast empty spaces of the new forest 
and to come after dusk and do their doubtful businesses. Once outside the hamlet, you may walk in any direction, so long as you avoid the high road which leads to Brockenhurst, for the length of a summer afternoon, without seeing sign of human habitation, or possibly even catching sight of another human being. Shaggy wild ponies may stop their feeding for a moment as you pass. The white scuts of rabbits will vanish into their burrows, a brown viper, perhaps, will glide from your path into a clump of heather, and unseen birds will chuckle in the bushes, but it may easily happen that for a long day you will see nothing human. But you will not feel in the least lonely. In summer, at any rate, the sunlight will be gay with butterflies, and the air thick with all those woodland sounds which, like instruments in an orchestra, combine to play the great symphony of the yearly festival of June. Winds whisper in the birches and sigh among the firs. Bees are busy with their redolent labour among the heather. A myriad birds chirp in the green temples of the forest trees and the voice of the river, prattling over stony places, bubbling into pools, chuckling and gulping round corners, gives you the sense that many presences and companions are near at hand. Yet, oddly enough, Though one would have thought that these benign and cheerful influences of wholesome air and spaciousness of forest were very healthful comrades for a man, in so far as nature can really influence this wonderful human genus which has in these centuries learned to defy her most violent storms in its well-established houses, to bridle her torrents and make them light its streets, to tunnel her mountains and plough her seas, the inhabitants of St. Faith's will not willingly venture into the forest after dark. For in spite of the silence and loneliness of the hooded night, it seems that a man is not sure in what company he may suddenly find himself, and though it is difficult to get from these villagers any very clear story of occult appearances, the feeling is widespread. One story indeed I have heard with some definiteness, the tale of a monstrous goat that has been seen to skip with hellish glee about the woods and shady places. And this, perhaps, is connected with the story which I have here attempted to piece together. It, too, is well known to them, for all remember the young artist who died here not long ago, a young man, or so he struck the beholder, of great personal beauty, with something about him that made men's faces to smile and brighten when they looked on him. His ghost, they will tell you, walks constantly by the stream, and through the woods which he loved so, and in especial it haunts a certain house, the last of the village, where he lived, and its garden in which he was done to death. For my part, I am inclined to think that the terror of the forest dates chiefly from that day. So, such as the story is, I have set it forth in connected form. It is based partly on the accounts of the villagers, but mainly on that of Darcy, a friend of mine, and a friend of the man with whom these events were chiefly concerned. The day had been one of untarnished midsummer splendour, and as the sun grew near to its setting, the glory of the evening grew every moment more crystalline, more miraculous. Westward from St. Faith's, the beech wood, which stretched for some miles toward the heathery upland beyond, already cast its veil of clear shadow over the red roofs of the village, but the spire of the grey church, overtopping all, still pointed a flaming orange finger into the sky. The river Fawn, which runs below, lay in sheets of sky-reflected blue, and wound its dreamy, devious course round the edge of this wood, where a rough, two-planked bridge crossed from the bottom of the garden of the last house in the village, and communicated by means of a little wicker gate with the wood itself. Then, once out of the shadow of the wood, the stream lay in flaming pools of the molten crimson of the sunset, and lost itself in the haze of woodland distances. This house, at the end of the village, stood outside the shadow, and the lawn which sloped down to the river was still flecked with sunlight. Garden beds of dazzling colour lined its gravel walks, and down the middle of it ran a brick pergola, half hidden in clusters of rambler rose and purple with starry clematis. At the bottom end of it, between two of its pillars, was slung a hammock containing a shirt-sleeved figure. 
the house itself lay somewhat remote from the rest of the village, and a footpath leading across two fields, now tall and fragrant with hay, was its only communication with the high road. It was low-built, only two stories in height, and like the garden its walls were a mass of flowering roses. A narrow stone terrace ran along the garden front, over which was stretched an awning, and on the terrace a young, silent-footed man-servant was busied with the laying of the table for dinner. He was neat-handed and quick with his job, and having finished it he went back into the house and reappeared again with a large, rough bath-towel on his arm. With this he went to the hammock in the pergola. "'Nearly eight, sir,' he said. "'Has Mr. Darcy come yet?' asked a voice from the hammock. "'No, sir. If I'm not back when he comes, tell him that I'm just having a bathe before dinner.' The servant went back to the house, and after a moment or two Frank Halton struggled to a sitting posture and slipped out onto the grass. He was of medium height and rather slender in build, but the supple ease and grace of his movements gave the impression of great physical strength. Even his descent from the hammock was not an awkward performance. His face and hands were of very dark complexion, either from constant exposure to wind and sun, or, as his black hair and dark eyes tended to show, from some strain of southern blood. His head was small, his face of an exquisite beauty of modelling, while the smoothness of its contour would have led you to believe that he was a beardless lad still in his teens. But something, some look, which living and experience alone can give, seemed to contradict that, and finding yourself completely puzzled as to his age, you would next moment probably cease to think about that, and only look at this glorious specimen of young manhood with wondering satisfaction. He was dressed as became the season and the heat, and wore only a shirt open at the neck and a pair of flannel trousers. His head, covered very thickly with a somewhat rebellious crop of short curly hair, was bare as he strolled across the lawn to the bathing place that lay below. Then, for a moment, there was silence. Then the sound of splashed and divided waters, and presently after, a great shout of ecstatic joy as he swam upstream with the foamed water standing in a frill round his neck. Then, after some five minutes of limb-stretching struggle with the flood, he turned over on his back, and with arms thrown wide, floated downstream, ripple-cradled and inert. His eyes were shut, and between half-parted lips he talked gently to himself. "'I am one with it,' he said to himself. "'The river and I, I and the river. The coolness and splash of it is I, and the water-herbs that wave in it are I also.' and my strength and my limbs are not mine, but the river's. It is all one, all one, dear fawn. A quarter of an hour later he appeared again at the bottom of the lawn, dressed as before, his wet hair already drying into its crisp short curls again. There he paused a moment, looking back at the stream with the smile with which men look on the face of a friend, then turned towards the house. Simultaneously, his servant came to the door leading on to the terrace, followed by a man who appeared to be some halfway through the fourth decade of his years. Frank and he saw each other across the bushes and garden beds, and each quickening his step, they met suddenly face to face round an angle of the garden walk in the fragrance of Syringa. "'My dear Darcy,' cried Frank, "'I am charmed to see you.' But the other stared at him in amazement. "'Frank!' he exclaimed. "'Yes, that is my name,' he said, laughing. "'What is the matter?' Darcy took his hand. "'What have you done to yourself?' he asked. "'You are a boy again!' "'Ah, I have a lot to tell you,' said Frank. "'Lots that you will hardly believe, but I shall convince you—' He broke off suddenly and held up his hand. "'Hush!' "'There is my nightingale,' he said. The smile of recognition and welcome with which he had greeted his friend faded from his face, and a look of rapt wonder took its place, as of a lover listening to the voice of his beloved. 
His mouth parted slightly, showing the white line of teeth, and his eyes looked out and out till they seemed to Darcy to be focused on things beyond the vision of man. Then something perhaps startled the bird, for the song ceased. Yes, lots to tell you, he said. Really, I am delighted to see you. But you look rather white and pulled down. No wonder after that fever. And there is to be no nonsense about this visit. It is June now. You stop here till you are fit to begin work again. Two months, at least. Ah, I can't trespass quite to that extent. Frank took his arm and walked him down the grass. Trespass? Who talks of trespass? I shall tell you quite openly when I am tired of you. But you know, when we had the studio together, we used not to bore each other. However, it is ill talking of going away on the moment of your arrival. Just a stroll to the river, and then it will be dinner time. Darcy took out his cigarette case and offered it to the other. Frank laughed. <laughs> no, not for me. Dear me, I suppose I used to smoke once. How very odd. Given it up? I don't know. I suppose I must have. Anyhow, I don't do it now. I would as soon think of eating meat. Another victim on the smoking altar of vegetarianism? Victim? asked Frank. Do I strike you as such? He paused on the margin of the stream and whistled softly. Next moment, a moorhen made its splashing flight across the river and ran up the bank. Frank took it very gently in his hands and stroked its head as the creature lay against his shirt. And is the house among the reeds still secure? He half crooned to it. And is the missus quite well? And are the neighbours flourishing? There, dear, home with you and he flung it into the air. That bird's very tame, said Darcy, slightly bewildered. It is rather, said Frank, following its flight. During dinner, Frank chiefly occupied himself in bringing himself up to date in the movements and achievements of this old friend whom he had not seen for six years. Though six years, it now appeared, had been full of incident and success for Darcy, he had made a name for himself as a portrait painter, which bade fair to outlast the vogue of a couple of seasons, and his leisure time had been brief. Then, some four months previously, he had been through a severe attack of typhoid, the result of which, as concerns this story, was that he had come down to this sequestered place to recruit. "'Yes, you've got on,' said Frank at the end. "'I always knew you would. A.R.A. A. with more in prospect. Money?' You roll in it, I suppose. And, oh, Darcy, how much happiness have you had all these years? That is the only imperishable possession. And how much have you learned? Oh, I don't mean in art. Even I could have done well in that. Darcy laughed. Done well? My dear fellow, all I have learned in these six years you knew, so to speak, in your cradle. Your old pictures fetch huge prices. Do you never paint now? Frank shook his head. No, I'm too busy, he said. Doing what? Please tell me. That is what everyone is forever asking me. Doing? I suppose you would say I do nothing. Darcy glanced up at the brilliant young face opposite him. It seems to suit you, that way of being busy, he said. Now, it's your turn. Do you read? Do you study? I remember you saying that it would do us all, all us artists, I mean, a great deal of good if we would study any one human face carefully for a year without recording a line. Have you been doing that? Frank shook his head again. I mean exactly what I say, he said. I have been doing nothing, and I've never been so occupied. Look at me. Have I not done something to myself to begin with? You're two years younger than I, said Darcy. At least you used to be. You therefore are thirty-five. But had I never seen you before, I should say you were just twenty. But was it worth while to spend six years of greatly occupied life in order to look twenty? Seems rather like a woman of fashion. Frank laughed boisterously. 
First time I have ever been compared to that particular bird of prey, he said. No, that has not been my occupation. In fact, I am only very rarely conscious that one effect of my occupation has been that. Of course, it must have been, if one comes to think of it. It is not very important. Quite true, my body has become young, but that is very little. I have become young. Darcy pushed back his chair and sat sideways to the table, looking at the other. Has that been your occupation, then? he asked. Yes. That, anyhow, is one aspect of it. Think what youth means. It is the capacity for growth, mind, body, spirit. All grow, all get stronger, all have a fuller, firmer life every day. That is something, considering that every day that passes after the ordinary man reaches the full-blown flower of his strength weakens his hold on life. A man reaches his prime and remains, we say, in his prime for ten years, or perhaps twenty. But after his primest prime is reached, he slowly, insensibly weakens. These are the signs of age in you, in your body, in your art probably, in your mind. You are less electric than you were. But I, when I reach my prime, I am nearing it. Ah, you shall see. The stars had begun to appear in the blue velvet of the sky, and to the east the horizon seen above the black silhouette of the village was growing dove-coloured with the approach of moonrise. White moths hovered dimly over the garden beds, and the footsteps of night tiptoed through the bushes. Suddenly Frank rose. Ah, it is the supreme moment, he said softly. Now more than at any other time the current of life the eternal, imperishable current runs so close to me that I am almost enveloped in it. Be silent a minute. He advanced to the edge of the terrace and looked out, standing stretched with arms outspread. Darcy heard him draw a long breath into his lungs and after many seconds expel it again. Six or eight times he did this, then turned back into the lamplight. It will sound to you quite mad, I expect, he said. But if you want to hear the soberest truth I have ever spoken and shall ever speak, I will tell you about myself. But come into the garden if it is not too damp for you. I have never told anyone yet, but I shall like to tell you. It is long, in fact, since I have even tried to classify what I have learned. They wandered into the fragrant dimness of the pergola and sat down. Then Frank began. Years ago, do you remember, he said, we used often to talk about the decay of joy in the world. Many impulses, we settled, had contributed to this decay, some of which were good in themselves, others that were quite completely bad. Among the good things, I put what we may call certain Christian virtues, renunciation, resignation, sympathy with suffering, and the desire to relieve sufferers. But out of those things spring very bad ones, useless renunciations, asceticism for its own sake, mortification of the flesh with nothing to follow, no corresponding gain, that is, and that awful and terrible disease which devastated England some centuries ago, and from which by heredity of spirit we suffer now, Puritanism. That was a dreadful plague. The brutes held and taught that joy and laughter and merriment were evil. It was a doctrine the most profane and wicked. Why, what is the commonest crime one sees? A sullen face. That is the truth of the matter. Now, all my life, I have believed that we are intended to be happy, that joy is of all gifts the most divine. And when I left London... Abandoned my career, such as it was, I did so because I intended to devote my life to the cultivation of joy, and, by continuous and unsparing effort, to be happy. Among people, and in constant intercourse with others, 
I did not find it possible. There were too many distractions in towns and workrooms, and also too much suffering. So I took one step backwards, or forwards, as you may choose to put it, and went straight to nature, to trees, birds, animals, to all those things which quite clearly pursue one aim only, which blindly follow the great native instinct to be happy, without any care at all for morality or human law or divine law. I wanted, you understand, to get all joy first-hand and unadulterated, and I think it scarcely exists among men. It is obsolete. Darcy turned in his chair. Ah, but what makes birds and animals happy? he asked. Food, food, and mating. Frank laughed gently in the stillness. Do not think I became a sensualist, he said. I did not make that mistake. For the sensualist carries his miseries pick back and round his feet is wound the shroud that shall soon enwrap him. I may be mad, it is true, but I am not so stupid anyhow as to have tried that. No. What is it that makes puppies play with their own tails, that sends cats on their prowling ecstatic errands at night? He paused a moment. So I went to nature, he said. I sat down here in this new forest, sat down fair and square, and looked. That was my first difficulty, to sit here quiet without being bored, to wait without being impatient, to be receptive and very alert, though for a long time nothing particular happened. The change, in fact, was slow in those early stages. Nothing happened? asked Darcy rather impatiently, with the sturdy revolt against any new idea which to the English mind is synonymous with nonsense. Why, what in the world should happen? Now, Frank, as he had known him, was the most generous but most quick-tempered of mortal men. In other words, his anger would flare to a prodigious beacon under almost no provocation, only to be quenched again under a gust of no less impulsive kindliness. Thus, the moment Darcy had spoken, an apology for his hasty question was halfway up his tongue. But there was no need for it to have travelled even so far, for Frank laughed again with kindly, genuine mirth. Oh, how I should have resented that a few years ago, he said. Thank goodness that resentment is one of the things I have got rid of. I certainly wish that you should believe my story. In fact, you are going to but that you at this moment should imply that you do not, does not concern me. Ah, your solitary sojournings have made you inhuman, said Darcy, still very English. No, human, said Frank. Rather more human, at least rather less of an ape. Well, that was my first quest, he continued after a moment. The deliberate and unswerving pursuit of joy and my method, the eager contemplation of nature. As far as motive went, I dare say it was purely selfish, but as far as effect goes, it seems to me about the best thing one can do for one's fellow creatures, for happiness is more infectious than smallpox. So, as I said, I sat down and waited. I looked at happy things, zealously avoided the sight of anything unhappy, and by degrees... A little trickle of the happiness of this blissful world began to filter into me. The trickle grew more abundant, and now, my dear fellow, if I could for a moment divert from me into you one half of the torrent of joy that pours through me day and night, you would throw the world, art, everything aside, and just live, exist. When a man's body dies... It passes into trees and flowers. Well, that is what I have been trying to do with my soul before death. The servant had brought into the pergola a table with siphons and spirits, and had set a lamp upon it. As Frank spoke, he leaned forward towards the other, and Darcy, for all his matter-of-fact common sense, could have sworn that his companion's face shone, was luminous in itself. His dark brown eyes glowed from within, 
and the unconscious smile of a child irradiated and transformed his face. Darcy felt suddenly excited, exhilarated. Go on, he said. Go on. I can feel you are somehow telling me a sober truth. I dare say you are mad, but I don't see that matters. Frank laughed again. Mad, he said. Yes, certainly, if you wish. But I prefer to call it sane. However, nothing matters less than what anybody chooses to call things. God never labels his gifts. He just puts them into our hands, just as he put animals in the Garden of Eden for Adam to name, if he felt disposed. So, by the continual observance and study of things that were happy, continued he, I got happiness, I got joy. But seeking it, as I did, from nature, I got much more which I did not seek, but stumbled upon originally by accident. It is difficult to explain, but I will try. About three years ago, I was sitting one morning in a place I will show you tomorrow. It is down by the river brink, very green, dappled with shade and sun, and the river passes there through some little clumps of reeds. Well, as I sat there, doing nothing, but just looking and listening, I heard the sound quite distinctly of some flute-like instrument playing a strange, unending melody. I thought at first it was some musical yokel on the highway and did not pay much attention. But before long, the strangeness and indescribable beauty of the tune struck me. It never repeated itself, but it never came to an end. Phrase after phrase ran its sweet course. It worked gradually and inevitably up to a climax, and having attained it, it went on. Another climax was reached, and another, and another. Then, with a sudden gasp of wonder, I localised where it came from. It came from the reeds, and from the sky, and from the trees. It was everywhere. It was the sound of life. It was, my dear Darcy, as the Greeks would have said, it was Pan, playing on his pipes, the voice of nature. It was the life melody, the world melody. Darcy was far too interested to interrupt, though there was a question he would have liked to ask, and Frank went on. Well, for the moment I was terrified, terrified with the impotent horror of nightmare, and I stopped my ears and just ran from the place and got back to the house, panting, trembling, literally in a panic. Unknowingly, for at that time I only pursued joy, I had begun, since I drew my joy from nature, to get in touch with nature. Nature, force, God, call it what you will, had drawn across my face a little gossamer web of essential life. I saw that when I emerged from my terror, and I went very humbly back to where I had heard the panpipes. But it was nearly six months before I heard them again. Why was that? asked Darcy. Surely because I had revolted, rebelled, and worst of all, been frightened. For I believe that, just as there is nothing in the world which so injures one's body as fear, so there is nothing that so much shuts up the soul. I was afraid, you see, of the one thing in the world which has real existence. No wonder its manifestation was withdrawn. And after six months? After six months, one blessed morning, I heard the piping again. I wasn't afraid that time. And since then, it has grown louder. It has become more constant. I now hear it often, and I can put myself into such an attitude towards nature that the pipes will almost certainly sound. And never yet have they played the same tune. It is always something new, something fuller, richer, more complete than before. What do you mean by such an attitude towards nature? asked Darcy. I can't explain that, but by translating it into a bodily attitude, it is this. 
Frank sat up for a moment, quite straight in his chair, then slowly sunk back with arms outspread and head drooped. That, he said, an effortless attitude, but open, resting, receptive. It is just that which you must do with your soul. Then he sat up again. One word more, he said, and I will bore you no further. Nor, unless you ask me questions, shall I talk about it again. You will find me, in fact, quite sane in my mode of life. Birds and beasts you will see behaving somewhat intimately to me, like that moorhen, but that is all. I will walk with you, ride with you, play golf with you, and talk with you on any subject you like. But I wanted you on the threshold to know what has happened to me. And one more thing will happen. He paused again, and a slight look of fear crossed his eyes. There will be a final revelation, he said, a complete and blinding stroke, which will throw open to me once and for all the full knowledge, the full realisation and comprehension that I am one, just as you are, with life. In reality, there is no me, no you, no it. Everything is part of the one and only thing, which is life. I know that that is so, but the realisation of it is not yet mine. But it will be. And on that day, so I take it, I shall see Pan. It may mean death, the death of my body, that is, but I don't care. It may mean immortal, eternal life lived here and now and for ever. Then, having gained that, ah, my dear Darcy, I shall preach such a gospel of joy, showing myself as the living proof of the truth that Puritanism, the dismal religion of sour faces, shall vanish like a breath of smoke and be dispersed and disappear in the sunlit air. But first, the full knowledge must be mine. Darcy watched his face narrowly. You are afraid of that moment, he said. Frank smiled at him. Quite true. You are quick to have seen that. But when it comes, I hope I shall not be afraid. For some little time, there was silence. Then Darcy rose. You have bewitched me, you extraordinary boy, he said. You have been telling me a fairy story, and I find myself saying, promise me it is true. I promise you that, said the other. And I know I shan't sleep, added Darcy. Frank looked at him with a sort of mild wonder, as if he scarcely understood. Well, what does that matter, he said. I assure you it does. I am wretched unless I sleep. Of course. I can make you sleep if I want, said Frank in a rather bored voice. Well, do. Very good. Go to bed. I'll come upstairs in ten minutes. Frank busied himself for a little after the other had gone, moving the table back under the awning of the veranda and quenching the lamp. Then he went with his quick, silent tread upstairs and into Darcy's room. The latter was already in bed, but very wide-eyed and wakeful, and Frank, with an amused smile of indulgence, as for a fretful child, sat down on the edge of the bed. Look at me, he said, and Darcy looked. The birds are sleeping in the brake, said Frank softly, and the winds are asleep. The sea sleeps, and the tides are but the heaving of its breast. The stars swing slow, rocked in the great cradle of the heavens, and he stopped suddenly, gently blew out Darcy's candle, and left him sleeping. Morning brought to Darcy a flood of hard common sense, as clear and crisp as the sunshine that filled his room. Slowly, as he woke, he gathered together the broken threads of the memories of the evening which had ended, so he told himself, in a trick of common hypnotism. That accounted for it all, the whole strange talk he had had was under a spell of suggestion from the extraordinary vivid boy who had once been a man. All his own excitement, 
his acceptance of the incredible had been merely the effect of a stronger, more potent will imposed on his own. How strong that will was, he guessed from his own instantaneous obedience to Frank's suggestion of sleep, and armed with impenetrable common sense, he came down to breakfast. Frank had already begun, and was consuming a large plateful of porridge and milk with the most prosaic and healthy appetite. "'Slept well?' he asked. "'Yes, of course. Where did you learn hypnotism?' "'By the side of the river.' "'You talked an amazing quantity of nonsense last night,' remarked Darcy, in a voice prickly with reason. "'Rather, I felt quite giddy. "'Look, I remembered to order a dreadful daily paper for you. "'You can read about money markets or politics or cricket matches.' "'Darcy looked at him closely. "'In the morning light, Frank looked even fresher, younger, "'more vital than he had done the night before.' and the sight of him somehow dinted Darcy's armour of common sense. "'You are the most extraordinary fellow I ever saw,' he said. "'I want to ask you some more questions.' "'Ask away,' said Frank. For the next day or two, Darcy plied his friend with many questions, objections, and criticisms on the theory of life, and gradually got out of him a coherent and complete account of his experience. In brief, then, Frank believed that, by lying naked, as he put it, to the force which controls the passage of the stars, the breaking of a wave, the budding of a tree, the love of a youth and maiden, he had succeeded in a way hitherto undreamed of in possessing himself of the essential principle of life. Day by day, so he thought, he was getting nearer to, and in closer union with, the great power itself which caused all life to be the spirit of nature, of force, or the spirit of God. For himself, he confessed to what others would call paganism. It was sufficient for him that there existed a principle of life. He did not worship it, he did not pray to it, he did not praise it. Some of it existed in all human beings, just as it existed in trees and animals, to realise and make living to himself the fact that it was all one, was his sole aim and object. Here, perhaps, Darcy would put in a word of warning. Take care, he said. To see Pan meant death, did it not? Frank's eyebrows would rise at this. What does that matter? he said. True, the Greeks were always right, and they said so. But there is another possibility. For the nearer I get to it, the more living, the more vital and young I become. What then do you expect the final revelation will do for you? I have told you, said he, it will make me immortal. But it was not so much from speech and argument that Darcy grew to grasp his friend's conception as from the ordinary conduct of his life. They were passing, for instance, one morning down the village street when an old woman, very bent and decrepit, but with an extraordinary cheerfulness of face, hobbled out from her cottage. Frank instantly stopped when he saw her. "'You old darling! How goes it all?' he said. But she did not answer. Her dim old eyes were riveted on his face. She seemed to drink in, like a thirsty creature, the beautiful radiance which shone there. Suddenly she put her two withered old hands on his shoulders. "'You're just the sunshine itself,' she said and he kissed her, and passed on. But scarcely a hundred yards further, a strange contradiction of such tenderness occurred. A child running along the path towards them fell on its face, and set up a dismal cry of fright and pain. A look of horror came into Frank's eyes, and, putting his fingers in his ears, he fled at full speed down the street, and did not pause till he was out of hearing. Darcy, having ascertained that the child was not really hurt, "'followed him in bewilderment. "'Are you without pity, then?' he asked. "'Frank shook his head impatiently. "'Can't you see?' he asked. "'Can't you understand that that sort of thing, "'pain, anger, anything unlovely, "'throws me back, retards the coming of the great hour?' 
Perhaps when it comes, I shall be able to piece that side of life on to the other, on to the true religion of joy. At present, I can't. But the old woman, was she not ugly? Frank's radiance gradually returned. Ah, no. She was like me. She longed for joy, and knew it when she saw it, the old darling. Another question suggested itself. "'Then what about Christianity?' asked Darcy. "'I can't accept it. "'I can't believe in any creed of which the central doctrine "'is that God, who is joy, should have had to suffer. "'Perhaps it was so. "'In some inscrutable way I believe it may have been so, "'but I don't understand how it was possible. "'So I leave it alone. "'My affair is joy.' They had come to the weir above the village, and the thunder of riotous cool water was heavy in the air. Trees dipped into the translucent stream with slender trailing branches, and the meadow where they stood was starred with midsummer blossomings. Larks shot up, carolling into the crystal dome of blue, and a thousand voices of June sang round them. Frank, bareheaded as was his wont, with his coat slung over his arm and his shirt sleeves rolled up above the elbow, stood there like some beautiful wild animal with eyes half shut and mouth half open, drinking in the scented warmth of the air. Then suddenly he flung himself face downwards on the grass at the edge of the stream, burying his face in the daisies and cowslips, and lay stretched there in wide-armed ecstasy, with his long fingers pressing and stroking the dewy herbs of the field. Never before had Darcy seen him thus, fully possessed by his idea. His caressing fingers, his half-buried face pressed close to the grass, even the clothed lines of his figure were instinct with a vitality that somehow was different from that of other men. And some faint glow from it reached Darcy. Some thrill, some vibration from that charged recumbent body passed to him, and for a moment he understood as he had not understood before, despite his persistent questions and the candid answers they received, how real and how realised by Frank his idea was. Then suddenly the muscles in Frank's neck became stiff and alert, and he half raised his head, whispering, The panpipes! The panpipes! Close! Oh, so close! Very slowly, as if a sudden movement might interrupt the melody, he raised himself and leaned on the elbow of his bent arm. His eyes opened wider, the lower lids drooped as if he focused his eyes on something very far away, and the smile on his face broadened and quivered like sunlight on still water, till the exultance of its happiness was scarcely human. So he remained motionless, and rapped for some minutes. Then the look of listening died from his face, and he bowed his head, satisfied. Ah, oh, that was good, he said. How is it possible you did not hear? Oh, you poor fellow. Did you really hear nothing? A week of this outdoor and stimulating life did wonders in restoring Darcy to the vigour and health which his weeks of fever had filched from him, and as his normal activity and higher pressure of vitality returned, he seemed himself to fall even more under the spell which the miracle of Frank's youth cast over him. Twenty times a day he found himself saying to himself suddenly at the end of some ten minutes silent resistance to the absurdity of Frank's idea, But it isn't possible! It can't be possible. And from the fact of his having to assure himself so frequently of this, he knew that he was struggling and arguing with a conclusion which already had taken root in his mind. For in any case, a visible, living miracle confronted him, since it was equally impossible that this youth, this boy, trembling on the verge of manhood, was thirty-five. Yet such was the fact. July was ushered in by a couple of days of blustering and fretful rain, and Darcy, unwilling to risk a chill, kept to the house. But to Frank, this weeping change of weather seemed to have no bearing on the behaviour of man, 
and he spent his days exactly as he did under the suns of June, lying in his hammock, stretched on the dripping grass, or making huge rambling excursions into the forest, the birds hopping from tree to tree after him, to return in the evening, drenched and soaked, but with the same unquenchable flame of joy burning within him. "'Catch coal?' he would ask. "'I've forgotten how to do it, I think. I suppose it makes one's body more sensible always to sleep out of doors. People who live indoors always remind me of something peeled and skinless.' "'Do you mean to say you slept out of doors last night, in that deluge?' asked Darcy. "'And where, may I ask?' Frank thought a moment. "'I slept in the hammock till nearly dawn,' he said, "'for I remember the light blinked in the east when I awoke. "'Then I went. "'Where did I go? "'Oh, yes, to the meadow, where the pan-pipe sounded so close a week ago. "'You were with me, do you remember?' but I always have a rug if it is wet. And he went whistling upstairs. Somehow that little touch, his obvious effort to recall where he had slept, brought strangely home to Darcy the wonderful romance of which he was the still half-incredulous beholder. Sleep till close on dawn in a hammock, then the tramp, or probably scamper, underneath the windy and weeping heavens to the remote and lonely meadow by the weir, the picture of other such nights rose before him, Frank sleeping, perhaps, by the bathing place, under the filtered twilight of the stars, or the white blaze of moonshine, a stir and awakening at some dead hour, perhaps a space of silent, wide-eyed thought, and then a wandering through the hushed woods to some other dormitory, alone with his happiness, alone with the joy and the life that suffused and enveloped him without other thought or desire or aim except the hourly and never-ceasing communion with the joy of nature. They were in the middle of dinner that night, talking on indifferent subjects, when Darcy suddenly broke off in the middle of a sentence. "'I've got it,' he said. "'At last, I've got it.' "'Congratulate you,' said Frank. "'But what? "'The radical unsoundness of your idea. "'It is this. "'All nature from highest to lowest is full, "'crammed full of suffering. "'Every living organism in nature preys on another, "'yet in your aim to get close to, "'to be one with nature, "'you leave suffering altogether out. "'You run away from it. "'You refuse to recognise it. "'And you are waiting, you say, "'for the final revelation.' Frank's brow clouded slightly. Well, he asked rather wearily, cannot you guess then when the final revelation will be? In joy you are supreme, I grant you that. I did not know a man could be so master of it. You have learned, perhaps practically, all that nature can teach. And if, as you think, the final revelation is coming to you, it will be the revelation of horror, suffering, death, pain in all its hideous forms. Suffering does exist, you hate it, and fear it. Frank held up his hand. Stop. Let me think, he said. There was silence for a long minute. That never struck me, he said at length. It is possible that what you suggest is true. Does the sight of Pan mean that, do you think? Is it that nature, take it altogether, suffers horribly, suffers to a hideous, inconceivable extent? Shall I be shown all the suffering? He got up and came round to where Darcy sat. If it is so, so be it, he said. Because, my dear fellow, I am near, so splendidly near to the final revelation. Today... The pipes have sounded almost without pause. I have even heard the rustle in the bushes, I believe, of Pan's coming. I have seen, yes, I saw today, the bushes pushed aside as if by a hand and a piece of a face, not human, peered through. But I was not frightened. At least, I did not run away this time. He took a turn up to the window and back again. 
Yes, there is suffering all through, he said, and I have left it all out of my search. Perhaps, as you say, the revelation will be that. And in that case, it will be goodbye. I have gone on one line. I shall have gone too far along one road without having explored the other. But I can't go back now. I wouldn't, if I could. Not a step would I retrace. In any case, whatever the revelation is, it will be God. I'm sure of that. The rainy weather soon passed, and with the return of the sun, Darcy again joined Frank in long rambling days. It grew extraordinarily hotter, and with the fresh bursting of life after the rain, Frank's vitality seemed to blaze higher and higher. Then, as is the habit of the English weather, one evening clouds began to bank themselves up in the west. The sun went down in a glare of coppery thunderack, and the whole earth, broiling under an unspeakable oppression and sultriness, paused and panted for the storm. After sunset, the remote fires of lightning began to wink and flicker on the horizon, but when bedtime came, the storm seemed to have moved no nearer, though a very low, unceasing noise of thunder was audible. Weary and oppressed by the stress of the day, Darcy fell at once into a heavy, uncomforting sleep. He woke suddenly into full consciousness, with the din of some appalling explosion of thunder in his ears, and sat up in bed with racing heart. Then for a moment, as he recovered himself from the panic land which lies between sleeping and waking, there was silence, except for the steady hissing of rain on the shrubs outside his window. But suddenly that silence was shattered and shredded into fragments by a scream from somewhere close at hand outside in the black garden, a scream of supreme and despairing terror. Again, and once again it shrilled up, and then a babble of awful words was interjected. A quivering, sobbing voice that he knew said, My God! Oh, my God! Oh, Christ! And then followed a little mocking, bleating laugh. Then was silence again. Only the rain hissed on the shrubs. All this was but the affair of a moment, and without pause either to put on clothes or light a candle, Darcy was already fumbling at his door-handle. Even as he opened it, he met a terror-stricken face outside, that of the man-servant who carried a light. "'Did you hear?' he asked. The man's face was bleached to a dull, shining whiteness. "'Yes, sir,' he said. "'It was the master's voice.' Together they hurried down the stairs and through the dining-room, where an orderly table for breakfast had already been laid. The rain for the moment had been utterly stayed, as if the tap of the heavens had been turned off, and under the lowering black sky, not quite dark, since the moon rode somewhere serene behind the conglomerated thunderclouds, Darcy stumbled into the garden, followed by the servant with the candle. The monstrous leaping shadow of himself was cast before him on the lawn. Lost and wandering odours of rose and lily and damp earth were thick about him but more pungent was some sharp and acrid smell that suddenly reminded him of a certain chalet in which he had once taken refuge in the Alps. In the blackness of the hazy light from the sky, and the vague tossing of the candle behind him, he saw that the hammock in which Frank so often lay was tenanted. A gleam of white shirt was there, as if a man sitting up in it, but across that there was an obscure, dark shadow, and as he approached, the acrid odour grew more intense. He was now only some few yards away, when suddenly the black shadow seemed to jump into the air, then came down with tappings of hard hoofs on the brick path that ran down the pergola, and with frolicsome skippings galloped off into the bushes. When that was gone, Darcy could see quite clearly that a shirted figure sat up in the hammock. For one moment, from sheer terror of the unseen, he hung on his step, and the servant joining him, they walked together to the hammock. It was Frank. He was in shirt and trousers only, and he sat up with braced arms. For one half-second he stared at them, 
his face a mask of horrible, contorted terror. His upper lip was drawn back so that the gums of the teeth appeared, and his eyes were focused not on the two who approached him, but on something quite close to him. His nostrils were widely expanded, as if he panted for breath, and terror incarnate and repulsion and deathly anguish ruled dreadful lines on his smooth cheeks and forehead. Then, even as they looked, the body sank backwards, and the ropes of the hammock wheezed and strained. Darcy lifted him out and carried him indoors. Once he thought there was a faint, convulsive stir of the limbs that lay with so dead a weight in his arms, but when they got inside there was no trace of life. But the look of supreme terror and agony of fear had gone from his face. A boy, tired with play, but still smiling in his sleep, was the burden he laid on the floor. His eyes had closed, and the beautiful mouth lay in smiling curves, even as when a few mornings ago, in the meadow by the weir, it had quivered to the music of the unheard melody of Pan's pipes. Then they looked further. Frank had come back from his bathe before dinner that night in his usual costume of shirt and trousers only. He had not dressed, and during dinner, so Darcy remembered, he had rolled up the sleeves of his shirt to above the elbow. Later, as they sat and talked after dinner on the close sultriness of the evening, he had unbuttoned the front of his shirt to let what little breath of wind there was play on his skin. The sleeves were rolled up now, the front of the shirt was unbuttoned, and on his arms and on the brown skin of his chest were strange discolorations which grew momently more clear and defined till they saw that the marks were pointed prints, as if caused by the hoofs of some monstrous goat that had leaped and stamped upon him. End of The Man Who Went Too Far Recording by Rafe Ball Story number 12 of The Room in the Tower and Other Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Room in the Tower and Other Stories by E. F. Benson. Between the Lights. The day had been one unceasing fall of snow from sunrise until the gradual withdrawal of the vague white light outside indicated that the sun had set again. But, as usual, at this hospitable and delightful house of Everard Chandler, where I often spent Christmas, and was spending it now, there had been no lack of entertainment, and the hours had passed with a rapidity that had surprised us. A short billiard tournament had filled up the time between breakfast and lunch, with badminton and the morning papers for those who were temporarily not engaged, while afterwards the interval till tea-time had been occupied by the majority of the party in a huge game of hide-and-seek all over the house, barring the billiard-room, which was sanctuary for any who desired peace. But few had done that. The enchantment of Christmas, I must suppose, had, like some spell, made children of us again and it was with palsied terror and trembling misgivings that we had tiptoed up and down the dim passages, from any corner of which some wild screaming form might dart out on us. Then, wearied with exercise and emotion, we had assembled again for tea in the hall, a room of shadows and panels on which the light from the wide open fireplace, where there burned a divine mixture of peat and logs, flickered and grew bright again on the walls. Then, as was proper, ghost stories, for the narration of which the electric light was put out so that the listeners might conjecture anything they pleased to be lurking in the corners, succeeded, and we vied with each other in blood, bones, skeletons, armor, and shrieks. I had just given my contribution and was reflecting with some complacency that probably the worst was now known, when Everard, who had not yet administered to the horror of his guests, spoke. He was sitting opposite me in the full blaze of the fire, looking after the illness he had gone through during the autumn, still rather pale and delicate. All the same, he had been among the boldest and best in the exploration of dark places that afternoon, and the look on his face now rather startled me. 
No, I don't mind that sort of thing, he said. The paraphernalia of ghosts has become somehow rather hackneyed, and when I hear of screams and skeletons, I feel I am on familiar ground and can at least hide my head under the bedclothes. Ah, but the bedclothes were twitched away by my skeleton, said I, in self-defense. I know, but I don't even mind that. Why, there are seven, eight skeletons in this room now, covered with blood and skin and other horrors. No, the nightmares of one's childhood were the really frightening things, because they were vague. There was the true atmosphere of horror about them, because one didn't know what one feared. Now, if one could recapture that... Mrs. Chandler got quickly out of her seat. Oh, Everard, she said. Surely you don't wish to recapture it again. I should have thought once was enough. This was enchanting. A chorus of invitation asked him to proceed. The real, true ghost story firsthand, which was what seemed to be indicated, was too precious a thing to lose. Everard laughed. No, dear, I don't want to recapture it again at all, he said to his wife. Then to us. But really the, well, the nightmare, perhaps, to which I was referring, is of the vaguest and most unsatisfactory kind. It has no apparatus about it at all. You will probably all say that it was nothing and wonder why I was frightened. But I was. It frightened me out of my wits, and I only just saw something, without being able to swear what it was, and heard something which might have been a falling stone. Anyhow, tell us about the falling stone, said I. There was a stir of movement about the circle round the fire, and the movement was not of purely physical order. It was as if, this is only what I personally felt, it was as if the childish gaiety of the hours we had passed that day was suddenly withdrawn. We had jested on certain subjects, we had played hide-and-seek with all the power of earnestness that was in us, but now, so it seemed to me, there was going to be real hide-and-seek. Real terrors were going to lurk in dark corners. Or if not real terrors, terrors so convincing as to assume the garb of reality were going to pounce on us. And Mrs. Chandler's exclamation as she sat down again, Oh, Everard, won't it excite you? Tended in any case to excite us. The room still remained in dubious darkness except for the sudden lights disclosed on the walls by the leaping flames on the hearth and there was wide field for conjecture as to what might lurk in the dim corners. Everard, moreover, who had been sitting in bright light before, was banished by the extinction of some flaming log into the shadows. A voice alone spoke to us as he sat back in his low chair, a voice rather slow but very distinct. Last year, he said, on the 24th of December, we were down here as usual, Amy and I, for Christmas, Several of you who are here now were here then, three or four of you at least. I was one of those, but like the others kept silence, for the identification, so it seemed to me, was not asked for, and he again went on without a pause. Those of you who were here then, he said, and are here now, will remember how very warm it was this day last year. You will remember too that we played croquet that day on the lawn. It was perhaps a little cold for croquet, and we played it rather in order to be able to say, with sound evidence to back the statement, that we had done so. Then he turned and addressed the whole little circle. We played ties of half games, he said. Just as we have played billiards today, and it was certainly as warm on the lawn then as it was in the billiard room this morning directly after breakfast, while today I should not wonder if there was three feet of snow outside. More, probably. Listen. A sudden draft fluted in the chimney, and the fire flared up as the current of air caught it. The wind also drove the snow against the windows, and as he said, listen, we heard a soft scurry of the falling flakes against the panes, like the soft tread of many little people who stepped lightly, but with the persistence of multitudes who were flocking to some rendezvous. Hundreds of little feet seemed to be gathering outside. Only the glass kept them out. And of the eight skeletons present, four or five, anyhow, turned and looked at the windows. These were small paned with leaden bars. On the leaden bars, little heaps of snow had accumulated. But there was nothing else to be seen. Yes, last Christmas Eve was very warm and sunny, 
went on Everard. We had had no frost that autumn, and a temerarious dahlia was still in flower. I have always thought that it must have been mad. He paused a moment. And I wonder if I were not mad too, he added. No one interrupted him. There was something arresting, I must suppose, in what he was saying. It chimed in anyhow with the hide-and-seek, with the suggestions of the lonely snow. Mrs. Chandler had sat down again, but I heard her stir in her chair. But never was there a gay party so reduced as we had been in the last five minutes. Instead of laughing at ourselves for playing silly games, we were all taking a serious game seriously. Anyhow, I was sitting out, he said to me, while you and my wife played your half-game of croquet. Then it struck me that it was not so warm as I had supposed, because quite suddenly I shivered. And shivering, I looked up. But I did not see you and her playing croquet at all. I saw something which had no relation to you and her. At least I hope not. Now the angler lands his fish. The stalker kills his stag. And the speaker holds his audience. And as the fish is gaffed, and as the stag is shot, so were we held. There was no getting away till he had finished with us. You all know the croquet lawn, he said and how it is bounded all round by a flower border, with a brick wall behind it, through which, you'll remember, there is only one gate. Well, I looked up and saw that the lawn, I could for one moment see it was still a lawn, was shrinking, and the walls closing in upon it. As they closed in, too, they grew higher, and simultaneously the light began to fade and be sucked from the sky, till it grew quite dark overhead, and only a glimmer of light came in through the gate. There was, as I told you, a dahlia in flower that day. And as this dreadful darkness and bewilderment came over me, I remember that my eyes sought it in a kind of despair, holding on, as it were, to any familiar object. But it was no longer a dahlia, and for the red of its petals I saw only the red of some feeble firelight. And at that moment the hallucination was complete. I was no longer sitting on the lawn watching croquet, but I was in a low-roofed room, something like a cattle shed, but round. Close above my head, though I was sitting down, ran rafters from wall to wall. It was nearly dark, but a little light came in from the door opposite to me, which seemed to lead into a passage that communicated with the exterior of the place. Little, however, of the wholesome air came into this dreadful din. The atmosphere was oppressive and foul beyond all telling. It was as if for years it had been the place of some human menagerie, and for those years had been uncleaned and unsweetened by the winds of heaven. Yet that oppressiveness was nothing to the awful horror of the place from the view of the spirit. Some dreadful atmosphere of crime and abomination dwelt heavy in it, its denizens, whoever they were, were scarce human, so it seemed to me, and though men and women were akin more to the beasts of the field. And in addition there was present to me some sense of the weight of years. I had been taken and thrust down into some epoch of dim antiquity. He paused for a moment, and the fire on the hearth leaped up for a second and then died down again. But in that gleam I saw that all the faces were turned to Everard, and that all wore some look of dreadful expectancy. Certainly I felt it myself, and waited in a sort of shrinking horror for what was coming. As I told you, he continued, where there had been that unseasonable dahlia, there now burned a dim firelight, and my eyes were drawn there. Shapes were gathered round it. What they were I could not at first see. Then perhaps my eyes got more accustomed to the dusk, or the fire burned better, for I perceived that they were of human form, but very small. For when one rose with a horrible chattering to his feet, his head was still some inches off the low roof. He was dressed in a sort of shirt that came to his knees, but his arms were bare and covered with hair. Then the gesticulation and chattering increased, and I knew that they were talking about me for they kept pointing in my direction. At that my horror suddenly deepened, for I became aware that I was powerless and could not move hand or foot. A helpless nightmare impotence had possession of me. I could not lift a finger or turn my head. 
and in the paralysis of that fear I tried to scream, but not a sound could I utter. All this, I suppose, took place with the instantaneousness of a dream, for at once, and without transition, the whole thing had vanished, and I was back on the lawn again, while the stroke for which my wife was aiming was still unplayed. But my face was dripping with perspiration, and I was trembling all over. Now you may all say that I had fallen asleep and had a sudden nightmare. That may be so, but I was conscious of no sense of sleepiness before, and I was conscious of none afterwards. It was as if someone had held a book before me, whisked the pages open for a second, and closed them again. Somebody, I don't know who, got up from his chair with a sudden movement that made me start, and turned on the electric light. I do not mind confessing that I was rather glad of this. Everard laughed. Really, I feel like Hamlet in the play scene, he said, and as if there was a guilty uncle present. Shall I go on? I don't think anyone replied, and he went on. Well, let us say for the moment that it was not a dream exactly, but a hallucination. Whichever it was, in any case it haunted me. For months, I think, it was never quite out of my mind, but lingered somewhere in the dusk of consciousness, sometimes sleeping quietly, so to speak, but sometimes stirring in its sleep. It was no good my telling myself that I was disquieting myself in vain, for it was as if something had actually entered into my very soul, as if some seed of horror had been planted there. And as the weeks went on, the seed began to sprout, so that I could no longer even tell myself that that vision had been a moment's disorderment only. I can't say that it actually affected my health. I did not, as far as I know, sleep or eat insufficiently. But morning after morning I used to wake, not gradually and through pleasant dozings into full consciousness, but with absolute suddenness, and find myself plunged in an abyss of despair. Often, too, eating or drinking, I used to pause and wonder if it was worthwhile. Eventually I told two people about my trouble, hoping that perhaps the mere communication would help matters, hoping also, but very distantly, that though I could not believe at present that digestion or the obscurities of the nervous system were at fault, a doctor by some simple dose might convince me of it. In other words, I told my wife, who laughed at me, and my doctor, who laughed also, and assured me that my health was quite unnecessarily robust. At the time, he suggested that change of air and scene does wonders for the delusions that exist merely in the imagination. He also told me, in answer to a direct question, that he would stake his reputation on the certainty that I was not going mad. Well, we went up to London as usual for the season, and though nothing whatever occurred to remind me in any way of that single moment on Christmas Eve, the reminding was seen to all right. The moment itself took care of that, for instead of fading as is the way of sleeping or waking dreams, it grew every day more vivid and ate, so to speak, like some corrosive acid into my mind, etching itself there. And to London succeeded Scotland. I took last year for the first time a small forest up in Sutherland, called Glen Callan, very remote and wild, but affording excellent stalking. It was not far from the sea, and the gillies used always to warn me to carry a compass on the hill, because sea mists were liable to come up with frightful rapidity, and there was always a danger of being caught by one, and of having perhaps to wait hours till it cleared again. This at first I always used to do, but... As everyone knows, any precaution that one takes, which continues to be unjustified, gets gradually relaxed. And at the end of a few weeks, since the weather had been uniformly clear, it was natural that, as often as not, my compass remained at home. One day the stock took me onto a part of my ground that I had seldom been on before, a very high tableland on the limit of my forest, which went down very steeply on one side to a lock that lay below it and on the other, by gentler gradations, to the river that came from the loch, six miles below which stood the lodge. The wind had necessitated our climbing up, or so my stalker had insisted, not by the easier way, but up the crags from the loch. I had argued the point with him, for it seemed to me that it was impossible that the deer could get our scent if we went by the more natural path, 
but he still held to his opinion, and therefore, since after all this was his part of the job, I yielded. A dreadful climb we had of it, over big boulders, with deep holes in between, masked by clumps of heather, so that a wary eye and a prodding stick were necessary for each step if one wished to avoid broken bones. Adders also literally swarmed in the heather. We must have seen a dozen at least on our way up, and adders are a beast for which I have no manner of use. But a couple of hours saw us to the top, only to find that the stalker had been utterly at fault, and that the deer must quite infallibly have got wind of us, if they had remained in the place where we last saw them. That, when we could spy the ground again, we saw had happened. In any case, they had gone. The man insisted the wind had changed, a palpably stupid excuse, and I wondered at that moment what other reason he had. For a reason I felt sure there must be, for not wishing to take what would clearly now have been a better route. But this piece of bad management did not spoil our luck, for within an hour we had spied more deer, and about two o'clock I got a shot, killing a heavy stag. Then sitting on the heather I ate lunch and enjoyed a well-earned bask and smoke in the sun. The pony, meantime, had been saddled with the stag and was plodding homewards. The morning had been extraordinarily warm, with a little wind blowing off the sea, which lay a few miles off sparkling beneath a blue haze, and all morning, in spite of our abominable climb, I had had an extreme sense of peace, so much so that several times I had probed my mind, so to speak, to find if the horror still lingered there. But I could scarcely get any response from it. Never since Christmas had I been so free of fear, and it was with a great sense of repose, both physical and spiritual, that I lay looking up into the blue sky, watching my smoke whorls curl slowly away into nothingness. But I was not allowed to take my ease long, for Sandy came and begged that I would move. The weather had changed, he said. The wind had shifted again, and he wanted me to be off this high ground and on the path again as soon as possible, because it looked to him as if a sea mist would presently come up. And yon's a bad place to get down in the mist, he added, nodding towards the crags we had come up. I looked at the man in amazement, for to our right lay a gentle slope down onto the river, and there was now no possible reason for again tackling those hideous rocks up which we had climbed this morning. More than ever, I was sure he had some secret reason for not wishing to go the obvious way. But about one thing he was certainly right. The mist was coming up from the sea, and I felt in my pocket for the compass, and found I had forgotten to bring it. Then there followed a curious scene which lost us time that we could really ill afford to waste, I insisting on going down by the way that common sense directed, he imploring me to take his word for it that the crags were the better way. Eventually I marched off to the easier descent, and told him not to argue any more but follow. What annoyed me about him was that he would only give the most senseless reasons for preferring the crags. There were mossy places, he said, on the way I wished to go, a thing patently false, since the summer had been one spell of unbroken weather, or it was longer, also obviously untrue, or there were so many vipers about. But seeing that none of these arguments produced any effect, at last he desisted and came after me in silence. We were not yet half down when the mist was upon us, shooting up from the valley like the broken water of a wave, and in three minutes we were enveloped in a cloud of fog so thick that we could barely see a dozen yards in front of us. It was therefore another cause for self-congratulation that we were not now, as we should otherwise have been, precariously clambering on the face of those crags up which we had come with such difficulty in the morning. And as I rather prided myself on my powers of generalship in the matter of direction, I continued leading, feeling sure that before long we should strike the track by the river. More than all, the absolute freedom from fear elated me. Since Christmas I had not known the instinctive joy of that. I felt like a schoolboy home for the holidays, but the mist grew thicker and thicker, and whether it was that real rain clouds had formed above it, or that it was of an extraordinary density itself, I got wetter in the next hour than I have ever been before or since. The wet seemed to penetrate the skin and chill the very bones, and still there was no sign of the track for which I was making. Behind me, muttering to himself, followed the stalker. But his arguments and protestations were dumb, 
and it seemed as if he kept close to me, as if afraid. Now there are many unpleasant companions in this world. I would not, for instance, care to be on the hill with a drunkard or a maniac. But worse than either, I think, is a frightened man, because his trouble is infectious, and insensibly I began to be afraid of being frightened too. From that it is but a short step to fear. Other perplexities too beset us. At one time we seemed to be walking on flat ground, at another I felt sure we were climbing again, whereas all the time we ought to have been descending, unless we had missed the way very badly indeed. Also, for the month was October, it was beginning to get dark, and it was with a sense of relief that I remembered that the full moon would rise soon after sunset. But it had grown very much colder, and soon, instead of rain, we found we were walking through a steady fall of snow. Things were pretty bad, but then for the moment they seemed to mend, for far away to the left I suddenly heard the brawling of the river. It should, it is true, have been straight in front of me, and we were perhaps a mile out of our way, but this was better than the blind wandering of the last hour, and turning to the left, I walked towards it. But before I had gone a hundred yards, I heard a sudden choked cry behind me, and just saw Sandy's form flying as if in terror of pursuit into the mists. I called to him but got no reply, and heard only the spurned stones of his running. What had frightened him I had no idea. But certainly with his disappearance, the infection of his fear disappeared also, and I went on, I may almost say, with gaiety. On the moment, however, I saw a sudden, well-defined blackness in front of me, and before I knew what I was doing, I was half stumbling, half walking up a very steep grass slope. During the last few minutes, the wind had got up, and the driving snow was peculiarly uncomfortable but there had been a certain consolation in thinking that the wind would soon disperse these mists, and I had nothing more than a moonlight walk home. But as I paused on this slope, I became aware of two things. One, that the blackness in front of me was very close. The other, that, whatever it was, it sheltered me from the snow. So I climbed on a dozen yards into its friendly shelter, for it seemed to me to be friendly. A wall some twelve feet high crowned the slope, and exactly where I struck it there was a hole in it, or door, rather, through which a little light appeared. Wondering at this, I pushed on, bending down, for the passage was very low, and in a dozen yards came out on the other side. Just as I did this, the sky suddenly grew lighter, the wind, I suppose, having dispersed the mists, and the moon though not yet visible through the flying skirts of cloud, made sufficient illumination. I was in a circular enclosure, and above me there projected from the walls, some four feet from the ground, broken stones which must have been intended to support a floor. Then simultaneously two things occurred. The whole of my nine months' terror came back to me, for I saw that the vision in the garden was fulfilled, and at that same moment I saw stealing towards me a little figure as of a man, but only about three foot six in height. That my eyes told me. My ears told me that he stumbled on a stone. My nostrils told me that the air I breathed was of an overpowering foulness, and my soul told me that it was sick unto death. I think I tried to scream, but could not. I know I tried to move, and could not. And it crept closer. Then I suppose the terror which held me spellbound so spurred me that I must move, for the next moment I heard a cry break from my lips, and I was stumbling through the passage. I made one leap of it down the grass slope, and ran as I hoped never to have to run again. What direction I took I did not pause to consider, so long as I put distance between me and that place. Luck, however, favored me, and before long I struck the track by the river, and an hour afterwards reached the lodge. Next day I developed a chill, and as you know, pneumonia laid me on my back for six weeks. Well, that is my story, and there are many explanations. You may say that I fell asleep on the lawn and was reminded of that by finding myself under discouraging circumstances in an old pick's castle where a sheep or a goat that, like myself, had taken shelter from the storm was moving about. Yes, there are hundreds of ways in which you may explain it. But the coincidence was an odd one. And those who believe in second sight might find an instance of their hobby in it.
And is that all? I asked. Yes. It was nearly too much for me. I think the dressing bell has sounded. End of Between the Lights Story 13 of The Room in the Tower and Other Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Room in the Tower and Other Stories by E. F. Benson Outside the Door The rest of the small party staying with my friend Geoffrey Aldwich in the charming old house which he had lately bought at a little village north of Sheringham on the Norfolk coast, had drifted away soon after dinner to bridge and billiards, and Mrs Aldwich and myself had for the time been left alone in the drawing room, seated one on each side of a small round table, which we had very patiently and unsuccessfully been trying to turn. But such pressure, psychical or physical, as we had put upon it, though of the friendliest and most encouraging nature, had not overcome in the smallest degree the very slight inertia which so small an object might have been supposed to possess, and it had remained as fixed as the most constant of the stars. No tremor even had passed through its slight and spindle-like legs. In consequence, we had, after a really considerable period of patient endeavour, left it to its wooden repose, and proceeded to theorise about psychical matters indeed, with no stupid table to contradict in practice all our ideas on the subject. This I had added with a certain bitterness born of failure, for if we could not move so insignificant an object, we might as well give up all idea of moving anything. But hardly were the words out of my mouth when there came from the abandoned table a single peremptory rap, loud and rather startling. What's that? I asked. Only a rap, said she. I thought something would happen before long. And do you really think that is a spirit rapping? I asked. Oh dear, no. I don't think it has anything whatever to do with spirits. More perhaps with the very dry weather we have been having. Furniture often cracks like that in the summer. Now this, in point of fact, was not quite the case. Neither in summer nor in winter have I heard ever furniture crack as the table had cracked, for the sound, whatever it was, did not at all resemble the husky creak of contracting wood. It was a loud, sharp crack, like the smart concussion of one hard object with another. No, I don't think it had much to do with dry weather either, said she smiling. I think, if you wish to know, that it was the direct result of our attempt to turn the table. Does that sound nonsense? At present, yes, said I, though I have no doubt that if you tried you could make it sound sense. There is, I notice, a certain plausibility about you and your theories. Now you are being merely personal, she observed. For the good motive, to goad you into explanations and enlargements. Please go on. Let us stroll outside then, said she, and sit in the garden if you are sure you prefer my plausibilities to bridge. It is deliciously warm and... and the darkness will be more suitable for the propagation of psychical phenomena, as at seances, said I. Oh, there is nothing psychical about my plausibilities, said she. The phenomena I mean are purely physical according to my theory. So we wandered out into the transparent half-light of multitudinous stars. The last crimson feather of sunset, which had hovered long in the west, had been blown away with the breath of the night wind, and the moon, which would presently rise, had not yet cut the dim horizon of the sea, which lay very quiet, breathing gently in its sleep, with stir of whispering ripples. Across the dark velvet of the close-cropped lawn, which stretched seawards from the house, grew a little breeze full of the savour of salt and the freshness of night, with, every now and then, a hint so subtly conveyed as to be scarcely perceptible, of its travel across the sleeping fragrance of drowsy garden beds, over which the white moths hovered seeking their night honey. The house itself, with its two battlemented towers of Elizabethan times, gleamed with many windows, and we passed out of sight of it, and into the shadow of a box hedge, clipped into shapes and monstrous fantasies, and found chairs by the striped tent at the top of the sheltered bowling alley. And this is all very plausible, said I. Theories, if you please, at length and, if possible, a full-length illustration also. By which you mean a ghost story, or something to that effect? Precisely, and without presuming to dictate, if possible, first-hand. Oddly enough, I can supply that also, said she. So first I will tell you my general theory, and follow it by a story that seems to bear it out. It happened to me, and it happened here. I am sure it will fit the bill, said I. She paused a moment while I lit a cigarette, 
and then began in her very clear, pleasant voice. She has the most lucid voice I know, and to me sitting there in the deep-dyed dusk, the words seemed the very incarnation of clarity, for they dropped into the still quiet of the darkness, undisturbed by impressions conveyed to other senses. We are only just beginning to conjecture, she said. How inextricable is the interweaving between mind, soul, life, call it what you will, and the purely material part of the created world. That such interweaving existed has, of course, been known for centuries. Doctors, for instance, knew that a cheerful optimistic spirit on the part of their patients conduced towards recovery. That fear, the mere emotion, had a definite effect on the beat of the heart. That anger produced chemical changes in the blood. That anxiety led to indigestion. That under the influence of strong passion a man can do things which in his normal state he is physically incapable of performing. Here we have mind, in a simple and familiar manner, producing changes and effects in tissue, in that which is purely material. By an extension of this, though indeed it is scarcely an extension, we may expect to find that mind can have an effect not only on what we call living tissue, but on dead things, on pieces of wood or stone. At least it is hard to see why that should not be so. Table turning, for instance? I asked. That is one instance of how some force, out of that innumerable cohort of obscure mysterious forces with which we human beings are garrisoned, can pass, as it is constantly doing into material things. The laws of its passing we do not know. Sometimes we wish it to pass, and it does not. Just now, for instance, when you and I tried to turn the table, there was some impediment in the path, though I put down that rap which followed as an effect of our efforts. But nothing seems more natural to my mind than that these forces should be transmissible to inanimate things. Of the manner of its passing we know next to nothing, any more than we know the manner of the actual process by which fear accelerates the beating of the heart. But as surely as a Marconi message leaps along the air by no visible or tangible bridge, so through some subtle gateway of the body these forces can march from the citadel of the spirit into material forms, whether that material is a living part of ourselves or that which we choose to call inanimate nature. She paused for a moment. Under certain circumstances, she went on, it seems that the force which has passed from us into inanimate things can manifest its presence there. The force that passes into a table can show itself in movements or in noises coming from the table. The table has been charged with physical energy. Often and often I have seen a table or a chair move apparently of its own accord, but only when some outpouring of force, animal magnetism, call it what you will, has been received by it. A parallel phenomenon to my mind is exhibited in what we know as haunted houses, houses in which, as a rule, some crime or act of extreme emotion or passion has been committed, and in which some echo or reenactment of the deed is periodically made visible or audible. A murder has been committed, let us say, and the room where it took place is haunted. The figure of the murdered, or less commonly of the murderer, is seen there by sensitives, and cries are heard, or steps run to and fro. The atmosphere has somehow been charged with the scene, and the scene in whole or part repeats itself, though under what laws we do not know, just as a phonograph will repeat, when properly handled, what has been said into it. This is all theory, I remarked. But it appears to me to cover a curious set of facts, which is all we ask of a theory. Otherwise, we must frankly state our disbelief in haunted houses altogether, or suppose that the spirit of the murdered, poor wretch, is bound under certain circumstances to re-enact the horror of its body's tragedy. It was not enough that its body was killed there, its soul has to be dragged back and live through it all again with such vividness that its anguish becomes visible or audible to the eyes or ears of the sensitive. That to me is unthinkable, whereas my theory is not. Do I make it at all clear? It is clear enough, said I, but I want support for it, the full-sized illustration. I promised you that, a ghost story of my own experience. Mrs. Oldwich paused again, and then began the story which was to illustrate her theory. It is just a year, she said, since Jack bought this house from old Mrs. Dennison. We had both heard, both he and I, that it was supposed to be haunted, but neither of us knew any particulars of the haunt whatever. A month ago I heard what I believed to have been the ghost, and when Mrs. Dennison was staying with us last week, I asked her exactly what it was, and found it tallied completely with my experience. I will tell you my experience first, and give her account of the haunt afterwards. 
A month ago, Jack was away for a few days, and I remained here alone. One Sunday evening, I, in my usual health and spirits, as far as I am aware, both of which are serenely excellent, went up to bed about eleven. My room is on the first floor, just at the foot of the staircase that leads to the floor above. There are four more rooms on my passage, all of which that night were empty, and at the far end of it a door leads into the landing at the top of the front staircase. On the other side of that, as you know, are more bedrooms, all of which that night were also unoccupied. I, in fact, was the only sleeper on the first floor. The head of my bed is close behind my door, and there is an electric light over it. This is controlled by a switch at the bed head, and another switch there turns on a light in the passage just outside my room. That was Jack's plan. If by chance you want to leave your room when the house is dark, you can light up the passage before you go out, and not grope blindly for a switch outside. Usually I sleep solidly. It is very rarely indeed that I wake when once I have gone to sleep before I am called. But that night I woke, which was rare. What was rarer was that I woke in a state of shuddering and unaccountable terror. I tried to localise my panic, to run it to earth and reason it away, but without any success. Terror of something I could not guess at stared me in the face, white, shaking terror. So, as there was no use in lying quaking in the dark, I lit my lamp, and, with the view of composing this strange disorder of my fear, began to read again in the book I had brought up with me. The volume happened to be The Green Carnation, a work one would have thought to be full of tonic to twittering nerves. But it failed of success, even as my reasoning had done, and after reading a few pages, and finding that the heart hammer in my throat grew no quieter, and that the grip of terror was in no way relaxed, I put out my light and lay down again. I looked at my watch, however, before doing this, and remember that the time was ten minutes to two. Still matters did not mend. Terror, that was slowly becoming a little more definite, terror of some dark and violent deed that was momently drawing nearer to me, held me in its vice. Something was coming, the advent of which was perceived by the subconscious sense, and was already conveyed to my conscious mind. And then the clock struck two jingling chimes, and the stable clock outside clanged the hour more sonorously. I still lay there, abject and palpitating. Then I heard a sound just outside my room on the stairs that lead, as I have said, to the second story, a sound which was perfectly commonplace and unmistakable. Feet feeling their way in the dark were coming downstairs to my passage. I could hear also the groping hand slip and slide along the banisters. The footfalls came along the few yards of passage between the bottom of the stairs and my door, and then against my door itself came the brush of drapery, and on the panels the blind groping of fingers. The handle rattled as they passed over it, and my terror nearly rose to screaming point. Then a sensible hope struck me. The midnight wanderer might be one of the servants, ill or in want of something. And yet, why the shuffling feet and the groping hand? But on the instant of the dawning of that hope, for I knew that it was of the step and that which was moving in the dark passage of which I was afraid, I turned on both the light at my bedhead and the light of the passage outside, and, opening the door, looked out. The passage was quite bright from end to end, but it was perfectly empty. Yet as I looked, seeing nothing of the walker, I still heard. Down the bright boards I heard the shuffle growing fainter as it receded, until, judging by the ear, it turned into the gallery at the end and died away. And with it there died also all my sense of terror. It was it of which I had been afraid. Now it and my terror had passed. And I went back to bed and slept till morning. Again Mrs. Aldwich paused, and I was silent. Somehow it was in the extreme simplicity of her experience that the horror lay. She went on almost immediately. Now for the sequel, she said, or what I choose to call the explanation. Mrs. Dennison, as I told you, came down to stay with us not long ago, and I mentioned that we had heard, though only vaguely, that the house was supposed to be haunted, and asked for an account of it. This is what she told me. In the year 1610, the heiress to the property was a girl, Helen Dennison, who was engaged to be married to young Lord Southern. In case, therefore, of her having children, the property would pass away from Dennison's. In case of her death, childless, it would pass to her first cousin. A week before the marriage took place, he and a brother of his entered the house, riding here from thirty miles away, after dark, and made their way to her room on the second story. There they gagged her and attempted to kill her, but she escaped from them groped her way along this passage, and into the room at the end of the gallery. They followed her there, and killed her. The facts were known by the younger brother turning King's evidence. 
Now Mrs. Dennison told me that the ghost had never been seen, but that it was occasionally heard coming downstairs or going along the passage. She told me that it was never heard except between the hours of two and three in the morning, the hour during which the murder took place. And since then, have you heard it again? I asked. Yes, more than once, but it has never frightened me again. I feared, as we all do, what was unknown. I feel that I should fear the known if I knew it was that, said I. I don't think you would for long. Whatever theory you adopt about it, the sounds of the steps and the groping hand, I cannot see that there is anything to shock or frighten one. My own theory you know. Please apply it to what you heard, I asked. Simply enough, the poor girl felt her way along this passage in the despair of her agonised terror, hearing no doubt the soft footsteps of her murderers gaining on her as she groped along the lost way. The waves of that terrible brainstorm raging within her impressed themselves in some subtle yet physical manner on the place. It would only be by those people whom we call sensitives that the wrinkles, so to speak, made by those breaking waves on the sands would be perceived, and by them not always. But they are there, even as when a Marconi apparatus is working the waves are there, though they can only be perceived by a receiver that is in tune. If you believe in brain waves at all, the explanation is not so difficult. Then the brain wave is permanent? Every wave of whatever kind leaves its mark, does it not? If you disbelieve the whole thing, shall I give you a room on the route of that poor, murdered, harmless walker? I got up. I am very comfortable, thanks, where I am, I said. End of Outside the Door Recording by Julian Prattley Story 14 of The Room in the Tower and Other Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrew Gantz. The Room in the Tower and Other Stories by E. F. Benson. The Terror by Night. The transference of emotion is a phenomenon so common so constantly witnessed, that mankind in general have long ceased to be conscious of its existence as a thing worth our wonder or consideration, regarding it as being as natural and commonplace as the transference of things that act by the ascertained laws of matter. Nobody, for instance, is surprised if, when the room is too hot, the opening of a window causes the cold, fresh air of outside to be transferred into the room, and in the same way, no one is surprised when into the same room, perhaps, which we will imagine as being peopled with dull and gloomy persons, there enters someone of fresh and sunny mind, who instantly brings into the stuffy mental atmosphere a change analogous to that of the opened windows. Exactly how this infection is conveyed, we do not know. Considering the wireless wonders that act by material laws, which are already beginning to lose their wonder now that we have our newspaper brought as a matter of course every morning in the mid-Atlantic, it would not perhaps be rash to conjecture that in some subtle and occult way the transference of emotion is in reality material too. Certainly, to take another instance, the sight of definitely material things, like writing on a page, conveys emotion apparently direct to our minds, as when our pleasure or pity is stirred by a book and it is therefore possible that mind may act on mind by means as material as that. Occasionally, however, we come across phenomena which, though they may easily be as material as any of these things, are rarer, and therefore more astounding. Some people call them ghosts, some conjuring tricks, and some nonsense. It seems simpler to group them under the head of transferred emotions, and they may appeal to any of the senses. Some ghosts are seen, some heard, some felt, and though I know of no instance of a ghost being tasted, yet it will seem in the following pages that these occult phenomena may appeal at any rate to the senses that perceive heat, cold, or smell. For, to take the analogy of wireless telegraphy, we are all probably receivers to some extent, and catch now and then a message or part of a message that the eternal waves of emotion are ceaselessly shouting aloud to those who have ears to hear and materializing themselves for those who have eyes to see. Not being as a rule perfectly tuned, we grasp but pieces and fragments of such messages, a few coherent words it may be, or a few words which seem to have no sense. The following story, however, to my mind, is interesting, 
because it shows how different pieces of what no doubt was one message were received and recorded by several different people simultaneously. Ten years have elapsed since the events recorded took place, but they were written down at the time. Jack Lorimer and I were very old friends before he married, and his marriage to a first cousin of mine did not make, as so often happens, a slackening in our intimacy. Within a few months after, it was found out that his wife had consumption, and without any loss of time, she was sent off to Davos, with her sister to look after her. The disease had evidently been detected at a very early stage, and there was excellent ground for hoping that, with proper care and strict regime, she would be cured by the life-giving frosts of that wonderful valley. The two had gone out in the November of which I am speaking, and Jack and I joined them for a month at Christmas, and found that week after week she was steadily and quickly gaining ground. We had to be back in town by the end of January, but it was settled that Ida should remain out with her sister for a week or two more. They both, I remember, came down to the station to see us off, and I am not likely to forget the last words that passed. "'Oh, don't look so woebegone, Jack,' his wife had said. You'll see me before long. Then the fussy little mountain engine squeaked as a puppy squeaks when its toe is trotted on, and we puffed our way up the pass. London was in its usual desperate February plight when we got back, full of fogs and stillborn frosts that seemed to produce a cold far more bitter than the piercing temperature of those sunny altitudes from which we had come. We both, I think, felt rather lonely and even before we had got to our journey's end, we had settled that for the present it was ridiculous that we should keep open two houses when one would suffice. It would also be far more cheerful for us both. So, as we both lived in almost identical houses in the same street in Chelsea, we decided to toss, live in the house which the coin indicated, heads mine, tails his, share expenses, attempt to let the other house, and, if successful, share the proceeds. A French five-franc piece of the Second Empire told us it was heads. We had been back some ten days, receiving every day the most excellent accounts from Davos, when, first on him, then on me, there descended like some tropical storm a feeling of indefinable fear. Very possibly the sense of apprehension, for there is nothing in the world so virulently infectious, reached me through him. On the other hand, both these attacks of vague foreboding may have come from the same source. But it is true that it did not attack me till he spoke of it, so the possibility perhaps inclines to my having caught it from him. He spoke of it first, I remember, one evening when we had met for a good night talk, after having come back from separate houses where we had dined. I have felt most awfully down all day, he said, and just after receiving this splendid account from Daisy, I can't think what is the matter. He poured himself out some whiskey and soda as he spoke. Oh, touch of liver, I said. I shouldn't drink that if I were you. Give it me instead. I was never better in my life, he said. I was opening letters as we talked, and came across one from the house agent, which, with trembling eagerness, I read. Hurrah, I cried. Offer of five giz... Why can't he write it in proper English? Five guineas a week till Easter for number thirty-one. We shall roll in guineas. Oh, but I can't stop here till Easter, he said. I don't see why not. Nor, by the way, does Daisy. I heard from her this morning, and she told me to persuade you to stop. That's to say, if you like. It really is more cheerful for you here. I forgot, you were telling me something. The glorious news about the weekly guineas did not cheer him up in the least. Thanks awfully. Of course I'll stop. He moved up and down the room once or twice. No, it's not me that is wrong, he said. It's it, whatever it is. The terror by night. Which you are commanded not to be afraid of, I remarked. I know. It's easy commanding. I'm frightened. Something's coming. Five guineas a week are coming, I said. I shan't sit up and be infected by your fears. All that matters... Davos is going as well as it can. What was the last report? Incredibly better. Take that to bed with you. The infection, if infection it was, did not take hold of me then, for I remember going to sleep feeling quite cheerful. But I awoke in some dark, still hour, and it, the terror by night, had come while I slept. 
fear and misgiving, blind, unreasonable, and paralyzing, had taken and gripped me. What was it? Just as by an aneroid we can foretell the approach of storm, so by the sinking of the spirit, unlike anything I had ever felt before, I felt sure that disaster of some sort was presaged. Jack saw it at once when we met at breakfast next morning, in the brown, haggard light of a foggy day, not dark enough for candles, but dismal beyond all telling. So it has come to you too, he said. And I had not even the fighting power left to tell him that I was merely slightly unwell. Besides, never in my life had I felt better. All next day, all the day after that, fear lay like a black cloak over my mind. I did not know what I dreaded, but it was something very acute, something that was very near. It was coming nearer every moment, spreading like a pall of clouds over the sky. But on the third day, after miserably cowering under it, I suppose some sort of courage came back to me. Either this was pure imagination, some trick of disordered nerves or what not, in which case we were both disquieting ourselves in vain, or, from the immeasurable waves of emotion that beat upon the minds of men, something within both of us had caught a current, a pressure. In either case, it was infinitely better to try, however ineffectively, to stand up against it. For these two days I had neither worked nor played. I had only shrunk and shuddered. I planned for myself a busy day, with diversion for both of us in the evening. "'We will dine early,' I said, "'and go to the man from Blankley's. I have already asked Philip to come, and he is coming, and I have telephoned for tickets. Dinner at seven. Philip, I may remark, is an old friend of ours, neighbor in this street, and by profession a much-respected doctor. Jack laid down his paper. Yes, I expect you're right, he said. It's no use doing nothing. It doesn't help things. Did you sleep well? Yes, beautifully, I said rather snappishly, for I was all on edge with the added burden of an almost sleepless night. I wish I had, said he. This would not do at all. We have got to play up, I said. Here are we, two strong and stalwart persons, with as much cause for satisfaction with life as any you can mention, letting ourselves behave like worms. Our fear may be over things imaginary or over things that are real, but it is the fact of being afraid that is so despicable. There is nothing in the world to fear except fear. You know that as well as I do. Now, let's read our papers with interest. Which do you back? Mr. Druce, or the Duke of Portland, or the Times Book Club? That day, therefore, passed very busily for me, and there were enough events moving in front of that black background, which I was conscious was there all the time, to enable me to keep my eyes away from it, and I was detained rather late at the office, and had to drive back to Chelsea in order to be in time to dress for dinner, instead of walking back as I had intended. Then the message which for these three days had been twittering in our minds, the receivers, just making them quiver and rattle, came through. I found Jack already dressed, since it was within a minute or two of seven when I got in and sitting in the drawing room. The day had been warm and muggy, but when I looked in on the way up to my room, it seemed to me to have grown suddenly and bitterly cold, not with the dampness of English frost, but with the clear and stinging exhilaration of such days as we had recently spent in Switzerland. Fire was laid in the grate, but not lit, and I went down on my knees on the hearth rug to light it. Why, it's freezing in here, I said. What donkeys servants are. It never occurs to them that you want fires in cold weather and no fires in hot weather. Oh, for heaven's sake, don't light the fire, said he. It is the warmest, muggiest evening I ever remember. I stared at him in astonishment. My hands were shaking with the cold. He saw this. Why, you are shivering, he said. Have you caught a chill? But as to the room being cold, let us look at the thermometer. There was one on the writing table. Sixty-five, he said. There was no disputing that, nor did I want to, for at that moment it suddenly struck us dimly and distantly that it was coming through. I felt it like some curious internal vibration. Hot or cold, I must go and dress, I said. Still shivering, but feeling as if I was breathing some rarefied, exhilarating air, I went up to my room. My clothes were already laid out, but by an oversight no hot water had been brought up, and I rang for my man. He came up almost at once, but he looked scared, or to my already startled senses he appeared so. "'What's the matter?' I asked. 
Nothing, sir, he said, and he could hardly articulate the words. I thought you rang. Yes, hot water. But what's the matter? He shifted from one foot to the other. I thought I saw a lady on the stairs, he said, coming up close behind me, and the front doorbell hadn't rung that I heard. Where did you think you saw her, I asked. On the stairs? Then on the landing outside the drawing room door, sir, he said. She stood there as if she didn't know whether to go in or not. Well, one, one of the servants, I said. But again I felt that it was coming through. No, sir, it was none of the servants, he said. Who was it, then? Couldn't see distinctly, sir. It was dim-like. But I thought it was Mrs. Lorimer. Oh, go and get me some hot water, I said. But he lingered. He was quite clearly frightened. At this moment, the front doorbell rang. It was just seven, and already Philip had come with brutal punctuality while I was not yet half-dressed. That's Dr. Enderly, I said. Perhaps if he is on the stairs, you may be able to pass the place where you saw the lady. Then, quite suddenly, there rang through the house a scream so terrible, so appalling in its agony and supreme terror, that I simply stood still and shuddered, unable to move. Then, by an effort so violent that I felt as if something must break, I recalled the power of motion and ran downstairs, my man at my heels, to meet Philip, who was running up from the ground floor. He had heard it, too. "'What's the matter?' he said. What was that? Together we went into the drawing room. Jack was lying in front of the fireplace with the chair in which he had been sitting a few minutes before overturned. Philip went straight to him and bent over him, tearing open his white shirt. Open all the windows, he said. The place reeks. We flung open the windows and there poured in, so it seemed to me, a stream of hot air into the bitter cold. Eventually Philip got up. He is dead, he said. Keep the windows open. The place is still thick with chloroform. Gradually, to my sense, the room got warmer. To Phillips, the drug-laden atmosphere dispersed. But neither my servant nor I had smelt anything at all. A couple of hours later, there came a telegram from Davos for me. It was to tell me to break the news of Daisy's death to Jack, and was sent by her sister. She supposed he would come out immediately, but he had been gone two hours now. I left for Davos next day, and learned what had happened. Daisy had been suffering for three days from a little abscess which had to be opened, and though the operation was of the slightest, she had been so nervous about it that the doctor gave her chloroform. She made a good recovery from the anesthetic, but an hour later had a sudden attack of syncope, and had died that night at a few minutes before eight by Central European time, corresponding to seven in English time. She had insisted that Jack should be told nothing about this little operation till it was over, since the matter was quite unconnected with her general health, and she did not wish to cause him needless anxiety. And there the story ends. To my servant there came the sight of a woman outside the drawing-room door, where Jack was, hesitating about her entrance, at the moment when Daisy's soul hovered between the two worlds. To me there came, I do not think it is fanciful to suppose this, the keen exhilarating cold of Davos. To Philip there came the fumes of chloroform. And to Jack, I must suppose, came his wife. So he joined her. End of the Terror by Night